The Wizards of Once by Cressida Cowell Read by David Tennant This is a story with two heroes. The boy, Tsar, is from a wizard tribe, but he has no magic, and he will do anything to get it. The girl, Wish, is from a warrior tribe, but she owns a banned magical object, and she will do anything to conceal it. Prologue. Once there was magic. It was a long, long time ago, in a British Isle so old it did not know it was the British Isles yet, and the magic lived in the dark forests. Perhaps you feel that you know what a dark forest looks like. Well, I can tell you right now that you don't. These were forests darker than you would believe possible, darker than ink spots, darker than midnight. Darker than space itself, and as twisted and as tangled as a witch's heart. They were what is now known as wild woods, and they stretched as far in every direction as you can possibly imagine, only stopping when they reached a sea. There were many types of humans living in the wild woods: the wizards, who were magic, and the warriors, who were not. The wizards had lived in the wild woods for as long as anyone could remember, and they were intending to live there forever, along with all the other magic things. Until the warriors came, the warriors invaded from across the seas, and though they had no magic, they brought a new weapon that they called iron, and iron was the only thing that magic could not work on. The warriors had iron swords and iron shields and iron armor, and even the horrifying magic of the witches was powerless against this metal. First, the warriors fought the witches and drove them into extinction in a long and terrible battle. Nobody cried for the witches, for witches were bad magic, the worst sort of magic, the kind of magic that tore wings from larks and killed for fun and could end the world and everyone in it. But the warriors did not stop there. The warriors thought that just because some magic was bad, that meant that all magic was bad. So now the warriors were trying to get rid of the wizards too, and the ogres, and the werewolves, and the untidy, quarrelling mess of good sprites and bad sprites that burned like little stars through the darkness, casting mischievous spells on each other, and the giants who moved slow and careful through the undergrowth, larger than mammoths. And peaceable as babies, the warriors had sworn that they would not rest until they had destroyed every last bit of magic in the whole of that dark forest, which they were chopping down as fast as they could with their iron axes to build their forts and their fields, and their new modern world. Queen Sycorax. Iron Warrior Queen had nailed a notice to many trees, which read, "You have now entered the Iron Warrior Empire. All magic is banned in this territory. No sprites, no giants, no ruger breaths, no snow cats, no werewolves, no green teeths, or any other magic creatures." No flying, no enchanted objects, no spelling, cursing, or charming, no magic whatsoever. And any wizards entering these lands may most unfortunately have their heads removed. By order of Her Majesty, Queen Sycorax, Iron Warrior Queen. This is the story of a young boy wizard and a young girl warrior who have been taught since birth to hate each other like poison. The story begins with the discovery of a gigantic black feather. Could it be that the wizards and the warriors have been so busy fighting each other 
that they have not noticed the return of an ancient evil. Could that feather really be the feather of a witch? I am a character in this story who sees everything, knows everything. I will not tell you who I am. See if you can guess. The story begins here. Don't get lost. These woods are dangerous. Part 1. Disobedience 1. A Trap to Catch a Witch It was a warm night for November. Too warm a night for witches, or so the stories said. Witches were supposed to be extinct, of course, but Tsar had heard about the way they stank, and he imagined he could smell that now, in the quietness of the dark forest, a faint but definite stink of burning hair mixed with long-dead mice and a little kick of viper's venom, once smelled, never forgotten. Tsar was a wild young human boy who belonged to the wizard tribe. He was riding on the back of a giant snowcat in a part of the forest so dark and mangled and tangled that it was known as the Badwoods. He should not have been there, for the Badwoods were warrior territory, and if the warriors were to catch him, well, what everyone said was, Tsar would be killed on sight, off with his head, as was the pleasant warrior custom. But Tsar did not look even remotely worried. He was a cheerful scruff of a boy, with a tremendous quiff of hair shooting upwards from his forehead, as if it had accidentally come into contact with some invisible vertical hurricane. The snowcat he was riding was called King Cat, a noble creature which was a giant form of lynx, far too dignified for his cheeky master. King Cat had shining paws, so round they looked unreal, fur so deep it was like powder snow, and such a rich silver-grey colour that it was almost blue. The snowcat ran swiftly but softly through the forest, his black-tipped ears swivelling from side to side as he ran, for he was scared, although too proud to show it. Only that very morning, Tsar's father, Incanzo the Enchanter, King of Wizards, had reminded everyone that it was forbidden for any wizard to dare set one toe in the bad woods. But Tsar was the most disobedient boy in the wizard kingdom in about four generations, and forbidding things only encouraged him. In the past week, for instance, Tsar had tied the beards of two of the eldest and most respectable wizards together when they were sleeping at a banquet. He had poured a love potion into the pig's feeding trough, so the pigs developed mad, passionate crushes on Tsar's least favourite teacher, and followed him around wherever he went, making loud, enthusiastic squealing and kissing noises. He had accidentally burned down the western trees in wizard camp. Most of these things hadn't been entirely intentional, exactly. Tsar had just got carried away in the heat of the moment. And yet none of these disobedient things was half as bad as what Tsar was doing right now. There was a large black raven flying above Tsar's head. This is a very bad idea indeed, Tsar, said the raven. The talking raven was called Caliburn, and he would have been a handsome bird, but unfortunately it was his job to keep Tsar out of trouble, and the worry of this impossible mission meant his feathers kept falling out. It isn't really fair to lead your animals and sprites and young fellow wizards into all this danger. As the son of the king enchanter, and a boy with a great deal of personal charisma, Tsar had a lot of followers. A pack of five wolves, three snowcats, a bear, eight sprites, an enormous giant called Crusher, and a small crowd of other wizard youngsters, all following Tsar as if hypnotised, all shivering and scared and pretending not to be. "'Oh, you worry too much, Caliburn,' said Tsar, pulling King Cat to a halt and jumping off his back. "'Look at this lovely, pretty little glade here. You see? Perfectly safe, and exactly the same as the rest of the forest.' Tsar looked around with breezy satisfaction, 
as if they had stopped in a delightful woodland dell filled with frolicking bunnies and baby deer, rather than a cold, eerie little clearing where the ewes leaned in threateningly and the mistletoe dripped like warlock's tears. The other wizards drew their swords, and the growling snowcat's fur stood up with fear to such an extent that they looked like furry puffballs. The wolves padded restlessly, trying to form a protective circle around their humans. Only the smaller sprites shared Zar's enthusiasm, but that was because they were too young to know any better. I don't know if you've ever seen a sprite, so I'd better describe these ones to you. There were five larger sprites, all faintly resembling a human crossed with a fierce, elegant insect. When irritated or bored, which was often, they blinked on and off like stars, and purple smoke drifted out of their ears. They were so see-through you could watch their hearts beating. Then there were three smaller, younger ones, who, because they were not yet adult, were known as hairy fairies. Zar's favourite was an eager, slightly stupid little thing called Squeeze Juice. Oh, it's lovely, lovely, squeaked Squeeze Juice. It's the tremongousest, the loveliest clearing I've ever seen. What's this for interesting flower? Let me guess, it's a buttercup, it's a daisy, it's a gerangulum, it's a cauliflower. He flew into the upper branches of a particularly gloomy and sinister tree and perched on the edge of one of its fleshy flowers, which had ominous spikes on the ends of its leaves and was in fact called a sprite-eating hobtrap. The flower snapped shut with the briskness of a mouse trap, capturing poor little squeeze juice inside. Caliburn landed on Zar's shoulder and gave a heavy sigh. I don't like to say I told you so, said Caliburn, but we've only been in this perfectly safe little clearing in the bad woods for one and a half minutes, and you've already lost one of your followers to a carnivorous flower. Nonsense, scolded Zar good-naturedly. I haven't lost him. That's the whole point about being a leader. Whenever my followers get into trouble, I rescue them, because that's what a leader does. Zar climbed the tree, and two hundred feet up, swaying precariously on a couple of creaking twig-like boughs, he took out his dagger and popped open the sprite-eating hob trap to release a panting little squeeze juice in the nick of time. "'I's fine!' squeaked squeeze juice. "'I's fine! I can't feel my left leg, but I's fine!' "'Don't worry, squeeze juice. That's just the hob trap's digestive juices. The feeling will return in a couple of hours.' Zar called out as he dropped down from the tree. You see, I'm a great leader. Stick with me and you'll be fine. The wizard youngsters looked very thoughtful indeed. At that moment, Zar's older brother Luther came out of the shadows behind them, sitting astride a great grey wolf, and followed by even more sprites and animals and young wizard followers than Zar himself. Zar stiffened, because he hated his older brother Luther. Luther was a lot bigger than Tsar. He was nearly as tall as their father. He was brilliant at magic, he was good-looking and clever, and my goodness, didn't he know it. He was the smuggest smug wizard you could possibly imagine, and he often sneaked on Tsar to get Tsar into trouble. "'What are you doing here, Luther? stormed Tsar suspiciously. "'Oh, I just followed you to see what unbelievably stupid and pointless thing my ickle baby brother was doing this time.' drawled Luther. "'Great leaders like me don't do pointless expeditions,' fumed Tsar. "'We're here for a reason. It's none of your business, but—' Tsar considered telling Luther some elaborate lie about what he was doing, but he couldn't resist chewing off. "'We're going to catch ourselves a witch!' boasted Tsar proudly. "'Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear!' This was the first time that Tsar had mentioned to his followers the purpose of their expedition, and it was very unwelcome news indeed. A witch! The bear, the snowcats, and the wolves went very still and began to shake. Even Ariel, the wildest and most unafraid of Tsar's sprites, shot up into the air and momentarily disappeared. There are witches in this part of the bad woods now. I know it, whispered Tsar excitedly as if a witch were a delightful sort of present that he was offering everyone. There was a long silence, and then Luther and his wizard followers began to laugh. They laughed, and they laughed, and they laughed. Oh, come on, Tsar, Luther said at last, once he'd got his breath back. Even you must know that witches have been extinct for centuries. Ah, oh, yes, 
said Tsar. But what if some of them survived and have been hiding all this time? Look! Here's what I found in this very clearing only yesterday. Out of his rucksack, he carefully took an absolutely gigantic black feather. It was huge, like the feather of a crow, but much, much larger. A soft black, fading at the end to a glowing, dark, shiny green, the colour of a mallard's head. It's a witch feather, whispered Tsar. Luthor smiled his most superior smile. That's just the feather of some big old bird, scoffed Luthor. Some giant crow. You get some weird things living in the bad woods. Tsar frowned and hung the feather from his belt. I've never seen a bird as big as this one must be, said Tsar grumpily. It's all nonsense, smiled Luthor. Only a brainless fool like you wouldn't know that. Witches were destroyed forever. Caliburn flapped downward and landed on Tsar's head. Forever is a long word, said the raven. You see, said Tsar triumphantly, Caliburn is a bird of omen who can see into the future and into the past, and he doesn't think the witches are gone forever. All I know is, if witches were not to be extinct for some reason, you wouldn't want to go meeting one in a dark place, said Caliburn, shivering. What do you want a witch for, Tsar? I'm going to catch the witch, said Tsar, and remove its magic and use it for myself. There was another horrified silence. Eventually, Luthor spoke. That, little brother, is the worst plan I have ever heard in the whole history of plan-making. You're just jealous you didn't think of it, said Tsar. I have a few questions, said Luthor. How are you going to catch the witch in the first place? That's what the net's for, said Tsar, taking a net out of his rucksack and holding it up. You couldn't fault his enthusiasm, at least. One of us will volunteer to be wounded ever so slightly, and then the blood will attract the witch. Oh, great, smiled Luther. Now you're going to wound one of your sad little followers in a forest stuffed with raving werewolves and blood-sniffing ogre breath. Come on, you're completely crazy. This plan is as pathetic as you are. Tsar ignored him. And then I'll entangle the witch in this net when it attacks. Next question. Okay, question two, said Luther. No living wizard has ever seen a witch, so how do you know what one looks like? Tsar opened his rucksack and took out a book the size of a large atlas entitled The Spelling Book. Every wizard is equipped with a spelling book given to them at birth. Tsar's was looking extremely worse for wear. One part of it was invisible. It accidentally got dropped in invisibility potion. Another bit was burned so black you could barely read it. This happened when Tsar set the wizard camp on fire, and many of the pages were loose and dropping out all over the place. Too many adventures to go into here. Tsar opened the book to the contents page, which had the twenty-six letters of the alphabet written on it in very large gold script. Tsar spelled out, witches by tapping on each letter in turn, and the book turned its own pages, which seemed to go on forever and ever and ever, the chapters in front turning invisible as the book riffled through the rest of them like an endless pack of cards, until eventually they stopped at the right place. That's weird. It doesn't say what they look like. But they're green, I think, said Zar. Someone else thought witches could turn invisible and they had acid blood, another that they squirted that blood through their eyes. I'm sure we'll recognise one when we see it, said Tsar, impatiently shutting the spelling book. They're supposed to be pretty horrible, aren't they? Awesomely horrible, said Caliburn gravely. The most terrifying creatures that ever walked this earth. So even if you do catch this witch, how are you persuaded to part with its magic? asked Luther. I'm imagining that invisible green acid blood-squirting witches that are the most terrifying creatures that ever walked this earth will not give up their magic if you ask them pretty please. Aha, uh -huh, said Tsar craftily. I've thought of that. With a grand flourish, he put on some gloves, reached into his rucksack, and took out a small saucepan. Silence again. You do realise that's a saucepan, said Luther. This is no ordinary saucepan, said Tsar, cunningly. And then he took a deep breath, 
before he made his shocking announcement. This particular saucepan is made out of iron. Most of the wizards took a horrified step backwards. The sprites let out shrieks of alarm. Luther alone refused to be impressed. In fact, he laughed so hard Zar thought he might fall over. This is too good. You're going to fight a witch with a saucepan," sneered Luther. "You're no great leader, Zar. You're a liar and a loser. Our father is ashamed of you." And now I know why you're so keen to steal magic from a witch. There's a spelling competition at the winter celebration tonight, and you can't do magic. Zar can't do magic," taunted Luther. Zar turned red with embarrassment, then white with anger. The fact he couldn't do magic yet was one of those hidden sores that you didn't want anyone else to see. Wizard children were not born magic. Their magic came in when they were about twelve. Zar was thirteen, and his magic still had not come in. Zar had tried doing magic, for countless hours he had tried, really simple things like moving stuff with his mind, but it was as if it were a muscle he didn't really have. Relax, everyone said. Relax, and it will happen. But it was like trying to move something with arms that weren't there, and recently he had been beginning to worry. What if it never happened? It was an unlikely calamity, but what a disgrace to the whole family it would be if a child had been born to the king enchanter who had no magic. The thought of it made him feel a little sick. Poor little baby Zar, crooned Luther cruelly, thinks he's such a big boy, but he can't do any magic whatsoever. My magic will come in, hissed Zar. But in the meantime, I swear, he spat, eyes so small with anger that he could barely see out of them. I swear, I'm going to catch a witch, and I will squeeze so much magic out of that witch, Luther, that I will blast you out of existence. Oh yeah, grinned Luther. He reached into his rucksack and took out one of his staffs. A wizard's staff was about the size of a walking stick, and wizards concentrated magic through them. Your spelling won't work on me when I am carrying iron," roared Zar, rushing forward to hit Luther with the saucepan, which was perfectly true. But most unfortunately, in his charge forward, Zar tripped over a long tangle of bramble, and his gloved hands lost their grip on the saucepan, and it went sailing over Luther's head and into the undergrowth. Luther pointed his staff at Zar and whispered the word of a spell under his breath. Luther's body trembled as the magic quivered through him and channeled out of his hand into the staff, which concentrated it into one quick, fierce, hot bolt of magic that blasted out of the end of the staff, hitting Zar on the legs. Zar stopped mid-charge; his feet stuck to the ground by Luther's spell. Ha 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 ha! Laughed Luther's followers. Remove the spell! Shouted Zar, struggling to shift his feet, but it was as if they had turned to lead. No, I don't think I will," smiled Luther. Zar lost his temper. He snapped his fingers. Before anyone could blink or think, King Cat launched himself at Luther, huge jaws agape, sixty stone of greeny grey killing machine. Screaming in terror, Luther was pinned up against a tree trunk, looking aghast at the great cat's nightmare face, inches away from his own, and what felt like four kitchen knives sinking into his shoulder. They had already drawn blood. None of Luther's own sprites or animals had time to move or protect him. One more click of my fingers, spat Zar, and King Cat will take off your head. Cheat! Panted Luther. You cheated. You're not supposed to use your animals to attack a fellow wizard. Remove the spell! Shouted Zar. Luther was now every bit as angry as Zar himself. But what could he do? He pointed his staff at Zar and removed the spell so that Zar's feet could move. And then Zar made a signal to King Cat to let Luther go. You're mad, a lunatic! Raged Luther as King Cat dropped him, and Luther gazed in astonishment at the four neat bleeding puncture wounds in his shoulder. Your animal has bitten me. If you dare to enter that spelling competition, I am going to annihilate you. Luther turned to Zar's followers. 
Who wants to come with me rather than staying here with this silly little madman and his stupid witch trap? Shouted Luta. One by one, Zar's followers backed away from Zar and towards Luta, and climbed on board their wolves or snowcats, muttering things like, "Sorry, Zar, this is a bit too crazy, even for you. And if witches aren't extinct, they are bad magic, Zar. We shouldn't be here." You see, crowed Luta triumphantly. A great leader has to have someone to lead, and no one wants to follow a magicless lunatic. Good luck with meeting your witch, loser boy. And then Luther rode away on the back of his wolf, followed by most of the other wizards. Cowards! Roared Zar, nearly crying. He was so angry. He ran into the undergrowth to retrieve the saucepan and shook his fist at their departing backs. We'll show you. We'll catch a witch. We'll take magic from it, and then we'll be so magic we'll fly without wings. Zar turned with a sigh to the bedraggled remains of his followers. Why did Luther always have to spoil everything? Zar had hardly anyone left now. Only three young wizards whose magic hadn't come in either. A girl called Heliotrope and two boys, Rush. And Darkish, a large lad with even larger ears, who had reached the age of seventeen without showing any signs of magic whatsoever, and who was slightly on the dim side. Bother! He's left me with the losers," tutted Zar. "Here,、yeah, I say, Zar, that's a bit unfair," protested Rush. "Will we really fly without wings?" said Darkish, flapping his big arms up and down. "Of course we will," promised Zar, rubbing his hands together excitedly. For Zar could never stay down for long. Those cowards are going to be so sorry they left. Darkish, you're the biggest, so you need to do the most digging," ordered Zar. Rush, I'm afraid we're going to have to wound you a little to tempt the witch into the trap. And if anything goes wrong, I thought you said this mission was completely safe," said Rush suspiciously. "Well, nothing is entirely safe," Zar backtracked quickly. "Life is dangerous, isn't it?" After all, you could get killed just climbing a tree, like I nearly was just now. This is not just climbing a tree," spluttered Caliburn from above, as the three young wizards began to obey Zar's orders. "This is intentionally trespassing on warrior territory, trying to set a trap for the scariest life form that has ever walked this planet." Caliburn sighed. Nobody was going to listen to him. Caliburn perched rigid on the tree branch, with his head under his wing, as if. For as long as he buried his head under there, if he couldn't see the future, the future would not happen. But of course, the old bird knew that would not work. Two, a warrior called Wish. Meanwhile, a stout and terrified warrior pony, with two young warriors sitting on its back, had set out secretly from Iron Warrior Fort under cover of darkness. Warriors were not supposed to leave the fort after nightfall, for the warriors were petrified of the magic that was out in the forest. Iron Warrior Fort was the largest hill fort you could possibly imagine, with thirteen watchtowers and encircled by seven great ditches cut into the hill. How scared these warriors must be of everything that is magic to have built such a mighty fort, white as bone, with little slit windows like the blink of a malevolent cat. But nonetheless. This particular warrior pony had managed to sneak out without the nervous sentries that clanked their way along the fort walls spotting it, and perhaps, just perhaps, those sentries were right to be anxiously straining their eyes into the endless green wilderness that surrounded and engulfed them, watching, peering, struggling to see what might be out there. For something bad was watching the pony from high up in the tree tops. It is too early to tell what that something was. Many bad things live in the bad woods. It could have been a cat monster. It could have been a werewolf. It could have been a roger. Rogers are a bit like ogres, but a lot more scary. Time will tell what it was. But it wasn't surprising that the pony had caught the something's attention. For the pony was cantering far too noisily through the undergrowth, and bumping along on its back were a skinny little warrior princess and her assistant bodyguard, Bodkin. They were wearing red cloaks over their armor, which made them shine out like stars in the dark green forest. 
short of wearing a big archery target on the top of their heads or a sign saying, Eat me, O oh hungry monsters of the bad woods, nothing could really have made them stand out more. The princess had a very long and regal name, but everybody called her Wish. Warrior princesses, of course, ought to be impressively tall and absolutely terrifying, like Wish's mother, Queen Sycorax. But Wish was neither scary nor large. She had a curious little face that was rather too interested in the world around her, and hair that stuck out too wispily, as if she'd accidentally hit some unnoticed bit of static electricity. A black patch covered her right eye. She seemed to be searching for something with the other. We're not supposed to come out here on our own in the day, let alone in the night time, said Bodkin, the assistant bodyguard, looking nervously over his shoulder. Bodkin wasn't the regular bodyguard of this weird little princess. Her proper bodyguard had fallen ill with a nasty autumn cold. Bodkin had landed the highly sought-after role as understudy for a royal bodyguard, even though he was only thirteen years old, because he was very studious, and he had come out top of his class in the advanced arts of bodyguarding exams. However, this was the first time he had done the actual job, and he was finding it a good deal harder than he had thought it would be. The princess wouldn't do what she was told, for starters. And although he studied very hard, to be honest, Bodkin didn't really like fighting very much, and the thought that he might actually be in a real situation where there was a possibility of violence was making him feel a little sick. There could be werewolves or cat monsters or giants out here, said Bodkin. And then there's the bears and the jaguars and the wizards and the roger breaths, and even dwarves can get nasty when they're hunting in packs. Oh, don't be so gloomy, Bodkin, replied the princess. We'll go back as soon as we find my pet. This is all your fault anyway. You frightened him when you said you'd report him to my mother, and so he completely panicked and ran away. I was only trying to stop you from getting into any more trouble, said Bodkin. You're not allowed pets. They're against the warrior rules. Bodkin was a boy who really believed in the rules. He was hoping to work his way up from being an assistant bodyguard to a household defender, and you didn't do that by breaking any rules. And you're most particularly not allowed this kind of pet. He must be terrified, worried Wish. We couldn't possibly leave him running away all on his own in the terrors of the badwoods, all alone and scared, and he might be being chased by raving fangmouths or something. Aha! she said with triumphant relief. There he is! She hauled on the pony's reins to bring him to a halt and picked up something that was scurrying through the undergrowth. Thank goodness! She stroked whatever it was gently and made soothing noises, as if to say, Don't worry, it's fine, you're safe now, you're with me. The sort of noises that might calm a petrified dog or cat or rabbit that had been running scared and all alone through the bad woods after the setting of the autumn sun. The pet was not a dog or a cat or even a rabbit. That pet of yours is a spoon, objected Bodkin. The assistant bodyguard was right. The pet was, indeed, a large iron dinner spoon. So he is, said Wish, as if she'd only just noticed, getting back up on the pony and drying off the spoon with the end of her sleeve. And that spoon is alive, princess, it's alive, said Bodkin, giving a little shiver of horror as he looked at the spoon, which means that it is an entirely banned magic enchanted object. Haven't you seen the signs all over Warrior Fort? Absolutely no magic, no enchanted objects, no animals indoors. All magic must be reported to a higher authority so that reports can be made and the magic got rid of. I'm not sure he's magic exactly, said Wish, hopefully. Just a little bendy. Of course he's magic, snapped Bodkin. Ordinary spoons do not jump up and down to get you to stroke them. Ordinary spoons just lie quietly and feed you your dinner. Look at this one. It's bowing to me. So he is, said Wish proudly. Isn't that clever? Bodkin breathed very heavily indeed. This is not clever. This is breaking so many rules it is difficult to know where to begin. Where did you find this spoon? He just turned up in my room one day like a wild mouse or something. So I fed him some milk and he's been hanging out with me ever since. Which was nice, because before he came, I was a bit lonely. Haven't you ever been lonely, Bodkin? Well, I have actually, admitted Bodkin. 
Ever since I did so well in the exams and got appointed your personal assistant bodyguard, all the other assistant bodyguards said I'd got above myself and now they're not talking to me and... Hang on a second! That's not the point! The point is, said Bodkin, if an enchanted object turns up unexpectedly in a warrior fort, you really ought to tell your mother, Queen Sycorax, immediately so she can remove its magic, not adopt it as your pet. At the mention of Queen Sycorax's name, the spoon swayed from side to side as if terror-stricken, and then hopped into Wish's waistcoat, hiding behind her body armour, so that only the bowl that was its face was staring out lit up with a strange, glowing, magic light. "'Look, you've scared him again,' Wish replied. "'The thing is, I don't think he wants his magic removed.' "'It's a completely painless process,' said Bodkin. "'But he doesn't want to do it,' said Wish. "'All right, then,' said Bodkin, folding his arms determinedly. "'In which case you have to let the spoon go, back into the wild. "'He belongs out there in this scary jungle "'with all the other monsters and magic things. "'These are his people.' I am putting my foot down, princess. You absolutely cannot take him back to the iron fort with you. You cannot keep this spoon as your pet. It's against the rules, and you will get in the most terrible trouble if anyone finds out. Wish looked very sad indeed. But I kind of identify with the spoon because he's like me. He doesn't fit in with all the other spoons. He doesn't fit in with the other spoons because he's alive, princess. He's alive! interrupted Bodkin. And all the other warriors ignore me, Wish carried on. You and this spoon are my only two friends. If I lose the spoon, that just leaves you. Well, technically speaking, I can't be your friend either, because you are a princess and I am a servant, and those are the rules, explained Bodkin. In which case, if I let the spoon go, I will be losing my only friend, said Wish. Okay, Wish! Bodkin was so upset that he forgot to call her princess. It was time for some stern words. I like you. I know you mean well, but let's face it. The reason you haven't got any friends is you're a bit weird. And weird doesn't go down well in Warrior Fort. You need to try and be more normal. And the first step to being normal is to get rid of the magic spoon. Wish tried one last desperate argument. But my mother has enchanted objects herself, said Wish. What about this, then? To Bodkin's horror, Wish drew a large ornamental sword from her scabbard. It wasn't like an ordinary sword. It had a very dirty, old-fashioned hilt, and even beneath the greenish grime that covered it, you could see that it was beautifully designed, with intertwining leaves and mistletoe and the leaves of other sacred trees twining all over it. On one side of the blade was carved these words in very fancy, curly, old-fashioned script. Once there were witches. And when Wish turned the blade over, the other side was engraved with, But I killed them. "'Where did you get that sword?' said Bodkin, in awed tones. "'Well, it was quite odd, actually. "'I found it lying in the main courtyard yesterday afternoon, "'and it didn't seem to belong to anyone, so I picked it up.' "'Didn't you hear the announcement at breakfast this morning "'about how a very valuable sword had gone missing from your mother's dungeons?' "'gasped Bodkin. "'Didn't you guess it might be this sword? "'Didn't you wonder if picking things up that don't belong to you might be stealing?' "'Yes, I did,' admitted Wish, stroking the sword longingly. "'But I was just going to hang on to it for a while longer, pretending it was mine. "'I'm so ordinary, and it's so special, and it would be lovely to own something so special. "'Don't you think?' No, I don't think. Thinking is dangerous. The defenders of the royal household are turning the fort upside down looking for this sword, and you've stolen it, goggled Bodkin. I haven't stolen it. I've only borrowed it. I was just about to give it back, but then you frightened the spoon, and I thought we might need something special to protect us if we were going into the badwoods on our own. I have a very strong feeling that it might be an enchanted sword, ended Wish triumphantly. Even my mother has enchanted objects, which means they must be all right. Your scary mother isn't keeping that sword as a pet, cried Bodkin, waving his long, thin arms around. You don't keep pets in dungeons. She's locked it up in the dungeons to keep it safe. 
Wish looked at the sword in a slightly worried way, as if this was only just occurring to her. Oh, yes. Now I come to think of it, you could be right about that. It did seem kind of out of character for my mother. She doesn't really like anything magic, does she? Where have you been living for the past thirteen years? cried Bodkin. There are whopping great signs up all over the fort. You can't have missed them. Your mother loathes the magic. She hates the magic. She has sworn never to rest till she has rid the entire forest of anything magic at all. Wish furrowed her brow. Yes, I have to say, I don't really understand that. Surely just because some magic is bad, it doesn't mean that all magic is bad. You're not supposed to understand, screeched Bodkin. You're a warrior. You're not supposed to be asking questions. It's very, very simple. You're just supposed to be obeying the warrior rules. Wish suddenly looked very dejected. The spoon standing on top of her head drooped. Bother, you're right, said Wish sadly. I've messed up again, haven't I, Bodkin? You most certainly have, said Bodkin. And then he added hurriedly, Your Highness, for in the excitement of the situation he had forgotten the warrior rules about how to correctly address royalty. This was the problem with Wish. Whenever you spent any time with her, you found yourself breaking rules without even realising it. If my mother ever finds out about this, she's going to be hopping mad, isn't she? said Wish, even sadder still. Absolutely hopping, agreed Bodkin, giving a little shiver at the thought of it. I wish I was normal like everyone else, said Wish. What can I do to put everything right again? Bodkin gave a sigh of relief, for it looked like at last the princess was seeing sense. OK, don't be sad. All is not lost, he said, giving Wish a little pat on the shoulder to cheer her up. You didn't mean to do the wrong thing, but you need to release this spoon into the wild right now and take this sword back to the fort immediately and you have to stop doing things like this and start behaving like a normal warrior princess and... Hang on. What was that? There was a sudden noise above them, like the snapping of a twig when something brushes up against it. They had been so busy arguing they had forgotten that they were not in the safety of Iron Warrior Fort, about to tuck into a splendid dinner, for warriors were very keen on their food. They were all alone in the bad woods, after dark, and for the first time they realised they were being watched. I mentioned, did I not, at the beginning of this chapter that something bad was watching them, quiet and dangerous, up in the treetop. A cold feeling came over the back of Wish's neck, with the hairs pricked up like the quills on a hedgehog. She looked all around, at the black, silent trees, their branches twisting, gnarled like the nobliest of goblins' fingers. She looked up, and she could not see anything. Only perhaps a certain darkening, and a shimmering, thickening of the air above them, as if that air was choked with something awful. As indeed it was and the coldness radiating out of the heart of that shining density was a coldness you have never felt before. Colder than the coldest depths of the northern ocean, colder than icicles, colder than polar caps, colder even than death itself. The freezing mist of the wildwood's ancient past crept under Wish's armour and sank like death into her bones. Was it Wish's imagination, or did the very air above them seem to be grinning? Wish pulled down the visor on her helmet. The spoon hopped up on top of Wish's head and sniffed the air around them. Suddenly he went rigid, as if sensing something terrible, and dived down into Wish's armour to hide. Run, pony, run, squealed Wish, and the exhausted little pony started violently and broke into a shambling, terrified, wobbling gallop. Anybody watching would have thought that they were mad, for it looked like they were running away from nothing at all. But there was definitely something very odd going on. Wish and Bodkin could see nothing above them except for dark night sky, stars and trees, but something about the way the tree branches were moving suggested that an invisible presence was hurtling against them. 
and the air rushing above them was so cold that it burned the top of Wish's forehead, and as the pony galloped faster and faster, the wind blowing directly behind them began to make an odd noise, like no wind that Wish had ever heard before. "'Now, you see, Bodkin, aren't you glad I brought the sword with me? I thought we might need it,' panted Wish, trying not to panic. "'Glad! Glad! We could be sitting right now in front of our dinner, safely in the dining room in Warrior Fort. And I think today it was going to be dear burgers, which is my favourite, and this pony is going in the wrong direction!' flapped Bodkin. "'The fort is the other way!' But whatever it was that was chasing them didn't want them to go back to the fort, so it was chasing them further and further and further into the bad woods. Does anyone know we're out here? cried Bodkin, who had drawn his bow and was shooting desperate arrows upwards, even though he was a terrible shot and he couldn't see what he was shooting at. Will they send out search parties? I'm afraid not, said Wish, squinting upwards, trying to work out what was pursuing them. Or not till the morning, anyway. I told my mother I was going to bed early with a headache. Brilliant, said Bodkin. Brilliant. As it happens, I think I can feel a bit of a headache coming on myself. Don't worry, princess. You mustn't worry. I'm here to protect you. Wish shook the spoon at whatever was following them. She may have been a somewhat weird warrior princess, but she certainly had courage. You better not follow us, whatever you are, shouted Wish at the terrifying screeching nothingness, for we are armed with an enchanted spoon. The sword, princess, murmured Bodkin through white lips. The sword sounds more scary. And a sword, shouted Wish, waving the sword in her right hand and the spoon in her left. A sword so dangerous it was locked in my mother's dungeons. But that, if anything, seemed to encourage whatever was following them even more, for the wind above them gave a hungry whine and rushed after them even faster. "'Never fear, princess!' cried Bodkin, shaking so much with anxiety that he could barely load his bow. "'This is a bad situation, but I will save you, for as a personal assistant bodyguard to the princess, I have been trained in the most advanced arts of bodyguarding!' Unfortunately, Bodkin discovered in those desperate moments that he had a terrible disadvantage as a potential bodyguard. He had a medical condition— that caused him to fall asleep in situations of extreme danger. He had barely said the last words of that brave speech before he collapsed on the princess's shoulder, snoring loudly. Bodkin! shrieked the princess. What are you doing? <coughs> Bodkin! shrieked Wish. Wake up now! Bodkin woke up with a start, mumbling, Where? What? Uh, how? Badwoods, panted the princess, being chased, something terrible, advanced art of bodyguarding. Oh, yes, I've been carefully trained for exactly these sorts of life or death emergencies, cried Bodkin, fitting another arrow into his bow, and unfortunately falling asleep again at the moment of aiming it, so that he tipped forward and accidentally shot the poor pony in the hindquarters. The pony squealed protestingly as the arrow grazed his bottom and then ran on in wild desperation through the pitch-dark forest. Wish's heart was beating fast like a rabbit's, and she didn't even notice when the bramble shredded her clothes to ribbons and tore long, painful scratches into her legs. The pony came upon an ice-cold stream and forced his way through the briars and splashed down into it, though the cold of the water burned them all like fire in the hope that whatever was following them would be put off the scent. The pony clambered out the other side and ran on through the darkness. Oh, murmuring mistletoe, thought Wish in terror. I should never have done this. Magic is banned for a reason. Warriors are not allowed out after dark for a reason. Iron Warrior Fort is built like it is for a reason. She could feel her heart beating so hard it felt like any moment it would break out of her chest. Faster! Faster! urged Wish, so choked with panic she could barely breathe. The pony galloped into a sudden clearing in the forest. The whining of this strange wind had an edge to it now, like the painful scritch of chalk on stone. A sound that grew louder as if building up to attack. Louder and louder the noise grew. Scritch! There was an extraordinary noise, as if the very air itself was being torn apart like a giant piece of paper. Terrified, Wish turned her face upward to face the attack with her drawn sword. There was a shout from a human voice somewhere behind her, and suddenly everything happened very quickly. 3. The Witch Feather Begins to Glow
Okay, I'm getting a little fed up now," said Rush, who was lying, pretending to be wounded, in front of a concealed net that was Zara's witch trap. "We've been here for hours. Make your helps a bit more pathetic," Zara called out bossily from his hiding place behind a nearby tree. "I could wound Rush if you like," grinned Tiffinstorm, showing little fangs. "He looks quite tasty." "I'm fine, thank you," said Rush hastily. Face it, Zar. Maybe witches really are extinct, like everyone says, and it's getting really late. Frankly, I'm more worried about warriors than I am witches. Don't worry," said Zar breezily. "Crusher would tell us if there were any problems, wouldn't you, Crusher?" Crusher's job was hanging onto the rope to pull the net tight when the witch came upon them and keeping lookout. The giant was a long way up, so Zar had to shout to get his attention. Hmm," said Crusher. Thoughtfully, there is a bit of a problem, actually," he admitted. But Zar could not hear him because the giant was so far away, and he spoke so very, very slowly. Giants operate in a slightly different time scale from everyone else. However, it didn't really matter because Zar wasn't listening anyway, and the problem that Crusher was thinking about was slightly different from Zar's idea of a problem. Some people think that because giants talk slowly, they must be stupid, but they could not be more wrong. Giants are big, and they tend to have big thoughts. And Crusher was a long stepper, high walker giant, one of the deepest thinkers of all. So the problem, thought Crusher, was this: Was there a limit to the expanding universe, or would it go on expanding forever? I told you it was a big problem. If space was infinite and stars were infinite, thought Crusher, didn't that mean that there must also be infinite numbers of Crushers out there? How was that possible, and what were the implications of that? Which was all very interesting, but unfortunately, it did mean that although Crusher was holding vaguely onto the rope, his mind was wandering among the stars, and therefore he was entirely unaware of any approaching danger. A long step or high walker giant does not make the ideal lookout. Just a little longer, Rush," whispered Zar, eyes bright. "There are witches about. I'm sure I can smell them." Zar closed his eyes and sniffed the air. "Please," thought Zar. "Please, gods of the trees and the water, you don't know how hard it is growing up in a world full of magic when you have no magic of your own. Everybody laughing at you, pitying you. Let that be a witch, because I need to be magic. I want to make my father proud of me." At that very moment, Zar's sprite sprang, hissing out of the darkness, to rotate around Zar's head in a glowing, sprightly halo. Eyes blazing suddenly red, hissing like a nest of wasps. Witches, witches, witches! I knew it," said Zar in excitement. "Draw your wands, sprites. Get your bows ready. We're about to be attacked." No, we're not," sighed Heliotrope, who was now thoroughly fed up with Zar and his mad schemes and wanted to go home. Witches are extinct. Everyone knows that. But Rush, lying on the ground, felt the air all around him grow suddenly so cold that he shivered. Zar called down encouragingly, "Don't move, Rush. You're doing brilliantly. You look very victim-like. The witches are really going to be fooled. Crusher, get ready now." Silence from above. Crusher. Yes, I think I've made a breakthrough. Announced Crusher, thrusting his head down through the tree canopy with snailish slowness in human time, but surprising quickness in giant time, because Crusher was excited. I'm leaning towards the idea that space might be finite. Crusher, that's not important right now, and I told you not to think deep thoughts," snapped Zar. For the process of deep thought made a giant's head smoke and smoulder like a forest fire, and this meant that their exact location could be pinpointed from a considerable distance by, say, enemy warriors or roger breaths, or indeed, witches. We're being attacked!" shouted Zar in exasperation. "Oh!" Crusher broke off from his giant daydreams, remembered where he was, and got a good hold on the rope. What nobody noticed in the anxiety of the moment was the great black feather swinging from Zar's belt. If anyone had been looking at the feather at that moment, they might have noticed that it had begun to glow, dully but ominously, in the darkness. I'm sure there's some sort of reasonable and scientific explanation for it.
but a crow's feather would not do that, however large the crow. 4. The witch trap catches something. From Tsar's point of view, here is what happened. Tsar was waiting, hiding behind the tree, trembling with excitement. The sprites hummed louder and louder, whirling round his head, screeching, Witches! 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 Tsar heard the sound of hoofbeats, and something galloped into the moonlit clearing, too fast to stop, something that if Tsar could have seen it properly, had the legs of a pony below, and human bodies in the middle, and a great indistinct cloud above it. What strange monster was this? Rush was frozen with terror. He could not move. He would be run down. Scritch! There was a tearing noise, as if the atmosphere was being ripped apart like paper. And then Tsar's senses were assaulted all at once by the worst smell you could possibly imagine. Rotting corpse and mouldy eggs and dead man six weeks gone with unwashed feet and underarm reek, while a splintering scream like the death agony of five hundred foxes buried itself in Tsar's brain and reverberated inside his head till he felt like he might go crazy. What is going on, thought Tsar, with a tiny part of his mind that could still think. Rush curled up like a little hedgehog, rather pathetically putting his hands over his head, as if it would protect him from whatever horror was making that noise and that smell. Tsar yelled up to Crusher, and then everything happened all at once. The cloud or wind howled louder. Who knew what it was? Maybe Tsar was right and it really was a witch. But whatever it was, it screamed downwards. And at exactly the same time, all eight of the sprites whacked their spells with their wands, sending the spells whipping towards the centre of the clearing, with white-hot heat like speeding fireflies. And Crusher hauled like crazy on the net, and there was a gigantic explosion. Tsar threw himself flat on his stomach behind the tree to get out of the way. There was a great screeching noise. Something was ricocheting round the clearing, something unusually huge and dark and feathery, and then exiting with a dreadful piercing wail. Clouds of black and green smoke filled the glade, and Tsar got to his feet, coughing. Hanging in the centre of the clearing was his dangling witch trap, Crusher holding on to the other end for dear life. Something was struggling wildly inside, and all around the net was a force field of air, red as blood, red as fiery flame. What on earth just happened, thought Rush, coughing and choking with the remnants of that smell, and unable to believe that he was still alive. It worked, gasped Tsar, staggering to his feet, unable to believe his luck. Oh, my goodness, it worked! We've done it! We've really caught a witch! That's its force field! Stop attacking its sprites! It's pointless! Sure enough, the sprite spells shooting out sparks were trying to push their way through the bright red air. But the air turned redder still, and spiky, like living, breathing, flaming thorns. Rush looked at the struggling net and gulped open-mouthed. Oh, by mistletoe and all things ivy, maybe Tsar really has done it. And maybe he's called a witch. Let's get out of here! Rush scrambled to his feet, jumped on the back of his snowcat, and ran away, as did Heliotrope and Darkish. They assumed that Tsar was going to follow them, but Tsar was about the only boy in the entire world who really was mad enough to stay in a clearing with an actual live witch. You's brilliant! You's marvellous! You's the best leader in the world! Uh, what do we do now, boss? asked Squeeze Juice nervously. Even Tsar was now terrified, but he would rather die than admit this to his sprites and his animals. Surround the witch, ordered Tsar. Complaining loudly, the sprites nonetheless surrounded the net in a burning circle, and Tsar forced himself to put one foot in front of another and approach the net, his hands so sweaty with fear he nearly dropped the very small saucepan. The smell in the clearing was so chokingly bad, it was like swimming through a disgusting sulphurous soup. Tsar stood underneath the net, staring up at it slowly, swinging above them, back and forth, back and forth. Rather unexpectedly, the four distinctive legs of a horse were dangling down from the holes in the net. Wow, breathed Tsar. Who would have thought it? Witches aren't like birds. 
They're more like centaurs. OK, witch, shouted Tsar, trying to make his voice sound scary and waving the saucepan threateningly in one trembling hand. Don't try anything stupid. We have you completely surrounded, and I am armed with a weapon made of iron. There was a short silence, and then a small, shaky voice from inside the net said, I'm not a witch. Witches are extinct. Everyone knows that. Why are you attacking us? What do you want? Well, of course, a witch isn't going to admit it's a witch, is it? said Tsar. Don't you try and trick me, witch. I'm not trying to trick you, said the voice, less shaky now and more indignant. My name is Wish, not Witch. Even if witches did exist, they're supposed to be green, aren't they? With acid blood and feathers and everything. There was another pause. Well, what kind of monster are you then? demanded Tsar. Are you some kind of centaur? No, no, said the voice. That's just my pony. I think he may have fainted. Me and my friend Bodkin were going through the forest and something suddenly started chasing us. Let us go! Botheration. It wasn't a witch after all. It had all been for nothing. His horrible superior older brother had been right all along and the entire evening had been a waste of time. Let whatever it is down, Crusher, sighed Tsar, flattened by pulverising disappointment. Slowly, Crusher let down the net. The pony had not fainted, poor thing. It had been hit by one of Tiffin Storm's sleep-inducing curses, and it lay on the ground, snoring loudly. But Tsar saw that there were humans in the net, too. A small human dressed head to toe in armour who scrambled up from the snoring pony and stepped out of the net, waving a large ornamental sword. And behind the teeny little human, a slightly larger human, skinny as a rake and also encased entirely in armour, who was stumbling to his feet as if he was just waking up. We know that these two humans were Wish and Bodkin. Bodkin was the taller one and Wish was the little one with the sword. But Tsar had never met a warrior before and he could never imagine that Wish and Bodkin might be heroes of this story, just like he was himself. All Tsar saw was that these were two humans wearing iron breastplates and carrying iron swords, which meant they must be warriors, and Tsar had been brought up to hate the warriors like poison, because they were the enemy. Excellent. After lurching this way and that from fear to excitement to disappointment, Tsar was spoiling for a nice, straightforward fight. If he couldn't catch a witch, at least he could kill an enemy. Warriors! cried Tsar fiercely, narrowing his gaze, getting a good grip on his saucepan, and he drew a heavy oak staff from his rucksack. Warriors! 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 hissed the sprites, burning red with anger. Kill them! Kill them! Kill them! It's a wizard! And it's creatures, cried Bodkin in alarm, pointing at Tsar and leaping protectively in front of Wish. And they look aggressive. They certainly did, and Wish stared around, petrified at the burning sprites, on fire with fury, flames licking off their long limbs, sparks spitting all over the place, the growling wolves, bear and snowcats showing their teeth, and way, way above them, the gigantic figure of the giant in the background. They were hopelessly outnumbered and giants were supposed to eat people. Sprites could magic you into a slow death, and one look at those snowcats told you they could tear you to pieces. Wish had an enchanted sword, but she knew she wasn't a very good sword fighter, and let's face it, Bodkin hadn't been much help as a bodyguard so far. They didn't have a chance. Don't worry, princess, shouted Bodkin bravely. I'll deal with them. Bodkin drew his spear and shook his sword. He advanced in a menacing manner. He caught sight of the giant. He stopped dead in his furiously warlike pose. He blinked twice, and then his eyes closed, his head flopped forward, and he slowly toppled over like a falling tree, accidentally chopping his spear in half with his sword as he fell. And he lay there, with his mouth open. Tsar looked down at the fallen bodkin in astonishment. Was this a trick? Snowcats, wolves, cover me, ordered Tsar. Their fur bristling, the animals circled round Tsar, ready to pounce. Bear, cover the guy on the ground. He may be faking. The bear put a big bear paw on Bodkin's chest and sat on him. Sprites, leave this to me. 
I'll show these wicked warriors that we wizards know how to fight, cried Tsar, and he launched himself at Wish, saucepan in one hand, staff in the other. Wish parried Tsar's thrust with the enchanted sword, and the fight began. Wish found that fighting with an enchanted sword made things a lot easier than fighting with a normal sword. The enchanted sword could anticipate where the next saucepan thrust or lunge from Tsar's staff was coming from, and throw itself in the way of that thrust, dragging Wish with it. The sword jerked her this way and that, with Wish gripping onto it with both hands for all the world as if she were hanging onto the tail of a wild bull. Caliburn was in a frenzy of worry, and he flapped about the fighter's head, squeaking, The enchanted sword! Be very careful with that enchanted sword! Don't let it touch you! There's something wrong with it! An enchanted sword? breathed Tsar. Impossible! How could a warrior be fighting with an enchanted sword? Warriors didn't use magic. The enchanted sword made a sweeping lunge forward, and this thrust finally disarmed Tsar. His staff went spinning into the undergrowth, followed by the saucepan. Do you surrender? said Wish, holding the enchanted sword above Tsar's head. I surrender, said Tsar, from between gritted teeth. Don't trust them! Wizards are tricksters! shouted Bodkin, who had woken up from his faint, but was still trapped beneath the bear. Wish ignored this instruction, and instead relaxed, stepped back, and lowered the sword. Which was a mistake. Bodkin was right. Tsar was not to be trusted. King Cat! Night Eye! Attack! shouted Tsar, as soon as the sword was lowered. King Cat leapt in and smashed Wish down to the ground. The force of the blow knocked the enchanted sword out of Wish's hand, and as soon as it left her grip, the enchantment left it. The sword went dead and fell to the forest floor, as cold and lifeless as a normal sword. Tsar picked it up, and sixty stone of powder-blue giant links in the form of King Cat leaned on Wish's chest and cracked open her helmet with its jaws, like a nutcracker cracking a nut. The two halves of the helmet fell away, and Tsar was looking straight into the face of an odd-looking little girl with a patch over one eye. "'It's a girl!' said Tsar in surprise. The sprites laughed uproariously at this. "'Tsar was being beaten by a girl!' Wish was looking straight into the face of a snarling snow cat and a wizard boy who was holding the enchanted sword over her head in a purposeful fashion. "'And now,' said the wizard boy, "'do you surrender?' Five. When bad stars cross and worlds collide. I most certainly will not surrender, said Wish. You cheated! Wizards don't play by warrior rules, said Tsar. Cheat of a wizard, wickedness of a warrior, curse maker, forest poisoner, child eater, magic destroyer. May you be ground by the teeth of the great grey ogre into pieces that are smaller than the eyes of lice on a fly, cursed Tsar. Both Tsar and Wish were cold and tired and had just had a terrible fright. Fear had turned to anger, as it so often will, and they settled easily into shouting the kind of insults and nasty language at each other that had been exchanged between wizards and warriors since the warriors first invaded from across the seas and the two sets of humans met in battle in the wild woods centuries before. Tsar's face was flushed with temper, and he held the sword over Wish's head in such a purposeful fashion that Bodkin shouted out, Don't kill her! She's the daughter of Queen Sycorax, and if you kill her, Queen Sycorax's revenge will be terrible! Tsar stared at Wish in astonishment. A daughter of Queen Sycorax? But you can't be! Queen Sycorax was a legend in the forest, known for her cruelty and height and her pitiless warrior strength. How could this tiny matchstick of a girl be scary Queen Sycorax's daughter? A daughter of Queen Sycorax! Kill her! Kill her! Kill her! Kill her! hissed the sprites, creeping through the air towards Wish, their bows loaded with the most deadly of their curses. One word from Tsar, and they would let them fly. Tsar had always boasted that if he ever met an enemy he would kill them instantly. But boasts are one thing and actually killing a real live girl your own age who is right in front of you and clearly terrified, though trying not to be, with a sword you have just cheated her out of, well, that's quite another. And Tsar found he could not do it. My ancestors would have done it, thought Tsar, guiltily. 
Luta would not have hesitated. But Tsar paused uncertainly. And then, to his further surprise, he found himself being attacked by what appeared to be a spoon, making ferocious lunges and rapping him painfully on the head. I'll call off my spoon if you call off your beer, panted Wish. To the disappointment of the sprites, who were hissing like hornets, Tsar lowered the enchanted sword and gave a sign to his bear, who let Bodkin go with a grunt. The enchanted spoon stopped rapping Tsar on the head, gave him a small, apologetic bow, and hopped back down to Wish. The wizard and the warriors stared at each other in amazement, still hostile and suspicious, but also curious. I am Wish, daughter of Sycorax, Queen of the Warriors, said Wish, and this is my assistant bodyguard, Bodkin. Who are you? I am Tsar the Magnificent, son of Enkanzo, King of the Wizards, said Tsar. These are my companions, my wolves, my bear, my snow cats, King Cat, Night Eye, Forest Heart, my bird, Caliburn, my giant, Crusher, and my sprites, Ariel, Mustard Thought, Tiffin Storm, Hinky Punk, Time Loss. The sprites weaved viciously around the warriors' heads, sparking and burning menacingly. Don't forget us, squeaked Squeeze Juice. Oh, yes, these are sprites too, but they're so young we call them hairy fairies, said Tsar. Bumbleboozle and the baby, Squeeze Juice, whispered Squeeze Juice into Bodkin's ear suddenly and alarmingly. The long trail of his antenna sent goosebumps all over Bodkin's scalp as Bodkin flapped him desperately away. Wish gave a sigh of jealousy as she looked at Tsar's companions, particularly the sprites. She reached out a hand to the one Tsar called Squeeze Juice, which was a funny-looking little thing, furry as a bumblebee. I'm afraid that Squeeze Juice bit her. Wow, said Wish, sucking her finger. Sprites are tougher than I expected. They're kind of violent, and they don't seem to like me very much. Of course they don't like you, you stupid warrior, said Tsar. Your wicked mother captures our giants and dwarves and sprites in her terrible traps, and then we never see them again. But my mother doesn't kill the sprites she captures, said Wish. She just has this stone that takes away magic that she keeps in her dungeons, and all she does is mercifully remove their magic by placing them upon the stone. Wish's voice trailed off as she remembered how much she didn't want the spoon to have his magic removed. In a completely painless process, Bodkin prompted her. And you think that does not kill them? hissed Tiffinstorm. Why not just remove their hearts entirely? A sprite without its magic is a sprite who has lost its soul. Oh dear. Wish did not know what to think now. This all sounded so sad. But the magic is bad for them, she said, falteringly. And they use it to curse us. And giants eat people. That's why my mother traps them. She told me so. Tsar and the sprites laughed at such ignorance. Giants don't eat people. Wish looked up at the giant in wonder. And then, to Bodkin's horror, the giant leaned down and very gently picked Wish up in his giant fingers and lifted her into the air. It should have been frightening. But the giant moved so slowly and his fingers around her were so comfortingly huge that all Wish felt as she rose up up, up into the treetops was excitement at the new experience. Look around you and look down, said the giant. What seems important from up here? Wish looked over the edge of the giant's fingers and caught her breath with the surprise of seeing the world from an entirely different viewpoint. The forest canopy stretched out for miles in every direction and the night sky above was crammed with stars that went on forever. Down below, the humans were as small as sprites, and the sprites were just glowing flecks of dust. One of the humans, Bodkin, was shouting something. Put her down! But it was such a long way away Wish had trouble hearing him, and his anxiety seemed from this vantage point mistaken and missing the point. The forest is important, said Wish, and the stars... Correct, smiled the giant. Look into my eyes, said the giant. Do I look like the kind of person who would eat human beings? The giant's face was covered with a network of wrinkles and laughter lines like the wandering paths on an old map, 
and his eyes were kind and wise. No, said Wish, you don't. Correct again, said the giant. Unlike ogres, giants are vegetarian. Crusher grinned and pulled up a small tree. He gave a huge smile at Wish as the entire tree disappeared into his enormous mouth, crunching whole branches as if they were mere twigs. Better for the digestion, he said dreamily. The first seeds of doubt about all that she had been told about magic creatures were sown in Wish's mind when she looked up at the giant's kind face, laughing so loudly at his own bad joke. Crusher doesn't seem like a good name for you, said Wish. It's short for problem crusher, said Crusher. Are you all right? cried Bodkin anxiously. Of course I'm all right, said Wish, as the giant gently put her back down. That giant really is not dangerous. Was it possible that warriors had been mistaken in their view of the magic all along? Could there be another way of looking at things other than the warrior way? Wish's world view was spinning upside down, and that is always a difficult moment. Don't listen to them, princess, said Bodkin. They're putting a spell on us. They're trying to make us see things from their point of view. Zar was looking equally thoughtful. Warriors want to destroy all magic, he frowned, gazing at the enchanted sword he was holding in his hand. Surely a warrior princess shouldn't have magic objects. No, she shouldn't, said Bodkin. I have been saying that for some time. Be careful with that enchanted sword, Zar, urged Caliburn. There's something wrong with it. I can feel it in my feathers. Staring at the blade, Zar suddenly realized Caliburn was right. There was indeed something odd about the sword, something so strange and out of the ordinary and downright uncanny that he nearly dropped it in his excitement. Oh, my goodness, Caliburn, gasped Zar. I don't believe this. This is incredible. I'll tell you what's wrong with this sword. It's made out of iron. And so is the enchanted spoon. They are iron and magic mixed together. Unbelievable. Inconceivable. Impossible, gasped Caliburn. Where did you get this sword? breathed Zar, turning it over and over in his hands. I found it in the corridor, but it's an enchanted sword, so I think it's made its way out of my mother's dungeons on its own, said Wish, her heart sinking. That's not your sword, Zar. It belongs to my mother. Give it back right now. Wish me to grab for the sword, and Zar whisked it out of her reach. Night Eye stepping between them and growling warningly so she couldn't get any closer. Hang on a second, said Zar. What's that? Zar noticed for the first time the words written on the blade. Once there were witches. The hair stood up on the back of his neck. Zar turned the sword over and read the words on the other side. But I killed them. After the word them, there was an arrow that pointed to the tip of the sword, where something was now glistening. A single drop of green blood. The three humans looked at the green stain, slightly smoking. Don't touch it! screeched Caliburn. Six. Be careful what you wish for. The three youngsters, the bird, the sprites and the animals, stared at that single drop of green blood with growing horror, and in Zar's case, excitement. Witch blood, said Zar in delight. What do you mean, witch blood? protested Bodkin. Witches are extinct. But he did not scoff as convincingly as he might have done had he been tucked snugly behind the seven ditches of the Warrior Hill Fort. There was something about the bad woods after dark, when the hair ice a sprite word for fine strands of ice that form on dead woods in freezing conditions, was prickling and growing all over each twisting twig of dead wood that made one fear that possibly, just possibly, witches might not be so extinct after all. This is a witch-killing sword, said Zar. Look, it says so on the blade, and it found its way out of your warrior dungeons because it sensed that the witches were waking once more in the wood. 
that's not possible, said Bodkin. Although it is true, said Wish, slowly, that just before Tsar caught us in that trap, we were being attacked by something, and I think I may have wounded the something with the sword. You were being attacked by a witch, and that is witch blood, smiled Tsar. No, it isn't. Lots of things have green blood, said Bodkin. Cat monsters, roger breaths, green teeth goblins, green teeth ogres. It can't be a witch, because witches are extinct. Probably extinct, corrected Caliburn. Definitely not extinct, said Tsar, pointing to the centre of the clearing. There, right beside Tsar's witch trap, was another black feather. A feather like a crow's, but significantly larger. Tsar picked it up. As the feather came close to the other feather that was hanging around Tsar's belt, both feathers began to glow, a dull, greeny glow, a glow of ominous magic. And as Tsar held the feather up to the tip of the sword, the stain glowed too, like the luminescence of a firefly, but with a spookier green tinge to it. Witches, grinned Tsar. There was a terrible silence. Witches might have returned to the Badwoods, the most dreadful creatures ever to have walked the earth, alive once more. The two enemy groups, animals and sprites, stepped a little closer to one another, looking out at the dark forest all around them, joining in mutual horror at what might possibly be out there. If that really is witch blood, it probably isn't, but if it is, even that single drop is very, very dangerous, shivered Caliburn. Wipe it off on that tree bark, Tsar, before it hurts anyone. Oh, I'm not going to waste it, said Tsar. There must have been a reason that I caught someone called Wish in my witch trap. What are the chances of that happening? I wish to be magic, and the universe is trying to tell me that it's granted me my wish. It could be telling you something else. The universe is very complicated, shrieked Caliburn. It could be testing you. It could be warning you not to make wishes as foolish as that one. But Tsar was not listening to Caliburn. Here was fate showing him the way to get magic out of a witch. Don't touch that Tsar, shouted Caliburn, so anxious that the feathers dropped out of him like black rain. Don't touch it, don't touch it, don't touch it, hissed the sprites. But Tsar reached out the palm of his hand and pressed it hard against the tip of the sword where the green drop of blood was glistening. He scratched it once, twice, in the shape of the first letter of his name, X. And from that moment, Tsar's story took a different path, a path that would be very difficult to come back from. No! begged Caliburn. It was too late. Too late. Too late. The tip of the enchanted sword pierced Tsar's hand. And he screamed and doubled over in pain, holding his hand to his stomach. Caliburn took his wings away from his eyes. Oh, Tsar, what have you done? Tsar straightened up. His eyes were alight with excitement, although the pain of it was making him shiver and shake his hand like it had been burned. Too late, grinned Tsar holding up his hand, and there, in the centre of it, was the witch blood mixed with his blood in the shape of an X. When bad stars cross and worlds collide, X marks the spot. What did he do that for? asked Wish. I'm going to use the witch blood to perform magic, said Tsar confidently. Will it work? asked Wish. He has absolutely no idea, said Caliburn. Do you think that Tsar is the sort of person who thinks things through? We don't know what that green stuff is. You better hope it isn't witch blood, Tsar, because witch blood is supposed to be exceptionally dangerous. You may be able to use it to perform magic, but it could turn you over to the dark side. You might become one of the witch's creatures. Your father would lose his kingship. Caliburn was even more agitated than normal. But I have to admit, he said, cheering up a smidgen, it is much more likely not to be witch blood after all. There are plenty of things with green blood in the Badwoods. It could be werewolf blood, and that would just turn you into a werewolf. Bother, 
said Tsar, shaking his hand a little more uncomfortably. I never thought of that. Which would be inconvenient, said Caliburn. All that not going out after midnight and howling at the moon and extra body hair and everything. But it wouldn't be the end of the world. It would be great, squealed Squeeze Juice. You would be all furry like me. Oh, please, turn into a werewolf, Tsar. Turn into a werewolf. But Tsar didn't look that happy about the idea of turning into a werewolf. And Wish and Bodkin took a step backward, just in case. And it may just be Roga breath blood. That doesn't have any effect at all, as far as we know. You're right, said Caliburn. I shall look on the positive side. Let's hope it's just Roga breath blood. In which case, we shouldn't really be hanging around here, because don't forget, Roga breaths do try and follow you if they've wounded you to get their blood back. How do they do that? asked Bodkin in horror. You don't want to know, said Caliburn. Let's just say they're kind of attached to their blood, so their methods of recovering it aren't pretty. Well, whatever you say, I'm still hoping it's witch blood, said Tsar, obstinately. But even if it isn't, I still have the sword, don't I? Tsar hung the sword from his belt. Not to be recommended. A sword should always be put safely away in a scabbard, but Tsar was not someone who worried much about health and safety. That's not your sword, said Wish. Give us back our sword. Sword? said Tsar, innocently opening his eyes wide. What sword? The enchanted sword that belongs to my mother and is presently shoved into your belt, said Wish. Oh, that sword, said Tsar, vaulting onto King Cat's back. That sword has been given to me by fate, so I can be the boy of destiny and lead my people to fight back against you warriors. You can't argue with fate. It hasn't been given to you by fate, yelled Wish. You're stealing it. Give us back our sword, you burglar. Tsar ignored her and turned to the others. Come on, everyone. We need to get back so I can beat Looter in the spelling competition. Hang on a second. What about us? asked Wish. We can't go home, can we? Your sprite spells have sent my pony to sleep. The pony was, indeed, still snoring peacefully in the centre of the clearing. Well, you really shouldn't have gone out in the bad woods after dark if you didn't want anything bad to happen, advised Tsar, with sheer, unbelievable Tsar-like cheek. At that moment, there was a distant sound of stamping horse feet and a cry of dogs, and the sprites hissed in alarm, Warriors! Queen Sycorax's iron warriors had spotted the giant in their badwoods territory. Tsar had been right about the deep thoughts, the smoke, and were galloping out of Iron Warrior Fort to investigate. There you are. Your problem is solved, said Tsar to Wish. Your people are coming, and they can take you home. But we'll be in big trouble because we sneaked out of the fort without permission, said Wish. Please, will you help us get back to our own fort without them finding us? I haven't got time to do that before the competition starts, said Tsar. But I'll very kindly let you come with me, and you can stay the night in my room in Wizard Camp. That's burglary and kidnap, said Wish furiously. Take us back to Iron Warrior Fort and give me back my sword, you horrible wizard. Well, I really don't see what that's got to do with me said Tsar, in surprise. Why should I care about the problems of a couple of enemy warriors? I'm doing my best, but you're being very difficult. If Wish had been doubting that wizards were as bad as everybody said they were, she instantly changed her mind. My mother was right about you magic people, stormed Wish. You're cheats, and you're treacherous, and you have no morals, and you're completely out of control, and... She's right, Tsar, squawked Caliburn. You get back from the universe what you give to the universe, and kidnapping this girl and stealing her sword means you can expect something truly dreadful from the universe in return. Do as you would be done by, or you will be well and truly done. Well, the universe ought to be very pleased that I'm not leaving them here to be attacked by witches. I can't understand why you're not all happy for me. Tsar frowned. It's terribly selfish of you. I am the boy of destiny. I am the chosen one. He turned to his animals. And the giant. Night Eye, Forest Heart, Crusher, bring these stupid warriors and their pony to the fort after me. I shall fly with the warriors too, squeaked Squeeze Juice. I shall stay with them and look out for Jagulars. Don't feel you have to, Squeeze Juice, said Tsar, rather offended. I wants to, sang Squeeze Juice, ever enthusiastic. I likes her. She's a bit funny looking, and she's only got one eye, but she smells more like an apricot than a mongular being, and I likes her hair. Squeeze Juice flew into Wish's hair and fluffed up the back of it so it made a fuzzy little bird's nest for him to hide in. The spoon was jealous. This was his territory. Well, there's no accounting for tastes, huffed Tsar crossly. 
I'd have thought you'd want to hang out with the boy of destiny, but if you feel sorry for these poor weirdos, it's up to you, Squeeze Juice. Go on, everyone, yelled Czar. Race you back to the fort. King Cat leaped forward in a greeny grey bound, and the animals followed in a wild, crazy pack, the sprites zooming ahead. Turning back time is impossible. Probably. But if Czar could have seen Wish after he left her in the clearing, and if he could have seen the look on her face as she suddenly realised she couldn't make things right by putting back the sword, and that her mother would inevitably now discover her disobedience in that uncanny way that mothers do, and if he could have known that Wish's mother wasn't the kind of mother who had given her daughter the impression that she would forgive her daughter anything, if he could have seen Wish crying with a spoon who couldn't talk, trying to comfort her with no words, and the assistant bodyguard, also sad, patting her on the back, and Squeeze Juice pulling faces and turning cartwheels to try and cheer her up. If he could have seen all that, would Tsar have wanted to turn back time, even though that is impossible? Possibly. But looking into other people's lives when they are not right in front of you is also impossible. Probably. I say probably because turning back time and looking into other people's lives when they are not right in front of you are both things that require the kind of magic we call imagination. Tsar had not developed that kind of magic yet, any more than he could move objects with the sheer power of his mind or fly without the helpful addition of wings. So as soon as Wish was out of his sight, Tsar promptly forgot about her and carried on with the much more important task of congratulating himself on how clever he'd been as he rode on King Cat's back to Wizard Camp. Meanwhile, back in the clearing, Wish had stopped crying, because Wish was a practical person and crying wasn't going to help. "'What are we going to do now?' said Bodkin, with round, goggling eyes, bulging with dismay at the way the situation had developed. "'Warriors don't quit, Bodkin!' We're just going to have to follow that cheating burglar of a czar boy to his wizard camp and steal that enchanted sword back off him and then we can sneak back into our own fort before morning, said Wish. That sword is magic mixed with iron and we mustn't let it fall into the hands of the wizards. Oh, is that all we have to do? said Bodkin, hollowly. And here was I thinking we had a problem. On the plus side, we do get to ride these snowcats, said Wish. That's a plus side, said Bodkin looking in horror at the gigantic wild beasts standing uncomfortably close to them. But they're banned animals! It's against the rules! Timidly, Wish put out her hand and touched the unbelievable softness of Forest Heart's head. She had been absolutely dying to ride on one of the snow cats from the moment she set eyes on them. Gingerly, Wish climbed onto his back. "'Will you be following us, Crusher?' Wish called up to the giant. Crusher looked delighted to have his feelings consulted. "'I'm a bit slower than those snow cats,' he said, giving a great smile like a cracked pumpkin. "'But I'll be right behind you. I'll be fine. I'm a giant.' Of course. What was she thinking? A giant could take care of itself. He was probably a terrifying fighter, even if he was a vegetarian. "'Follow Tsar, please, snow cat,' said Wish. Forest Heart leaped up and bounded forward with velvet suddenness. I'm actually riding a snow cat. In real life, thought Wish with disbelieving excitement as the links weaved smoothly through the trees, the night wind blowing back Wish's hair. Wish forgot the peril of the moment and whooped in joy. By holly and mistletoe and witch's toenails and the stinky breath of the goggle-eyed goblin hopper, thought Bodkin, all alone in the clearing, that little princess was more like her mother than she looked. Stubborn, reckless, pig-headed, and the wizard boy was even worse. What was it with royalty? Maybe all the rich food they ate went to their heads. But what could poor Bodkin do? He couldn't stay here all alone in the possibly werewolf-infested wood, enjoying the cool night air and playing spot the roger breath. And besides, he ought to be protecting and controlling the uncontrollable little princess. That was his job. So, reluctantly, he climbed on top of the second band animal, who equally reluctantly allowed himself to be climbed on, and leaped forward after Wish. The giant crusher leaned down and gently picked up the sleeping pony in one giant hand. He smoothed the pony's mane with one giant finger, like a human might pet a mouse 
before very gently putting the pony in one of his pockets, and very slowly lumbering after Bodkin and Wish and the snow cats. Don't worry, shouted Wish across to Bodkin as Night Eye caught up with Forest Heart. It's going to be fine. Don't worry, said Bodkin sarcastically. It's going to be fine. So far tonight we have broken out of Warrior Fort without permission, taken an enchanted spoon as a pet, stolen your mother's extremely precious and, as it turns out, exceptionally dangerous sword, let that same sword fall into wizard hands, thus putting into peril the entire war against the magic, and now we are travelling into the heart of enemy territory on the back of a whole load of banned animals having been kidnapped by a lunatic wizard boy who may or may not be about to turn into a werewolf. Why would I worry? Bodkin's stomach gave a loud rumble. And we've missed supper. Dear burgers, my favourite. Squeeze Juice zipped ahead like a little streak of white lightning, screeching, Eyes the lookout! Eyes the lookout! Ah! There's a jaguar! There's a jaguar! Oh, no, sorry, it's my mistake, it's a tree trunk. Sorry, everybody! Silence as they went farther and farther into the dark wilderness of the wild woods, deeper and deeper into the unknown where strange eyes seemed to glare from behind trees, and terrifying shrieks of the night-time screamed all around them that could be jaguars or could be werewolves or could be worse than all of these. Luckily, Bodkin did not see two things that happened after they left the clearing, or he would have been even more worried than he was already. Firstly, the giant Crusher was captured by Sycorax's iron warriors. Wish had been right to be concerned about him, Giants are deep thinkers, but unfortunately, the fact that they operate in a slower time zone puts them at a severe disadvantage when faced with much smaller enemies. Crusher just about had time to think, What on earth is going? before the warriors on their plunging horses exploded into the clearing and wound iron chains round and round his legs. The warriors warned him that if he made a sound, they would kill the pony. So the giant was silent as he was dragged away towards Iron Warrior Fort, making the treetops sway as he stumbled and blundered after the angry ant-like warriors. What were they so cross about? Giants didn't understand crossness. It seemed like such an obvious waste of time. And then there was silence. But the air in the clearing seemed to chill a few degrees colder than it had been before, and the snow moved and swelled like a white sea turning stormy. Was it that something was descending into the clearing? Had something been watching? Could it be that something was looking for the enchanted sword? Ah, yes, that would have made Bodkin worry. But if that something was a witch, however unlikely that may seem, Bodkin was going to need very advanced bodyguard skills indeed. Witches' feet make no footprint. Witches' bodies make no shadows. But they make the trees, the land, the moss, a little colder as they pass. Curse Song of the Sprites <laughs> That wasn't us, so don't you cuss and don't you dare Cross the sprites and curse their spite and make your hand a stony fist You can't punch us, we don't exist, we're only mist And that was just the wind that hissed We don't care, and we weren't there, and for a dare, we would never snap that chair, and leave it looking like it was perfectly alright, and wait for someone big and fat and old to put their lardy fat behind on it, and smoosh, bang, ha ha ha, stash, the 
the entire thing shatters into tiny smithereens and then they land upon the stony floor and break their jaw and fuss and roar and, and cry until they cry no more. And that was not the eerie sound of fairy laughter when they cried. And if they said it was, they lied. That dying child, that wasn't us. So don't you cuss and don't you dare. Cross the sprites and curse their spite and make your hand a stony fist. You can't punch us. We don't exist. We're only mist. And that was just the wind that hissed. And that was just the wind that hissed. 7. Wizard Encampment the animals flitted through the maze of the dark forest for what seemed like hours to wish. They crossed the frozen river and the broken ghost wall that marked the end of warrior territory and the beginning of the land of the wizards, and eventually they reached a part of the wood that was so tangled and mangled with briars and fallen trees and vines that it was impossible to carry on. The moon came out from the clouds, and Ariel pointed at the barbed mountain of choking vegetation in front of them. In front of Wish and Bodkin's astonished eyes, the brambles and branches slid out and through and over each other, as if invisible fingers were unravelling a complicated knot from a fishing line. With a creak like the bending of ancient knees, the trees swayed and bent to left and right, the vegetation flattened so that a clearing lay in front of them. The hair stood up on the back of Wish and Bodkin's necks, as the quills might rise on a thorny hedgehog when they saw what lay inside the clearing. A truly gigantic circle of ancient trees, most of them giants. Yew, birch, rowan, alder, willow, ash, hawthorn, elder, apple, poplar, every species you could imagine. The most important being the oak, of course. No sign of any human habitation but a sound of music and a smell of chimney smoke. Now that they were so far away from home and so deep in enemy territory, Wish was beginning to feel very, very frightened. What if Tsar held them to ransom? Tsar had said he would let them go the next morning, but Tsar didn't seem very trustworthy. "'Where's your fort?' asked Wish shakily. "'Underground,' said Tsar. Imagine a camp that had been sunk underground. Each one of those gigantic trees was hollow and drew light down into the rooms hidden underneath. Tsar led them to the tree tower which housed his room, a great ancient yew so wound round on itself that it looked as if in the tree's youth a giant had taken it gently by the topmost branches and twisted the trunk round in his hands as if the yew were a piece of clay. They climbed a series of ladders and platforms and in through the window of Tsar's room. Wish's heart sank even further. There was no way out now. They were stuck here, surrounded by enemies. What if Tsar told the other wizards about her? What if there were wizards worse than Tsar who really could magic you into a slow death? She felt a little sick. There was no ceiling in Tsar's room, so above them was the night sky and the stars. The floor had such huge cracks in it that you could see right down into the main hall forty feet below. "'Don't worry,' said Caliburn reassuringly to the astonished Bodkin and Wish, watching Tsar strolling across a floor that seemed to be made partly of air. "'The floor is held together by magic.' Tsar opened his rucksack and took out the spelling book to find the spell about turning people into worms. It was right beside the page that told you how to turn people into cats, easy, and cats back into people— trickier. First, Tsar thought he would punish Luther by turning him into a worm using the witch magic. Then, in a dramatic climax, he would draw the sword and show everyone how he could use magic that works on iron. And then, of course, they would all start clapping and cheering him, chanting his name. His own father would bow down before him, saying, Tsar, I am so sorry I ever doubted you. I always knew you were something special. I know we have had our misunderstandings in the past, but you are the hero we have all been waiting for. 
It was all going to be so satisfactory. Tsar memorised the spell and slammed the book shut. Come on, sprites, said Tsar briskly. The competition is going to start in a couple of minutes and we need to get down there so I can humiliate Luther. Everyone follow me. Except you, Forest Heart, Night Eye, King Cat, the Bear and Squeeze Juice. Oh, why does Eyes have to stay behind? said Squeeze Juice. Well, you seem to like the warriors so much, said Tsar pointedly, for he had been feeling a little jealous. So you can stay here and guard them. Don't you worry, boss. I shall protect them. I didn't say protect them, Squeeze Juice. I said guard them. They're enemy prisoners. But I did once to comes with you and sees you turn into a werewolf, said Squeeze Juice, very disappointed. I'm sure I can see a few more hairs on his arms already, hissed Tiffin Storm, eyes bright with malicious pleasure. Oh, shut up, both of you, snapped Tsar. I'm not going to turn into a werewolf. This is witch blood, and I'm going to use it to perform magic. But you don't know if it will work yet, Caliburn pointed out. And shouldn't you find out what that stain is before you go in front of a whole load of other people and possibly turn into a werewolf in front of their eyes? Tsar looked at him as if he were completely crazy. But that would mean waiting, Tsar pointed out. And the spelling competition is happening right now. Anyway, even if the witch blood doesn't work, I know the sword works. You're not allowed to take swords into spelling competitions, Tsar, let alone iron ones, said Caliburn. And it's our sword, protested Wish. I wish you'd stop saying that. This is a magic sword, said Tsar, so it belongs to me, and all your gloomy, what you give to the universe, the universe will give back to you stuff, Caliburn. Well, all I can say is, by bringing this sword to me, the universe clearly thinks I'm pretty special. And the universe is right, squealed Squeeze Juice. There was no talking to Tsar when he was in this kind of mood. The universe is really tipping it down now, said Caliburn gloomily, as big splatters of rain came down on their shoulders. Downstairs in the main hall, the jubilant sound of dancing giants and happy voices could be heard. Upstairs in the little room, tangled with jungle vines swaying in the wind, rocking like a boat on the sea, a heavy, drenching rain was now falling in Tsar's room. Why on earth would you design a room with no ceiling? wondered Bodkin. It's not very practical. Tiffin storm, said Tsar. Do as a weather spell before we all drown. And you'll have to stay here to keep the spell up so the prisoners don't get wet. Tiffin Storm huffed crossly. Why is it always me who has to do everything? I want you to see the spelling competition. Before sulkily looking in her wand bag and getting out a number four, she picked out a spell and batted it up in the air with the wand, and a nice little invisible umbrella of wind sprang out of the end of the spell, hovering some three or four feet above them, so that the rain poured over the edges in a waterfall. Oh, my goodness, that's incredible, marvelled Wish. Don't be impressed warned Bodkin. Remember, magic may look attractive on the outside, but it is danger, it is chaos. You have to admit it's extremely useful if you don't want to get wet, though, said Tsar. A ceiling works quite well, too, said Bodkin. Tsar slammed the door and locked it. He's taken the sword with him, said Wish, very disappointed. We'll just have to wait till he comes back, and then we can steal the sword off him when he's asleep. Okay. So say we do successfully manage to steal the sword off Tsar, said Bodkin. How do we get back to our fort? We can't walk back, it's miles away. Oh dear, Tsar was right, we're prisoners, said Wish, peering out of the window into the blackness of the night. It was a long way down to the bottom of the tower, and there was absolutely no sign of the giant or the pony. And I'm worried that poor Crusher might have been captured by my mother's warriors. Poor Crusher, he's a giant, Wish! said Bodkin, very shocked. Whose side are you on? With a heavy sigh, Wish turned away from the window and picked up the spelling book that Tsar had carelessly left on the table. Bodkin, you have to see this book. This is unbelievable, said Wish, forgetting her fear and her anxiety and nearly dropping the book in her excitement. We really shouldn't have anything to do with these things, Wish, said Bodkin uneasily. They're magic. We shouldn't be looking. We shouldn't be listening. We shouldn't be holding them. But this book says it has six million pages in it. That's impossible, said Bodkin, peering over her shoulder despite himself, for Bodkin loved books, and a book with six million pages in it was something he had to see. Look, 
said Wish. It says it's a complete guide to absolutely everything you need to know about your magic world. Maps, recipes, magic species, wizards, witches, dwarves, goblins, lynxes, sprites. And then there's a breakdown of all the different types. And then there's a section on lost words. That sounds interesting. Languages, dwarvish, elvish, giantish, doorish. What's doorish? I didn't know door spoke. The book was very confusing to read because lots of the pages were falling out, and when they floated back in again, they were in a different order, and whoever had written it was very disorganised and kept on going off on tangents that might lead somewhere or might be dead ends. And some of the spelling in this book is nearly as bad as mine, said Wish triumphantly. That's not a good thing, Wish, Bodkin pointed out. You know your mother would say there's only one way to spell things, and that is the right way. Anything else is chaos, disorder, anarchy. But Wish wasn't listening. Oh my goodness, look! I'm in this book, said Wish in astonishment, turning to a picture in the giant section. And Crusher! How is that possible? Bodkin squinted over her shoulder. Well, that's just a picture of a girl, isn't it? It doesn't have to be you. The girl has a spoon on her head, Wish pointed out. So she does, sighed Bodkin. I suppose it could be you because this book is magic. Bodkin shivered because it was really quite an eerie thought that a book could be magic enough to write you into it without you knowing. Which is why we really, really should not be reading it. I'm only looking at it to see if it can help us escape. Squeeze Juice and Tiffin Storm and the Snowcats were not doing a very good job of guarding Tsar's prisoners. It had been a long, tiring day, and they had all fallen asleep, so maybe they could escape, thought Bodkin, his heart lifting. Now, how did Tsar make it work? frowned Wish. He tapped on each letter on the contents page, and the pages magically turned to the right place. Bother, my spelling isn't that good. Bodkin, could you help? Bodkin leaned over Wish's shoulder and tapped... How do you escape from a magic tree in a wizard's fort and make your way through the bad woods if you have no rope, no transport and no compass or means of knowing where you are? Into the spelling book. However, all the answers seem to involve some sort of specialist equipment like flying carpets or shoes with wings and a lot of them pointed out all of the dangers of the bad woods in horribly realistic and ghoulish detail such as giant cats and werewolves and mushrooms with teeth and Bodkin didn't particularly want to be reminded of these. The two of them jumped nervously at an unbelievably loud noise coming from below Tsar's locked room, a noise like about twenty thunderclaps going off at the same time, which was the sound of some of the wizards in the main hall below fighting each other. "'Good gracious, what was that?' exclaimed Bodkin. Wish peered down between the cracks in Tsar's walls, and she could see right down into the main hall. The spelling competition was beginning. 8. The Spelling Competition This was a feast of fire, so bonfires leaped high in all corners of the main hall, and a great leaping circle of fire marked out the spelling ring, right in the buzzing centre of the rowdy banquet. The hall was jam-packed with wizards of all ages and sizes, happy, sleepy giants, dancing or snoozing ponderously on the edges of the room, and howling wolves, lumbering bears, snowcats watching carefully in the shadows from the branches above, their tails swinging. Fiddles and horns danced through the air, playing themselves quite independently with no visible musician in sight. In one corner of the room... In Kanzo the Enchanter was deep in political conversation with the other adult wizards. Swiveli, a wizard from a rival tribe, was arguing that the wizards needed to fight back against the warriors just as their ancestors had in the past. The time has come for battle, said Swiveli, and for a new leader, me, to be king, rather than you in Kanzo. The young wizard spelling competition was taking place in another corner, and Luther had been beating everybody until Tsar swaggered in, followed by the bear and the wolves and the sprites zooming overhead, stealing hats and pinching noses and generally showing off. And within two seconds, Ariel had zoomed underneath all the banqueting tables, tying people's shoelaces together so that when they stood up and tried to move off, they fell face forward onto the table, hopefully into something squishy and messy like stew. Time loss turned patches of the floor into ice. 
and all of the other sprites were making nuisances of themselves in an equally naughty manner. "'What are you doing here, Zah? sneered Luther. "'Your magic hasn't come in yet.' "'I'm here to challenge you,' said Zar grandly. "'With what?' grinned Luther. "'Don't tell me you caught your witch, did you, baby brother?' he said lightly. He turned back to his laughing friends and jerked a thumb at Zar. "'This loser thought he was going to catch himself a witch and steal some of its magic. "'Ha, ha, 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 ha!' laughed the young wizards. Zar shrugged carelessly. "'Maybe I did catch that witch, Luther," he said. "'Why don't you try some of your spelling on me and we'll see what happens? "'Or are you afraid?' "'Watch out, Luther," warned Darkish. "'He did catch something. I don't know what it was.' "'Of course you didn't catch a witch,' jeered Luther. "'And you can't do magic, little baby boy. "'I warned you, if you dared to enter this competition, I would annihilate you. "'And I will.' Zar walked into the chalk circle, and as he stepped in, "'there was a short, sharp humming noise, "'and a force field of magic leaped over both himself and Luther "'in a thin, see-through dome, hissing with power. "'Everyone was quiet.' with that quiet where you know something is going to happen. Time loss drew one of his wands, as did Bumbleboozle, but they couldn't help Zar now. He had stepped inside the circle. Zar was on his own. Zar held out his hands towards Luther. Oh, you're going to do magic without a staff, are you, Zar? scoffed Luther, and his friends all laughed loudly at this. Magic without a staff was advanced wizard work, and only great enchanters like Zar's father could do that. "'Be afraid, Luther, be very afraid,' warned Zar, "'for I have not only the magic of the witch, my magic has the power to work on iron!' "'Ha, ha, 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 ha!' jeered all the young wizards. "'Oh, really?' smiled Luther. He was going to enjoy this so much.' That's right, said Zar. I am the boy that destiny has chosen. Confidently, Zar held his hand with the witch stain on it out in front of him. Feel the power, thought Zar. Feel the power. Imagine in your head. Feel the power in your fingers. That was what the teachers always said. But Zar got redder and redder in the face and more and more angry. And it was just like every other time he had tried to do magic and failed. Nothing, nothing happened. Luther had been creeping wearily round the edge of the circle in case that lunatic brother of his really had caught himself some extinct life form. Impossible though that was, you never knew with Tsar. He had a way of making impossible things happen. But now Luther's eyes lit up. "'Oh, dear!' crooned Luther, holding his staff lovingly in his hands. "'Oh, dear! So, boy of destiny, chosen one, where is your scary witch magic now, then?' "'The boy of destiny!' laughed the young wizards outside the circle. "'I don't understand,' said Zar, bewildered and furious. "'I am the boy of destiny! I can do it! I know I can do magic!' "'Botheration!' thought Zar. He had been so sure, what with the witch-killing motto and the sword and everything, that this must all be a sign from fate. But maybe he had been wrong. And if this wasn't witch blood, then what was it? Please, please let me not turn into a werewolf in front of everybody, thought Zar. That would be embarrassing. Not for the first time, Zar wished he had taken Caliburn's advice. He could feel his skin prickling all over, as if hairs were about to sprout out of it any moment. "'You can't do magic,' said Luther. "'But I can. Let me show you how I do it. I wonder what I shall do first. Maybe I'll do this.' He pointed his staff at Tsar. There was a flash of sheet lightning, and the white-hot heat of magic light shot out of it, hitting Tsar full in the chest, so hard that he was thrown up into the edge of the invisible circle of the magic force field. "'Oh, bother!' thought Tsar, dully picking himself up. This isn't going to plan. 
I'm going to turn you green, grinned Luther, shooting blasts of magic at Tsar, who turned brilliantly green as he was shot to the other side of the ring, trying not to scream as the blasts hit him like punches in the stomach, and red, and yellow, and pink. As Tsar was blasted across the spelling ring, turning violently different colours, he felt more and more nauseous, and he struggled not to be sick in front of everyone. Ha, 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 roared the cronies of Luther and the wizard children who Tsar had played tricks on and bossed about in the past. You need to be taught a lesson, smiled Luther, and I am going to teach you a lesson you will never, ever forget. He advanced closer to Tsar, who was now doubled up in pain, groaning. You're small now, said Luther, but I shall make you smaller. He pointed his staff at Tsar and muttered a spell under his breath. S-H-R-I-N-K was the spell. Shrink! Oh, dear, not a shrinking spell, thought Tsar. That's really painful, and I'm already kind of on the small side. I'd better bring out the sword. But he didn't have time before the magic screamed out of the end of Luther's staff and hit the doubled-up Tsar and lit him up at the edges as if he were a Tsar made out of stars. Tsar stifled a howl of pain as those stars set into a vice-like grip, and a pinch that began in his forehead spread across his entire body as the magic tightened and pinched and compressed and crushed him, as though he were wearing a suit of armour that was slowly squeezing shut like the closing of a fist. "'Say I've won!' shouted Luther, backing off to give Tsar a moment to give up the fight. "'Surrender!' Tsar's mouth was squidged out of shape by the shrinking process, but he managed to shout, It came out weirdly squeakily through the shrinking, squirming O oh of his lips. All right, then, said Luther. You'll have to go smaller still. This time, Tsar did let out a yell as the spell hit him in a trembling shriek of pinches and pressure, shrinking his bones down a size smaller than they were. Bother! This wasn't giving him time to draw the beastly sword. Do you give up? said Luther. Of course not! yelled Tsar. Now you have really annoyed me, Luther! Luckily, this made Luther stop doing magic for a second because he was laughing so hard he nearly dropped his staff. Oh, I've really annoyed you, have I? I'm so scared! I'm so scared! So while Luther was busy laughing, Tsar was able to draw the sword. In the nick of time, for if his hands had gone any smaller, he wouldn't have been able to hold it. But he could just about get his palm around the handle and get enough grip to pull it out of his belt. And it was a moment of triumph. Tsar drew the enchanted sword with that satisfying swishing sound that swords make, and as they heard it, the gaze of the onlookers turned from scorn into surprise and horror as they realised what that sword was made of. Iron. Luther took a step backwards. You can't bring an iron sword in here, spluttered Luther. Where did you get that from, you lunatic? I broke into the warrior fort, lied Tsar boastfully, and stole it from right under the warrior's snooty posh little noses. And I can bring it in, because it's a magic witch-killing sword. And, as you will see, my magic, which has come in, can control it and enchant it. Luther shot an anxious bolt of magic at the approaching Tsar, and with one satisfying slice of the sword, Tsar cut it in half before it reached him. Was that another shrinking spell, Luther? jeered Tsar. Better try another one, for I am coming closer. Then the fight began in earnest, with Luther shooting hot, quick magic bolts from his staff, and Tsar intercepting them and breaking them in half, so they fell uselessly to the ground as fast as Luther could direct them towards Tsar. The sword felt as if it was coming alive like a freshly caught salmon in Tsar's hand, and it was anticipating Luther's next move before he made it. Tsar wasn't as light as Wish, so it wasn't quite as clear that it was the sword doing the fighting rather than Tsar himself. He just looked like he had suddenly and miraculously turned into the best sword fighter in the world. The crowd was now pointing in an admiring rather than mocking way as Tsar ran round the spelling ring carving up Luther's spell bolts, shouting, What have you to say about my magic now, Luther? and generally showing off. It's working, thought Tsar joyfully. 
and it was every bit as exciting as he had dreamed it would be. He could hear Heliotrope saying to Leaf Song, "'Wow, fighting with a sword's kind of cooler than with a staff, isn't it?' And Leaf Song replying, "'Do you think Tsar really is the boy of destiny?' "'I'm a star,' thought Tsar exultantly. "'I knew I was a star all along, and now everybody else will know it too.' And then everything went wrong. Suddenly, mysteriously, the enchanted sword began to drag Tsar rather too violently to the left and to the right. What's going on? thought Tsar. One moment it was as if he and the sword were one and the same, and he was in triumphant control of it. The next it felt worryingly as if the sword were trying to escape from him. Tsar was having to hang on to the sword with both hands, until, with a great plunging leap that pulled him three feet up in the air, the sword dragged itself out of his grasp and rocketed up through the dome circle of the magic surrounding them, which caused the entire circle to explode. The force of the explosion sent magic ricocheting around the great hall in huge violent blasts, ripping holes in the ceiling, and fireballs the size of pumpkins flew across the room. The enchanted sword, after exploding out of the magic circle, sailed up into the rafters of the ceiling of the main hall and disappeared in the direction of Tsar's room. When the smoke cleared, Tsar and Luther had been thrown onto their backs and were lying on the floor, choking and coughing. A great crack had opened up beneath Tsar's feet and split right across the floor of the room. "'What is going on here?' The King Enchanter's voice was cold as ice. 9. In Kanzo, the King Enchanter The King Enchanter was a tall man, and magic had made him taller still. It was curiously difficult to look at him, for he always seemed to be very slightly changing shape, blurring in and out at the edges. But underneath the constantly changing outline of his face, where magic came and went like waves on a coastline, he was stern and unbending as a cliff. He was such a very powerful wizard that there was something very scary about him, even when he was just standing there quietly. He had one black fingernail on his right hand, and there was a story of how the fingernail had turned that colour, but no one dared ask the enchanter what the story was. Two very large, very old snow-cats settled themselves on either side of the enchanter, as if they were statues framing a door. Tsar and Luther staggered to their feet like a couple of carbon scarecrows. Tsar, snapped the enchanter, what has happened here? And what are you doing competing in the spelling competition? The cold anger dropped from the enchanter's voice for a second as he asked, Has your magic come in at last? The enchanter's voice was eager, too eager, for it told his son how much the enchanter wanted that magic to come in. It has, said Tsar. It has not, said Luther. Well, Tsar, said the enchanter, sternly, and this time you could hear his disappointment. Has it come in, or has it not? Maybe not, admitted Tsar, sulkily. Then why are you competing in this spell? began the enchanter, but Luther was so cross he rudely interrupted his father. He cheated! He's completely out of control! roared Luther. He went into the bad woods this evening with some mad plan that he was going to catch a witch and use its magic for himself, and then he tried to attack me with his eye... Luther was going to tell the enchanter about the sword... But unfortunately, the enchanter punished him for his rudeness by sewing Luther's lips tight with magic before he got to the end of this sentence. One flick of the enchanter's little finger, and Luther's mouth shot together like he had lockjaw. Ranter, Tsar's tutor of wizardry and advanced spell work, now rushed forward. Ranter was a huge pomposity of a man, with a nose like a dignified lobster and various quivering outraged chins. His air of dignity and calm was disrupted by the fact he was being closely followed not only by some very grand and ancient sprites, but also six small piglets, oinking lovingly up at him. I have tried to speak to you about this on many, many occasions, Enchanter, 
cried Ranta, and you have chosen not to listen. This is only the latest in a long line of disobediences. In the past week, your son has ridden his snowcat up the fort flagpole, removed the flag of the wizard tribe, and replaced it with a pair of your excellency's underpants. He has burned down the west part of the camp. That was an accident, objected Tsar, interrupting. I was just teasing the chimney sprites, and they couldn't take a joke. Besides, he added hurriedly, it wasn't me, and I wasn't there. And with the last complaint, Ranta's voice dropped to a thrilling, furious quiver that made his chins shiver from side to side, banging against one another. And worst of all, he has poured Love Never Lies potion into the pig's feeding trough, and so the pigs are behaving in a most outrageous fashion. Despite his intense annoyance with his younger son, the enchanter's lips twitched with amusement. He looked down at the pigs, gazing up at Ranta adoringly. Ah, yes. I did wonder why you had taken to having pigs as followers, Ranta. Not very dignified for a senior wizard of your standing, I thought. The pigs, spat Ranta, are not my idea. Your son has inflicted them on me, and you should not find this amusing enchanter. Your son's disobedience and lack of magic brings dishonor to our whole tribe. What do you have to say for yourself, Tsar? said the enchanter. You have no evidence, shouted Tsar, furiously punching the air. I am Tsar the Magnificent, and I demand a fair trial. Of course said Incanzo the Magnificent. Could you show me what you have there, Tsar? He pointed to a package that was poking out of one of the pockets hanging round Tsar's waist. Very reluctantly, Tsar took the package out of his pocket, and Incanzo insisted he unwrapped it. The package turned out to be a burned flag of the wizard tribe, tied around a half-full bottle of Love Never Lies potion. Incanzo shook out the flag, Yes, I would call this evidence, wouldn't you? And I pronounce you guilty. I have never seen that flag before in my life, proclaimed Tsar. Unfortunately, Tsar was still holding on to the bottle of Love Never Lies potion, and Love Never Lies potion has two properties. One is that if you eat it or smell it, you fall in love with the next person or animal you see. The other is... Then it turns from red to blue when the person who is holding it tells a lie. Incanzo watched the Love Never Lies potion as slowly the liquid turned from maroon to a sort of smoky indigo. Someone must have put that flag and that Love Never Lies potion into my pocket because they certainly don't belong to me, said Tsar, carrying on lying in a hopeful sort of way. The indigo of the Love Never Lies potion darkened to black at the magnitude of this untruth. The bottle filled with smoke and shook in Tsar's hand. The cork shot off, and Tsar hurriedly recorked it, but not before a fine mist of Love Never Lies potion had drenched the little piglets sitting in a quiet but loving circle at Ranter's feet, and this fresh sprinkling made them jump to their feet again, oinking madly and making ruder and ever ruder noises as they tried to get Ranter's attention. "'Oh!' roared Ranter, batting away at the piglets. "'Get off me! Shoo! You beastly creatures! Shoo!' Only Tsar dared laugh at this entertaining sight because the enchanter had stopped being amused. He was staring down at his younger son with thunderous eyebrows descending down over his fierce hawk eyes. You are not only guilty of everything Ranta and Luta have accused you of, Tsar. You are also a liar and a thief, said the enchanter grimly. Curse his beastly father. Why did he always have to make Tsar feel so small? And now you must give up these silly little tricks of yours and grow up said the enchanter, while all these other things are just stupid and babyish. Trying to obtain a source of bad magic is a serious crime that warriors have been expelled for in the past. And he should be expelled, said Ranta, breaking in with excitement. The last son of Incanzo the Magnificent, King of Wizards, not to have magic at shaming is terrible. What if the magic never comes in? We would be the laughing stock of the woods. Tsar's stomach did an uncomfortable flip. "'You are only saved from expulsion by the sheer stupidity of your idea, Tsar,' said the enchanter, with withering coldness. "'Even a thirteen-year-old should know that witches are extinct, 
and if there really was such a thing as a witch out there, only a madman would try to get within a hundred yards of it. Inkanzu pointed his finger at Tsar. Inkanzu did not need a staff to concentrate his magic. It blasted out with such pure intensity it was not even visible. Tsar's blackened clothes closed around him so tightly that he could barely breathe. There was a writhing snake pattern on the broken dust of the mud floor where Tsar was standing. The patterned snakes on the floor began to move around each other, and then they grew solid and slid up and off the floor and twined their way around Tsar's legs, and his now living clothes carried him up in the air like he was swinging from the branches of a tree, and the hissing snakes turned into liquid mercury that curled around him and solidified and turned into chains, so that he was hanging suspended in the air, twisted round with bones. Let me down! cried Tsar, furious with temper. You have gone into the bad woods against my express instruction, said the enchanter. You sought to take magic from a dark source and bring it into this fault, to cheat your way into winning a spelling competition. I will keep you up there until I decide your punishment. I don't see why I should be punished at all, fumed Tsar, struggling in the chains, his legs kicking wildly in the air. It's not fair. I don't see why you always pick on me. I always pick on you, because it is always you who has done everything replied the enchanter in exasperation. Caliburn spread his wings and whispered in the enchanter's ear. I would suggest patience, said the raven. It's very important that you are patient with children and try and see things from their point of view. I have been very patient with the boy, said the enchanter from between gritted teeth, but I am running out of patience. The boy must learn to obey me, and if he does not, he must be punished. The more strongly you punish him, the more he will rebel, warned Caliburn. Demendor, the ambassador to the court from Drood High Command, stroked his beard and put his finger high in the air. A boy without magic is a sign the gods are most displeased. That's true, said Swivelli, a rival wizard who was always trying to overthrow in Kanzo. This is another story I'll tell you about later. And maybe your failure to punish and control your son effectively is a sign you are not fit to be the ruler of this tribe. Ah, oh, being a father and a king is harder than it looks. And everyone thinks they could do a better job than whoever happens to be the parent or the monarch at the time. Be quiet, the lot of you! cried in Kanzo the king enchanter. When I need your advice, I will ask for it, said the enchanter. Tsar is merely being childishly disobedient and showing off in front of his friends because his magic hasn't come in yet. Tsar lost his temper. Well, at least I'm trying to do something, shouted Tsar. At least I'm trying to act, whereas you, father, you do nothing at all. The hall full of wizards drew in their breaths simultaneously. The outline of the enchanter hummed with fury. Great shooting sparks came off him, and above, the clouds drifting across the high ceiling of the room grew darker and darker, and great rumbling bursts of thunder echoed throughout. Caliburn put his wings over his eyes. Was Tsar actually trying to get himself expelled? Why aren't we going out there to fight the warrior army? shouted Tsar. That was just the point that I was making purred Swivelli, eyes alight with pleasure. Even in Kansas' own son thinks his father is not doing a good job as king. Swivelli broke off, because the enchanter's finger had given a little flick, and the torque around Swivelli's neck tightened inexplicably, and it was quite a while before Swivelli could breathe again. Confronting the warriors would only be a good thing if it was a fight that we could win, said the enchanter, trying to keep his temper. Why do you think we cannot win it? shouted Tsar. Maybe the warriors are wiping us out anyway while we hide here in our slowly shrinking forest, twiddling our thumbs and thumbing our fiddles and doing our poxy little magic spells and love potions while they burn up our forest and kill our giants and destroy our entire way of life. In Kanzo, the king enchanter's eyes blazed. We are hiding from the warriors like cowards, Tsar shouted back. Why are you teaching us to be such cowards, father? Maybe you are a coward. Silence! stormed the enchanter. Or I will make you silent. I will sew your lips tight with magic. Do it then, said Tsar. I do not care. Enough! shouted the enchanter. I have decided your punishment. 
You and your sprites and your animals shall be locked in your room for the next three days. It's not enough, muttered Ranter furiously. Zar looked stricken. No, father, then you should not be disobedient, should you? said his father, the enchanter, in his sternest voice. Now, be silent. I was the one who was disobedient. Don't punish them. Punish me, said Zar furiously. Three days, said the enchanter, even more coldly and white with temper. Every time you speak, I will add on one more day. Zar opened his mouth to speak and shut it again. Four days, said the enchanter. You shall not leave your room for four days, and if you do not listen to me and disobey me, father, I will take your animals and sprites away from you forever. Zar did care about that. Oh, my goodness, he cared about that. He was silent. I am the king here, said the enchanter. All of you in this room need to remember that, and Zar needs a reminder of who we are. His father continued, you have a very fine opinion of yourself, Zar, but the truth is you are conceited. You are willfully disobedient. You are astonishingly selfish. And the fact that you tried to obtain bad magic from a witch shows you do not understand the very basics of what it means to be a wizard. For wizards should seek good magic, Zar. You have one last chance to be good, warned the enchanter. Be good for any more disobedience and I will be forced to expel you and remove all your animals and sprites. You don't care about me, cried Zar at the top of his voice. All you want is a son who is magic. Silence, roared the enchanter. He moved his arms once more, and all around the hall, where columns and pillars and staircases had been shattered into thousands of tiny pieces by the blast of the spelling ring exploding, the tiny dusty fragments lifted up from the floor and danced in the air like clouds of humming bees. The enchanter moved his arms as if he were conducting an invisible orchestra, and the dust responded to his instructions. It is easy to destroy, said the enchanter, but I am not like a warrior impressed by a destruction. It is far harder to create, and creation is what we wizards are all about. Play, fiddles, play! The fiddles shot up into the air and began to play themselves and the millions of tiny fragments billowing through the gigantic hall in enormous drifts like smoke from a forest fire danced in time to the music with such speeding energy that you could feel the heat coming off them and warming up the faces of the wandering wizards looking up in awe. It was a very effective demonstration of the power of the enchanter, for invention was far more difficult magic than demolition, and only he could perform magic as tremendous as this. He was doing it to make a point to his son, and to remind Swivelli and the other wizards gathered there of what wizards should stand for. And it worked. Even Swivelli reluctantly gasped in awe, while cursing under his breath, mind you. Create, Zah! Create, and then you will impress me, finished the enchanter, his arms whirling wildly and gloriously to the tune of the music he had inspired. And in the meantime, you will stay in your room until I tell you to come out. With a final eardrum-bursting clap of thunderous magic that lit up the hall like sheet lightning, the millions of tiny pieces of dust slammed together and formed whole columns once more. The crack in the floor closed, and Zar's clothes and the flying snake chains carried Zar up, up to his room, where the door flew open and the snake chains swung him back and forth and then suddenly released him, depositing him on the floor. The enchanter made a sign to Zar's animals and sprites, and the animals leapt out of the hall and up the stairs, with the sprites following, and Caliburn too, with slow, reluctant wing-beats. The door of Zar's room slammed shut behind them. "'It won't be enough,' sniffed Luther, whose lips had at last come unstuck. "'Ranter was right. You should have expelled him.' The enchanter roared at Luther, unusually, for Luther was normally his favourite son— and when I say roared, I mean he opened up his mouth and a blast of furious magic came out of it with such force that it actually blew Luther off his feet. And then Incanzo stalked off and threw himself into his throne and put his head into his hands, thinking, What is wrong with Zah? 
Why has his magic not come in yet? I have given him the best giant in my land, the finest tree, the most brilliant advisor in Caliburn. But why can't I control him? Ten. Fifteen minutes earlier, in Zar's room. Now the room Zar returned to was in a very different state than when he had left it only fifteen minutes earlier. Bad things had been happening in Zar's room. These bad things had been happening to Wish and to Bodkin, the sprites and the animals who had all been locked in that room by Zar, if you remember. Very, very bad things. In order to explain them, I will have to go back in time, exactly fifteen minutes. Of course, in real life, turning back time is impossible. I think I've already mentioned that. But contrarywise, I can do it, for I am the god of this story, and thus have rather more magic than perhaps is quite good for me. Imagine Zar's room fifteen minutes earlier. The spelling competition is going on down below, and Wish and Bodkin are watching it through the floor. You are in that very fifteen minutes, and even now, very now, through the drenching rain and wildness, something is creeping up the fort walls with invisible, undetectable footsteps. Something old and dark and very, very evil. It could be a roger breath, looking to get its blood back. It could be a werewolf wanting Zar to join its pack, or it could be something else. Normally, Wizard Fort would be entirely protected by an invisible barrier of magic that hung around the forest grove, but when Zar had taken the sword into the fort, the iron had tunnelled a hole in the magic. The path of the iron sword led up the tree trunk and into Zar's room, and such is the power of iron that any one or any thing taking the path the iron had taken would be undetected by the magic. Too bad. Because the two feathers in the jacket Zar had left in his room were very gently, very minutely beginning to glow at the edges with a sickly greenish light. The snowcats and Squeezejuice and Tiffinstorm and the bear had fallen into the deep sleep of those who have spent a nice old-fashioned day out in the fresh air, building witch traps and running through bad woods. But something in the change in atmosphere made Bodkin and Wish look up from where they were kneeling on the invisible floor of Zar's room, and stare around themselves with shivers of sick alarm. The enchanted spoon was shaking with anxiety on Wish's head. Below them, they could hear the sound of the spelling competition. But outside in the forest, the rain, the thunder, and the lightning, and the wind that had been sending Zar's bedroom plunging this way and that as if a lunatic were rocking a baby's cradle. Stopped with surprising suddenness. The thunder ceased to be replaced by an eerie quietness, a silence as if the forest world surrounding them were leaning in to gaze at something unusual and frightening enclosed within its shut green fist. The only sound was the water dripping from the edges of the invisible spell above them. Drip, drip, drip. Wish could see right through the spell up into the starry, starry sky above, the branches of the trees strangely still, as if painted against the dark sky. There was a coldness in the air that Wish had felt when they were being chased in the wood earlier that evening, a coldness that seeped into her. And to her horror, Wish could see the black feathers hanging inside Zar's empty jacket were lighting up. With a queasy, pallid, yellow-green glow that pulsed steadily in and out, as if in time with someone breathing. Wish's breath was so thick in her throat she thought she might choke. It was as if ants were crawling through her hair, sending each individual shaft shooting upwards in a thrill of horror. Above them both, the spell was like a piece of glass, with the liquid of the rain already streaked across it. But was that something else, some shadow moving like a dream beyond the glass, a nauseating, undulating, greasy movement that blotted out the stars as it moved, or was it just the bilious shadow of Wish's own imagination, the tired creation of her bloodshot eyes after a long and weary and frightening day? Wish was sure there was a dark shape moving glutinously behind the glass. At least, 
she thought she was sure. What was it that they said about witches? That they were as invisible as ghosts, but they had to turn visible when they attacked, or else their hands passed through you as harmlessly as air? And then, with absolute terror, she knew it was no mirage. Her painfully stretched ears definitely heard whispering in the invisibility above. Drip, 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 drip. Whisper, whisper, whisper. Stiere, stiere. Witches speak the same language as we do, but each individual word is back to front. Stiera means it's here. Wake up! croaked Wish to the snow cats and squeezed you and Tiffin Storm in a strangled whisper. Wake up now! We have to get out of here! The wind began to blow again, a couple of breaths that brought the hot, rank smell of witch down into the room, a pungent whiff of poisoned rat and adder's tongue, as chock full of death as a dose from an apothecary. The snow cats lying half smothered in leaves woke to that smell. As one, they opened up their sleepy eyes, and all of them knew instantly they needed to be silent, like deers that scent a fox. Tiffin Storm opened her eyes, one, two, saw the glowing, pulsing feathers, and turned as still as if stuffed. Bodkin tried the door, but Tsar had locked it, of course. We're locked in, said Bodkin, in appalled horror. We can't get out of here, before fainting dead away with his fingers on the handle of the door. Bodkin, shrieked Wish, wake up now. Bodkin woke up with a start, mumbling, where, what, how? Tsar's room, panted the princess. Wizard Fort, we're being attacked by something really spooky. What is it? whispered Tiffin Storm, staring upward and getting a good grip of her thorn of a wand. The sword! Oh, by the gods of the still and standing waters, we need the enchanted sword! yelled Wish. Now, you see, there are no accidents. There was a reason that the enchanted sword left Tsar's hand at that precise, very inconvenient moment for Tsar down below in the spelling competition. Let's face it, Wish needed the sword at that moment for rather more serious reasons than Tsar did. With a great piercing, ripping slice that made Wish jump out of her skin and nearly die from the shock of it, and woke up Bodkin from his faint, for he was still hanging on to the handle of the door, the enchanted sword sliced up through the ceiling of the main hall of the spelling competition and through the spell of Tsar's floor. The sword rose up, quivering, hanging in the air in the middle of Tsar's room, pointing up at the glassy surface of the spell above, exactly an arm's length away from Wish. All she had to do was reach out and take it. Oh, thank mistletoe and ivy and every single kind of standing water. Once there were witches, breathed Wish, reading the message on the blade. But I killed them. She reached out her hand. She took the sword. There was a high, piercing, unearthly shriek from the air above her as whatever it was dived. The undulating shape turned dark and very, very solid. There was a confused rush. Something of unbelievable force smashed into the invisible spell above. There was another shriek like a curse, and through the glass above Wish, three talons pierced through the spell. Three great shocks of talons that were very, very real, long and yellow-green, razor-sharp, and carved like swords. Wish screamed. If it were not for that spell, she would have been dead indeed, for whatever it was had been held up by the spell and crashed into it when it dived. Zigzagging lines jigsawed across the spell like ice before it shatters. Wish thrust the sword upwards, and that extraordinary sword leaped in her hands and dragged her with it upwards, and there was another shriek as the iron of the sword sank through the spell into something soft, and whatever it was, the huge dark shadow above her shrieked again and was still. Wish hauled out the sword, and it came out with a sickening, squelching noise. Please, begged Wish, please let it be dead. There was silence for a moment. Perhaps that thing, whatever it was, really was dead. She had sunk the sword into it pretty deep. 
All around the snowcats were roaring and Bodkin was repeating, Oh, my goodness, my goodness, my goodness, in a horrified way. Wish could see the dull, dark shape slumped on the spell above them. It wasn't moving. I've killed it, thought Wish, with terrible sadness. I've really killed it. Tiffinstorm gazed at the sword, her mouth open in horror. Don't touch the sword, whispered the sprite. The end of the sword was covered in a strange milky green substance, and it appeared to be smoking. A single drop quivered on the end, and, as if in slow motion, it fell, down towards Wish's hand. But Squeeze Juice rushed forward, squeaking, Be careful! Wish, be careful! And in his determination to guard the princess, he threw himself in between the drop of falling green and Wish's hand, and he let out a shriek as the green sizzled there, and the poor sprite shook his own hand to shake off the smoking green blood. Squeeze Juice leaped up in the air, screaming and waving his hand in horror. Wish tried to catch him to soothe him to calm him down, with Tiffin Storm shrieking, Don't touch! Don't touch! in a demented chalk screech. More cracked lines appeared all over the surface of the spell above them, like lines on a frozen lake the moment before it breaks. Get away from the bed, yelled Wish, and the snow cats and the sprites flung themselves to the edge of the room in the nick of time. For a moment later, the cracked, broken spell burst, sending bits of spell raining around the room, and the cold rainwater that had been lying on it came splashing down onto the bed in a bucketing, icy rush, and the dark shape crashed down too and took the bed down with it, down, 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 burning a bright green hole in that floor, and sinking downwards, ever downwards, so that Tsar's room had a great hole in the centre of it, like a sinkhole, a sinkhole seven feet deep, with the corpse of a witch at the bottom of it. "'I think it's dead,' whispered Wish, shakily peering over the edge of the sinkhole, it's not moving anyway. Are you all right, Squeeze Juice? It's not fine, whispered Squeeze Juice, shaking his hand. It's not fine. That is bad magic. Very bad magic. Even as he spoke, the green crept up his arm to his heart and his head, turning him stiff as a tree twig, and he dropped, shaking and trembling like a stone, and fell down rigid to the floor. It is as I said. Bad things have been happening in Zar's room. Very, very bad things. And a lot can happen in fifteen minutes. Eleven. Zar gets more than he wished for. Zar did not immediately notice anything different about his room when the enchanter's magic broke open the locked door and the flying chain slung him in there, with Caliburn flapping in just before the door was magically slammed behind them both. Why would Zar think there would be anything different? He had only left that very same room about fifteen minutes earlier. Anyway, he was too busy swearing loud and long and extremely creative curses at the shut door and kicking it with his foot to notice the strangely quiet, tense and, quite frankly, shell-shocked atmosphere in the wrecked room behind him. Um, Zah, said Caliburn, I think we may have a problem. I know we have a problem, howled Zah. My father and my brother don't realise how important I am. Nobody realises. Now, I'm in a real problem, Zah. Zah turned round. His jaw dropped open. Wish was standing, stricken, holding on to the enchanted sword. You took my sword, spat Tsar savagely. It's all your fault, you beastly burglar of a warrior. I was beating Luta and then you interrupted. How did you do it, you treacherous daughter of Queen Sycorax? Tsar made a grab for the sword and the sprite screeched simultaneously. Don't, Don't touch, touch the, the sword! sword! And that was when Tsar realised that things had gone even more wrong than he thought. His room was always messy, of course, but now, right in the centre where the bed once was, there was an enormous hole seven foot deep instead. Wish and Bodkin were standing sadly on either side of it. "'What have you done to my room?' gasped Tsar. "'Oh, my goodness, I only left it for fifteen minutes. What have you done to my room?' Bodkin pointed down the hole. "'A witch attacked us. We killed it.' 
Oh, by ivy and mistletoe and green things with long hairy whiskers, goggles are. Are you quite sure it was a witch? It wasn't just a rogue of breath coming to get its blood back? Take a look, said Bodkin. Tsar peered down into the hole, and there, at the bottom, was something huge and dark and dead, with long feathered wings for arms and a nose like a beak, and even though it was not moving, a reek of dark magic came off that crumpled feathered thing so strongly that it made Tsar reel back. Yup. He'd never seen a witch before, but that was a witch, all right. Oh, by the nostril hairs of the grim, grisly Gruntlogar. What had his father just said about obtaining magic from a dark source? The reality of a situation is sometimes a little different from the imagining of it, and the recent scene with his father had made him realise that perhaps Incanzo wasn't going to be as open-minded about witches and dark magic as Tsar had thought he would be. And what was that threat about taking all Tsar's beloved animals and sprites away from him? Be good, said Tsar through white lips. My father just said be good. I don't think this really counts as being good, do you? He gazed down at the hole in a sort of trance. I mean, a big hole the size of a beastly great dolman right in the middle of my room with a witch in it. Tsar waved his arms around in agitation. How are we going to get rid of it? We have to get it out of here. My father said one more disobedient thing and he was going to expel me. I think this counts as about fifty disobedient things, don't you? You can't touch it, screamed Tiffinstorm and Ariel. Don't go near it. How can we get rid of something we can't even touch, said Tsar. We'll have to cover it, but with what? Tsar started rather desperately kicking leaves down the hole, but it was like trying to cover a volcano with individual snowflakes. And that isn't the worst of it, said Wish, swallowing hard. Carefully, Wish laid down the sword and opened a piece of cloth she was holding in the other hand. Inside lay squeeze juice, shaking like he had the plague. OK. Just when Tsar thought that things couldn't get worse, they got worse. What on earth happened to squeeze juice? gasped Tsar. He got witch blood on him, said Wish, sorrowfully. I'm so sorry, Tsar. Is that bad? What does that mean? What's wrong with him? Squeeze Juice had turned jade green in colour, and his wings had folded up like they'd been crushed in an invisible fist. Every now and then the trembling would cease, and he turned absolutely rigid for a second, as if he had been frozen, before breaking out into violent shaking once more. I's guarded the princess, said Squeeze Juice, but I's fine. I's just fine. But you could see from Squeeze Juice's scared eyes that he was terribly frightened about what was happening. Caliburn said sadly, Sprites are much smaller creatures than you are, Zah. The witch blood will affect them much harder. You have led this sprite into bad, bad trouble. I will take this sprite to my father, said Zah, through numb white lips. My father can do anything. Caliburn said gently, I think even your father will not be able to heal Squeeze Juice, sir. It was time for some very hard truths. For very soon this sprite will either die or fall into a coma, said Caliburn. And when he wakes, he will have turned to the dark side. He will become a creature of the dark, and it will seek out witches to be his master. A horrible silence. And this means that the stain on your hand really is witch blood said Caliburn. I am so sorry, Zah. I tried to warn you. You wish to be magic, and now you have the wrong kind of magic. Zah turned over his hand. There, right in the middle of the palm, was the bright green stain. There was no way of covering it, any more than he could cover the great big hole with the witch in it in the middle of the room. He tried to wipe it off on his cloak, but it did not move. I can't even make the witch blood perform magic, said Tsar, sadly. If your father finds out that is witch blood on your hand, said Caliburn, he will send you to a correctional facility, and maybe the dark magic will not yet have reached your brain, and you can be saved from turning to the dark side yourself. But your father would then be forced to expel you from the wizards forever. No, cried Tsar, no. What would you have your father do, Tsar, said Caliburn. 
The other wizards were calling for you to be expelled just for trying to get dark magic. But you have succeeded, Tsar. You have been in the bad woods, and that is forbidden. You have brought iron into the camp, and that is forbidden. You are using dark magic, and that is forbidden. You have drawn a witch to us, and that is forbidden. No, yelled Tsar. Even your father cannot turn back time, Tsar, said Caliburn. Nobody can turn back time. That is impossible. That's the point of magic, isn't it? said Tsar. To do impossible things. There was a long silence. There are some things that are done that cannot be undone, said Caliburn. Ah, do as you would be done by, or you will be well and truly done, is a harsh law indeed. You stupid warriors, raged Tsar. This is all your fault. This is your stupid sword and your stupid witch, and I should never have left Squeeze Juice with you when you can't look after him. Wish and Bodkin looked away, for Tsar, the boy who never cried, was crying. Tsar knew in his heart of hearts he couldn't really blame Wish and Bodkin for this. He felt a sludgy, depressed weight of guilt. This was all his own fault. Squeeze Juice had trusted him. If he couldn't save Squeeze Juice, he would never forgive himself. I'm so sorry, Squeeze Juice, said Tsar, wretchedly. I never meant for this to happen. There must be some way I can make amends and put things back to the way they were. I trust you, master, said Squeeze Juice, through shaking green lips, looking up at Tsar adoringly. You is my leader, and so you will rescue me, because that is what a leader does. Tsar carefully put Squeeze Juice in the front pocket of his waistcoat, and then Tsar put his arm in front of his face. I wish I had never wished to be magic, said Tsar passionately. I wish I could give it all up so that Squeeze Juice could be fine again. I wish I had never set that stupid witch trap in the first place. I wish, I wish, I wish! But wish how he may, Tsar could not turn back time. They had all wanted Tsar to learn a lesson, but this was a far, far worse lesson than anyone had ever dreamed of, and it was dreadful to see him crying and sitting there so small and silent and sad and unzar like Even his quiff of hair had drooped. Tsar cried, and Wish patted him on the back sympathetically, and the animals and the sprites pretended they hadn't noticed he was crying. Every now and then, Tsar blurted out fiercely, I am not crying, and I will kill anyone who says I am! And the sprites pretended to be terrified of him to make him feel better. Down in the hall below them, the sound of music stopped abruptly to be replaced by voices. Tsar removed his arm from in front of his face, suddenly alert. Listen, whispered Tiffinstorm. Someone must have noticed the break in the magic covering the fort. They will be telling the King Enchanter. The three children looked at each other, at the green dying sprite, at the sinkhole in the centre of the room with the corpse of a witch in it. They will know it is something to do with you, Tsar. They will come up here, into this room. This was bad. There was no doubt about it. This was really, really bad. Wish looked at Tsar's face, transformed from its usual cheekiness into total misery and guilt at the plight of his sprite. She forgot Tsar was an enemy and had stolen her sword and kidnapped them. She put out her hand and touched Tsar on the shoulder. "'Don't despair, Tsar,' said Wish. "'It's not too late. It's never too late. I have a plan for how we could save Squeeze Juice.' Bodkin felt the first stirrings of unease. "'Yes,' said Tsar, lifting his drooping head. "'Do you remember I told you earlier on my mother has this stone that takes away magic that she keeps in her dungeons?' said Wish. We could take you back with us to Warrior Fort, and then we can break into my mother's dungeons and get Squeeze Juice to touch the stone, and that will take away the bad magic of the witch and save his life, said Wish. Could that work? said Tsar, eagerly turning to Caliburn. Yes, no, I don't know, said Caliburn. I suppose in theory that is what the stone does, it takes away magic. But something tells me this is an extremely bad idea. Well, generally, it would be a bad idea to touch a stone that takes away magic, said Tsar, with growing excitement. But in this case, we have a whole lot of magic that we want to get rid of, don't we? 
because at the same time, I can touch the stone and get rid of this witch blood on my hand, which my father wouldn't like and doesn't even work. I also wonder what happened to Crusher, said Wish, thoughtfully. He hasn't got back yet, has he? I'm a bit concerned that my mother's warriors might have captured him. Do you think so? said Tsar, suddenly worried, for in his Tsar-like fashion he had completely forgotten about Crusher. Do you mean to say I may have put Crusher in danger as well? Wow! Even for me, this has been a really bad day. The Tsar was looking crestfallen again, so Wish hurriedly pointed out that while they were in Sycorax's dungeons, if Crusher was in there too, they could release him. That's a brilliant plan, and it solves everything all in one go, said Tsar in relief. For an enemy and a weird one at that, you've come up with a great idea. What are we waiting for? Let's go. Hang on a second, boggled Bodkin. This isn't brilliant at all, princess. I am putting my foot down. You can't take this lunatic back to Warrior Fort with us. I have to agree with Bodkin, said Caliburn. And if Queen Sycorax catches Tsar, she'll put him in her dungeons forever, not to mention take away the magic of all his other sprites. My mother's not as bad as all that, objected Wish. She's lovely. Well, I wouldn't say lovely exactly, said Bodkin, gloomily. Scary, that's what she is. Scary, she is one scary mother. She's a queen and a mother, and it's a mother's job to be scary, said Wish. Well, she's very successful at her job, shivered Bodkin. But we've got to go into the dungeons anyway to return my mother's sword, and we can't let poor Squeeze Juice die, can we, said Wish. This is sort of our fault too, and he's flown by our side. Look at him. Tsar sensed Bodkin weakening as he looked at the tragically rigid body of the little hairy fairy tucked into the front of Tsar's waistcoat, shivering in pain and fear. Poor Squeeze Juice, sighed Tsar. He will be so unhappy trapped in a coma. He loved to dance, you know, to fly through the windy trees in autumn. And now his feet will be locked, his voice that sang to nightingales choked in his stony throat. Stop it, said Bodkin, putting his hands over his ears. And even Tsar, said Wish, he's conceited and full of himself and kind of annoying. I am, aren't I, said Tsar proudly. But we can't let him get expelled from his tribe. Tsar made a few mistakes. But doesn't he deserve a second chance? We all deserve a second chance, pleaded Wish. Bodkin sighed. All right, he said. It's a mad idea, but all right, we'll help them. But you have to promise me, Wish, after all this is over, you really will start being a normal, ordinary warrior princess. I promise, said Wish. The three of them shook hands on the plan. Who'd have thought it, marvelled Tsar. Wizards and warriors working together. The sound of voices and running feet was getting nearer and nearer. Okay said Tsar, briskly. Wolves, bear, you stay here. Caliburn, Snowcat, Sprites, you're coming with us. But we're going to need to be quick here, so we'll have to go by door. Tiffinstorm, do the spell. Why is it always me who has to do everything? grumbled Tiffinstorm, getting out a number six from her wand bag and lobbing one of her spells at the door of Tsar's room. What do you mean, go by door? asked Bodkin uneasily. As if in answer to his question, with a mighty creak, the door of Tsar's room shrugged in its frame and tore itself out of its hinges and waddled into the centre of the room before tipping, slam flat on its face onto the floor and then gently rising about a foot in the air in a cloud of dust. Tsar climbed on top of it, shouting, Come on, you guys, quick, quick! Oh, no, said Bodkin, shaking his head hysterically. The snow cats were bad enough, but are you really expecting me to ride on a door like a flying carpet in a story? It's perfectly safe, said Tsar, helping Wish up beside him. Kind of, and the snow cats can run a lot faster when we're not on their backs. Hurry! Come on, Bodkin, said Wish excitedly. The snow cats had already jumped out of Tsar's window and climbed down the ladders and platforms, so it was too late to travel by snow cat. Even the enchanted spoon had hopped on enthusiastically next to Tsar and Wish and seemed to be looking at Bodkin expectantly, as if he had faith that Bodkin could be the kind of person who would see flying on the back of a door as an exciting opportunity rather than an act of suicide. Oh, dear, I have to do this. I can't be less of a hero than a spoon. But what am I doing? thought Bodkin as he clambered onto the back of the door beside Wish and Tsar. It wasn't even an entirely complete door, for the door of Tsar's room had led a difficult life, so there were great cracks and splits all across it. 
Held together by magic. Held together by magic, Bodkin repeated to himself reassuringly, as Tsar jerked the key in the keyhole frantically to the right, and Bodkin grabbed onto the top of the door only just in time, as, with a sickening lurch, it flew off, up through the non-existent ceiling, and into the night. For the first five minutes, Bodkin was so terrified he didn't even open his eyes. He just concentrated on not falling off and not fainting and not throwing up because of the wild swooping motion of the flying door. And when he did eventually open his eyes, he regretted it. They were slaloming madly through the trees of the forest, and through the crazy paving of the cracks in the door, below him he could see the running snowcats and the bright little blinks of the flying sprites. Bodkin let out a moan of fear. Wish's eyes were like stars. She was enjoying it so much. She and Tsar were whooping with every swoop. It had to be said, Tsar was an excellent, if reckless, flying door driver. The door swayed and soared like a peregrine falcon, with Tsar swivelling the key in the keyhole with exactly the right smoothness and dexterity to slalom its way neatly through the forest. "'We're going to crash! We're going to crash!' moaned Bodkin. "'We're not going to crash!' said Wish exultantly as they swooped through the upper canopy. "'We're flying like birds! And we're going to get back before morning, and we're going to cure Squeeze Juice and free Crusher and get rid of Zara's bad magic! We're going to crash, and if your scary mother catches us breaking into her scary dungeons, we'll be in such trouble it doesn't bear thinking about!' chattered Bodkin through white lips. "'Don't think about it, then!' advised Wish. Maybe she won't catch us, Bodkin, and we haven't crashed yet, have we? Just relax and enjoy it. It's not every day you get to fly somewhere by door. Just go with it. And as they soared gloriously and recklessly through the trees on the back of the broken flying door, the night wind blowing their hair back, Bodkin found, to his astonishment, that if he let himself relax and go with the motion of the door, he could whoop with joy along with the others. Bodkin's father would have been amazed, and not very pleased if he could have seen him now. This is the problem with adventures. They bring out parts of you that you never even knew were there. The feathers fly on, and we have to follow. I told you that these woods were dangerous. Part 2 Making Amends 12. Iron Warrior Fort Tsar and the Sprites and the Snowcats and Wish and Bodkin were lying in the undergrowth in front of Iron Warrior Fort. They had a problem. Breaking out of a heavily armed warrior fort with seven ditches and thirteen watchtowers is hard enough, but breaking in is virtually impossible. And it is made even harder if you are accompanied by a wizard with a witch stain and a band of snowcats and sprites. They could see the sentries on the battlements, pacing nervously up, down, up, down, constantly straining to see what was out there in the forest. They had abandoned the door in the cover of the forest, for a flying door is rather conspicuous, and then Wish led them round to the stable entrance, which was where she had sneaked out in the first place. The doors there were always opening and closing, with hunting parties going out and returning. Tsar got the sprites to cover them with weather spells and invisibility spells, so that they could sneak up on the entrance without being seen. This will only work until we get inside the fort. Tiffinstorm's magic will not work in there, warned Tiffinstorm. There is too much iron. Stop worrying, everyone, said Tsar confidently. I've broken into more forts than you've had hot dinners. It took a while for the little party of snowcats, sprites, Tsar, Bodkin and Wish to manoeuvre themselves into position underneath the drawbridge. And then the plan worked beautifully, at first. Tsar and Wish and Bodkin and the snowcats stole invisibly into the fort under the cloak of Ariel and Tiffinstorm's spells. It wasn't until they were a good way into the stable yard that it was clear that the spells were being affected by the sheer amount of iron surrounding them. To Tsar's horror, he could see his feet below him slowly becoming visible. Wish and Bodkin were even more obviously there already, although Bodkin was materialising the other way round, and for a second he was just a ghoulishly floating torso. 
But if they could just make it to the next building, thought Zara in a panic, maybe they could hide in the shadows there. Run! He whispered. Run! Too late. A sentry had turned to see the bottom half of a gradually becoming visible snowcat bounding across Queen Sycorax's stable yard. Magic! Roared the sentry. They were discovered. Wish had to make up an entirely new plan right there on the spot. Help! Cried Wish, who was now entirely visible. Help! 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 Over here! Wizard attack! The wizard guards turned. And there was Sycorax's weird little daughter pointing at a wizard with three furious snowcats and a cloud of buzzing sprites. Wizard attack! cried the guards. Sound the alarm! The wizards don't often attack the warriors for obvious reasons, but warriors, nonetheless, are always ready for any kind of attack. Ready in a manner that you could almost call overkill. From all over came the thunderous sound of clattering armour and the clanking of swords and the stamping of iron-clad feet as the soldiers of Queen Sycorax leaped into action. The attack is in the third quarter! Back up is needed! roared the guards who had already surrounded them, swords, spears, pikes at the ready. Call out the sprite catchers! Ready the snowcat trappers! Alert the magic police! The shouting grew louder, and the household defender warriors poured from all directions into the stable yard. Oh, by the goggle eyes of the green-bearded, green-toothed goblin, thought Tsar, there's masses of them. I never thought there could be so many warriors in the world. King Cat, Night Eye, don't you dare move, spat Tsar, for he knew that the snowcats were longing to launch themselves at the enemy, and he could see from the look in the warriors' eyes that if the snowcats even made one bound in their direction... They would kill them instantly. Tsar put his hand to his belt to take out the enchanted sword. But the sword was not there. He looked up. Wish was ten yards away from him now, and she had been swooped up in the arms of an enormous warrior. The princess has been secured and made safe, roared the warrior, and one look into Wish's guilty eyes told Tsar everything he needed to know. Tsar was furious. Treachery! Betrayal! Wish had nicked that sword off him. He had fallen into the trap of trusting an enemy, and just when he had relaxed and let his guard down, thinking Wish was on his side, she had the sheer cheek to steal it off him when he wasn't looking. Tsar conveniently forgot, of course, that he himself had done exactly the same thing only a couple of hours earlier. Wizards are very good at cursing. It was a habit that they had caught from the druids who used it as a way of attacking the enemy. So Tsar cursed now, and he cursed loud and long. You treacherous, shrimpy burglar of a warrior, yelled Tsar. My father was right about you guys. You're traitors and liars, and you, Wish, are as wicked as your repellent, magic-hating murderer of a she-devil mother. He insulted the queen, and he's going for his weapon cried the chief guard. Archers, eliminate him! The archers at the back of the warrior ranks raised their bows all in time with each other with exquisite precision. They were so well trained it would have been a pleasure to admire their timing if they were not just about to kill you. No! shouted Wish from the arms of the warrior who was carrying her. He's not armed! Don't you dare kill any of them or I will tell my mother! Now, the warriors were not above killing an unarmed wizard. In fact, they did it quite a lot when Sycorax wasn't looking. But they were, to a man and a woman, absolutely petrified of their queen. So reluctantly, the archer's arms wavered in a disappointed sort of way, but they did not let go of their arrows. They lowered their bows. Secure the targets, shouted the chief guard. Contain the rebellion. Launch the sprite catchers. And when you've done that... The chief guard sighed and swallowed hard. Somebody had better go and inform Her Majesty. The chief guard's deputy stepped forward. Eh, do we have to? Of course we have to, barked the chief guard. In fact, since you've had the cheek to question my orders, I nominate you as the lucky person to go and tell her. The sprite catcher warriors fired bows that launched nets with little iron weights attached to them into the air towards the sprites. Out in the open air of the forest, the sprites could fly fleet as arrows, dodging and fainting with such quicksilver swiftness that they were just a blur of energy and light. But here, the iron surrounding them acted like a drug on their flying skills. 
They bumbled about, slow and confused, shrieking madly, poor little things, as they scrambled away, trying to get far from the scary iron, but instead plummeting to the ground, caught in the nets and gasping and straining for breath like stranded fish. All of them were caught, apart from the tiny hairy fairy Bumbleboozle, who had crept into Wish's pocket as soon as disaster struck. The guards leaped forward, and Tsar was bound with chains so tightly that only his head was poking out. The snowcats were chained up too, and the wolves. "'Turnips in tin cans!' roared Tsar, bright red with anger. And that was how Sycorax saw him, when she first swept into the stable yard a little time later, to find a bundle of chains with a wizard boy's head poking out of it, screaming insults at her troops. Thirteen. The Questioning of Queens At the entrance of Queen Sycorax, the warriors bowed so low their foreheads nearly hit the floor. Sycorax was scary. But then she was a very great queen, and as Wish said, maybe great queens have to be scary. There were those who said that a woman was too weak to rule a tribe of invading iron warriors— but they said it very, very quietly, just in case Queen Sycorax should hear them. She was lovely, all right, if by lovely you mean pretty. Hair like a golden waterfall, slim as a candle, six feet tall and most of it muscle, all of sort of stuff that comes in handy if you're going to be a warrior queen and you like to make an entrance. Whether her character was lovely, well, that's an entirely different question, and we'll have to see about that. She was dressed in white, with a single black pearl hanging from one ear. Queen Sycorax talked very, very softly, in a golden pear drop of a voice that was as mild as the bite of an adder. She did not have to speak loudly, that lovely Queen Sycorax, for everyone leaned in to listen, and you could hear a pin drop in the terrified silence that followed her around like a sweeping cloak. Even Tsar stopped his cursing for a moment. So said Queen Sycorax in that quiet, gentle voice, as sweetly pure as the stab of an icicle. Where is this wizard attack that has so rudely awoken me before daybreak? Petrified, the chief guard stepped forward and indicated Tsar, the sprites and the snowcats, with a sweep of his armoured hand. We have contained the attack, your majesty, said the chief guard. Yes said Queen Sycorax, surveying the wizard attack. It's not a very large attack, is it, to warrant waking a queen so early in the morning? I thought I was supposed to have the finest warrior sentries in the warrior world, and yet one small wizard boy can still enter my fort undetected. Step forward, the sentries who let the wizard attack happen, roared the chief guard. The sentries stepped forward smartly. The sentries on watch should be locked in Dungeon 308, and as the officer in charge at the time, Chief Guard, I hold you responsible, so you can lock yourself in too and post the keys back through the bars, said Queen Sycorax. I have no need for failures in this fort. Yes, Her Majesty, bowed the Chief Guard, and he and the sentries marched off to lock themselves in Dungeon 308. Who captured the wizard and his magic companions in the first place? Your daughter, said another guard, indicating Wish. Queen Sycorax raised an eyebrow. Really? said Queen Sycorax in surprise. How unusually warrior-like of her. Next she said, Unchain the prisoner. But your majesty, is that wise? said the deputy to the chief guard. He is a wizard, after all. Queen Sycorax gave him a look. The deputy undid Tsar's chains. The warriors and the citizens of the fort who had arrived on the scene took a step back, for wizards were known to be extremely dangerous. Queen Sycorax glided round Tsar, looking him over as if he were an unusual type of insect that she was seeing for the first time. Who are you, and what are you doing in my fort? I am Tsar, son of Incanzo, the great king enchanter said Tsar proudly, and the wild woods belong to us wizards, not you stupid, magicless, heartless invaders. Queen Sycorax sighed. The ignorance of these poor wizards, she said. 
We are civilization. We are progress. Look at us. Look at our weapons, our clothes, our tapestries, our furniture. You wizards, in comparison, are barely better than animals. The fort was, indeed, very dazzlingly decked out, and Queen Sycorax had a thing about tidiness, so every piece of armour and sword was polished until it shone like silver. Even the giant heads hanging in the main hall, dead as doornails though they were, had their beards brushed daily. So the whole effect was pretty spectacular, and Tsar was secretly rather impressed by the sophistication of warrior weaponry and the splendidness of their clothes and fort. So this stopped him a moment. Caliburn said warningly, Warrior stuff is dangerous. It seduces you. Then why do you need these warrior knick-knacks? hissed Ariel. When you have the moon to dance under and a violin to sing the tune, are they worth your freedom, your wandering spirits? That's right, shouted Tsar. You warriors have come here and stolen our forest, and one day when I grow up to be the leader of my tribe, I promise I am going to kill the lot of you. Queen Sycorax looked at him intently. Well, you know, she said. Well, this is interesting. I could make sure that you never grow up, couldn't I? Or Encanzo might be willing to pay to have his son returned. Or we could hold on to you in exchange for his good conduct. Tsar looked the Queen straight in the eye. The thing about Tsar was, he didn't scare easily. You, Queen Sycorax, are the softest, pitiless warrior queen I have ever seen, said Tsar. Sycorax flinched. The entire courtyard took an intake of breath. Queen Sycorax's eyes sharpened to splinters. What did you say? Evil destroyer of forest, shouted Tsar. May you be ground by the teeth of a roger breath into teeny little pieces of dust much smaller than the fleas of an itch sprite. Be polite, Tsar, said Caliburn in an agonized fashion. Wickedness on legs, pointy ears, hair like a bear's bottom, nose like a pointy potato. Once Tsar started cursing, he really put his heart and soul into it. It had been a difficult day, what with being humiliated by Luther and told off by his father, and he put all the fear and the fury into a long, elaborate cursing of Sycorax, Queen of the Warriors. Oh, Zah, moaned Caliburn, his wings over his eyes. This time you're asking to get yourself killed, you really are. You can curse all you like, Zar, son of Encanzo, whispered Queen Sycorax, her eyes like flinty arrows. But it may not get you what you want. What do you want, by the way? Tsar suddenly remembered what he wanted. He wanted to save Squeeze Juice. He stopped mid-curse, panting. I demand that you put my sprite and my hand on the stone that takes away magic, as soon as you can, said Tsar. Sycorax looked at him in astonishment. She was used to prisoners who begged and prayed and beseeched and pleaded that they should never be taken to the terrible stone. Please, 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 Queen Sycorax, we will do whatever you want, but do not take us to the stone that takes away magic. Not prisoners who demanded to be led there immediately while at the same time insulting her. This wizard might be full of trickery, but Sycorax was used to trickery. She was tricky herself. Take me to the stone, said Tsar, as quickly as your stupid, lumping great warriors can move in those iron fool suits of theirs. This is an emergency. And then he reached into his breast pocket, and his hands were shaking as he unwrapped Squeeze Juice. Oh, this was terrible. With a lurch of his heart, Tsar saw that Squeeze Juice was looking worse than ever. He was green as emerald, trembling all over as if he had the flu, drifting in and out of consciousness, rigid one moment, fever-racked the next. For a second, the hairy fairy's glazed, confused eyes focused as if he knew where he was, and he held up his feverish, shaking little arms in entreaty to Tsar and the other big people. Help me, whispered Squeeze Juice. Help me. Tsar turned to Queen Sycorax. I want to save my sprite, said Tsar. 
despairingly. Queen Sycorax started as she looked at Squeeze Juice. What happened? said Queen Sycorax grimly. To your sprite? He got witch blood on him, said Tsar. The warrior soldiers and citizens gave a great gasp of horror and stood back even further from the wizard boy. Queen Sycorax was a very great warrior queen, so she would never show fear. But her face turned to a diamond stiffness. A witch, you say, said Queen Sycorax. But witches are extinct, said the chief deputy. Liar, called a warrior from the crowd. All wizards are liars. I saw the witch dead myself, said Tsar. It was definitely a witch, and it gave me this. Tsar held up his palm to show the green stain in the middle of it. A witch stain, cried the crowd, and they stepped back even farther. Cowards, snapped Queen Sycorax. According to legend, witch's blood is only dangerous if it mixes with your blood. Show me that hand of yours, boy. Tsar put his hand out again. Queen Sycorax stared at the green mark. She took a good look at Squeeze Juice, too, taking the little bundle he was wrapped in out of Tsar's hands and looking at him from all angles. And then she turned to the crowd. It is as I suspected, said Queen Sycorax, holding up the poor poisoned sprite so that everyone could see him. And then she lifted her gentle voice to one of ringing hardness. Witches are not extinct, and they have returned to the forest. The crowd recoiled in horror. I have been right to arm us as I have done, cried Sycorax. Right to increase our sentries, add to our watchtowers. To Tsar, she said, Now I see why you might want to visit the stone that takes away magic rather urgently, Tsar, son of Incanzo. It is, as you say, an emergency. For unless your sprite touches the stone to remove the witch magic within the next twenty-four hours, I imagine the sprite will die. Sycorax was a noticing sort of person, and she certainly noticed the tears in Tsar's eyes when she said those words, and the shake of his head. No, whispered Tsar, no, he must not die. He will not. He must not. I will not let him die. Don't worry, Squeeze Juice, trust me, I won't let that happen. For Squeeze Juice, cowering and quaking in the Queen's hands and staring up at her stern, unrelenting profile, had let out a whimper as he heard these words. Sycorax sighed sympathetically. A queen of warriors must be merciful as well as strong, she said. And so I shall take you and your sprite to the stone, and I very much hope for both your sakes that it will not be too late. Sycorax handed the bundle containing squeeze juice to her deputy, who held him out at arm's length, shaking, for he did not want to be holding a witch-poisoned sprite. But before I take you there, said Sycorax, sweetly, I have a few questions to ask. Uh-oh, whispered Caliburn. Be careful, be very careful, Tsar, of the questioning of queens. You mentioned that you saw a dead witch, said Queen Sycorax. That interests me extraordinarily, for according to legend, witches are hard to kill. So, who killed this witch? And with what? There was a silence. Standing some way behind Queen Sycorax, Wish was waving her arms about frantically to get Tsar's attention and staring at him in an agonized sort of way. Tsar could see the hilt of the enchanted sword poking out from beneath her cloak, and Wish was mouthing something that looked a bit like, I'm on your side. Was she really on his side, or wasn't she? Tsar didn't know. But in that moment, Tsar realised that just possibly Wish might have stolen the sword, not because she was a treacherously tricksy traitor of a warrior, but because she didn't want the sword to be captured as well as Tsar. I killed the witch, said Tsar eventually, with the bow and arrow. Really? said Queen Sycorax, raising an eyebrow. For, by complete coincidence, only yesterday... I lost a large ancient witch-killing sword from my dungeons. It disappeared. Poof! Just like that. 
and ever since my household defenders have been turning the fort upside down looking for it. Do you know anything about that, sword, Tsar, son of Incanzo? No, said Tsar. A large ancient sword with the words, Once there were witches, but I killed them, written on the blade. I've never seen a sword like that in my life, said Tsar. And do you know where it is now? said Sycorax, disbelievingly. No, said Tsar. How could I when I've never seen it in the first place? You lie, said Sycorax, swift as an adder. I'm not lying, protested Tsar. I am afraid that you are, said Queen Sycorax. I said that Queen Sycorax was a noticing sort of person. Her sharp, flinty eyes had spotted something sticking out of one of Tsar's pockets. A half-full bottle of Love Never Lies potion. I know you are lying, said Queen Sycorax, because that is one of your strange wizard medicines which changes colour when a person lies. She pointed at the bottle, and the liquid inside was a swirl of darkest indigo, the deep purple that indicated that the person who was touching it was telling a lie. Bother it, thought Tsar. She's as bad as my father. That's the second time today I've been caught out by that beastly love potion. I really must remember not to carry one of the truth drugs around with me. It cramps my style. But how would a warrior queen know about love never lies potion, and what it did? Study your enemy, said Queen Sycorax, as if Tsar had spoken aloud. It is extremely important to study your enemy very carefully. I know a great deal about you wizards and your curses and your wart cunning and your trouble-making poisons, and this knowledge often comes in useful. Queen Sycorax reached forward, removed the bottle of Love Never Lies potion from Tsar's pocket, and shook it, watching thoughtfully as the liquid turned back to pale red again. And the fact you were lying tells me that you have seen my sword. You do know where it is, and if you wanted to, you could tell me its whereabouts right now. Search the wizard. Very reluctantly, the warrior guards searched Tsar, for they did not really want to go anywhere near a wizard with a witch stain, but they were far too frightened of Queen Sycorax to disobey her orders. They found plenty of interesting things in Tsar's pockets, curses and spells and potions and herbs of all sorts, but no sword. Hmm, said Queen Sycorax. I wonder what you have done with it. Where is my sword, Tsar, son of Incanzo? I refuse to answer, said Tsar, folding his arms. All right, then, said Queen Sycorax, calmly. I will make a bargain with you. I had intended to hold you for ransom. I was going to send a message to your father, saying that if he ever wanted to see his rude little burglar of a son alive again, he must give himself up to me. Taking away the magic of the great wizard in Kanza would be a blow the wizards would find very hard to recover from. Tsar flinched in horror. But, mused Queen Sycorax, if witches have returned to the forest once more, I really am going to need that witch-killing sword. So said Queen Sycorax, briskly. I will be very reasonable. If you give me back my sword, I will take you and your sprite to the stone that takes away magic. And then I will not hold you to ransom for your father after all. I will let you and your sprites and your animals go free. How is that for an offer? Do you promise? said Tsar. Of course I promise, snapped Queen Sycorax. Are you questioning the word of a queen? It was a tempting offer. Tsar considered it. He was trapped. He would never be able to overcome so many warriors who were holding him at once, and this would at least get squeezed just cured, and... And then he saw Wish's face again. Wish was making anguished eye movements towards the Love Never Lies potion in Queen Sycorax's hands. The liquid had turned so indigo that it was very nearly black. You lie, said Tsar, pointing at the Love Never Lies potion. You lie, and I refuse your offer. Queen Sycorax gave a start and looked down at the bottle. Dear, dear, she said, good-humouredly. That was careless of me. And very clever of you, Tsar, son of Incanzo. I like an intelligent enemy. It keeps me on my toes. You're quite right. I am lying, Queen Sycorax admitted. 
I have every intention of holding you to ransom for your father after I've taken you to the stone that takes away magic, whatever you do or say. Wish was so horrified she could not help interrupting. But rule number thirteen, a warrior should never lie. Queen Sycorax looked at Wish as though she were a slug. Amendment to rule thirteen. A queen can break the rules, said Queen Sycorax, in pursuit of a higher good. Then what, thought Wish, is the point of the rules in the first place? But she kept that thought to herself. Queen Sycorax put the Love Never Lies potion back in Tsar's pocket. You are a very disobedient boy, and you obviously have not been treated firmly enough, said Queen Sycorax. But I think you will find that I am very firm indeed. You need to be given a lesson, Tsar, son of Incanzo, and that is what a prison is for. Tsar sighed. Why did everyone want to teach him a lesson? Ranta, his father, Caliburn, and now this horrible queen. It was very wearing. I shall lock you in my prison, said Queen Sycorax, and I will not take you or your sprite to the stone, she continued in a hard voice, until after you have told me where the sword is. Give the sprite back to the boy. With relief, the deputy handed Squeeze Juice back to Tsar. If you don't tell me where the sword is, you will have to watch your sprite dying in front of you, said Queen Sycorax. As soon as you tell me, I will take you and your sprite to the stone, and then I will hold you to ransom, and your father, if he is weak enough to love a rude, disobedient child like you, will come here to save you, and I will remove Incanzo's magic, too. She smiled at Tsar. It was a beautiful smile. Whenever she smiled at Wish, which wasn't often, Wish's whole world lit up with sunshine. But Tsar didn't appreciate it. You and your father and your sprites are all going to lose your magic, whatever happens, said Queen Sycorax, in that voice as gently soft as a poisoned arrow. But if you tell me where the sword is, you can at least save your sprite's life. The queen continued, and you love your sprite, don't you? Love is always a weakness, so I know you will make the right decision. Tsar was trapped. What could he do? Everything was getting out of hand. Squeeze Juice might die, all through Tsar's fault. His father might lose his magic, all through Tsar's fault. Queen of evil, heart of ice, cowardly ironclad leader of the rabbit hearts, shouted Tsar, beside himself with anger and fear. Queen Sycorax reddened with annoyance. Nothing much rattled her. She took threats, trickery, even violence in her stride. However, nobody had ever dared to speak to her with Tsar's sheer disrespectful cheek before. The warriors secretly admired the bravery of this one small wizard, who was completely at the mercy of the most ruthless ruler in the forest, but was still throwing insults at her with total abandon. Take this uncivil little wizard and his sprites and his animals to cell number 445 snapped Queen Sycorax. Tsar was putting on a brave and angry front, but inside he was feeling total despair and helplessness. He fought and bit and struggled, but he was hopelessly outnumbered, and the guards dragged Tsar and the snowcats and the sprites away, Tsar still cursing Queen Sycorax at the top of his voice. You're softer than bunny rabbits! You're weaker than water! You're fluffier than the fluffiest little baby dormouse, and my granny could beat you up with one hand tied behind her back. Fourteen. Queen Sycorax is disappointed by her daughter. Again. Queen Sycorax watched Tsar being dragged away, bundled down into the darkness of her dungeons. What a rude boy, she sniffed disapprovingly. Is it too much to expect in Kanzo the Great Enchanter to bring up his son with slightly better manners? She turned to her daughter. I do hope that if you are ever captured by an enemy, Wish, said Queen Sycorax, you will maintain your dignity and be civilly polite, particularly if they are threatening to kill you. It is hardly going to put them off. Wish was so confused she didn't know what to think or feel. On the one hand, she was dreadfully frightened for Squeeze Juice. On the other, of course, her brilliant, splendid, intelligent mother wouldn't ever do anything that was wrong. Would she? 
Surely her mother wasn't going to allow Squeeze Juice to die. You're not going to let any harm come to Tsar Sprite, are you, mother? said Wish. You're going to take them to the stone in time so he can be cured, aren't you? That is none of your business, snapped Queen Sycorax. But it's not the Sprite's fault that he got witch blood on him. You saw how frightened he was, poor little thing, protested Wish. Sprites and wizards are magic, and magic is bad, so it does not matter if the sprite was frightened, and you should not be concerned about their fate anyway, said Queen Sycorax, waspishly. Why are you sympathising with the enemy, and how dare you question my decisions? I will do exactly what I think is right. Wish hopped guiltily and anxiously from one leg to another. Queen Sycorax's eyes had narrowed with suspicion. Why was that stupid little wish looking so conscience-stricken and so upset? Could she be hiding something? Was there more to her hopeless daughter than it seemed at first sight? The guards were saying that you captured this rude little wizard. Wish, said Queen Sycorax. You? Queen Sycorax always made an effort to speak reasonably kindly to her irritatingly useless daughter, but something about the way she said the word wish always suggested dissatisfaction, as if the word reminded the Queen that she wished wish were a completely different person than she was, which indeed she did. For wish was a great disappointment to Queen Sycorax. The Queen had hoped to have a daughter who was tall and golden like herself, not someone small and scruffy and weird, with hair that wouldn't lie flat, and an eye patch and a limp. So, Wish, did you fight this young wizard and his animal and sprite retinue, and overcome him with your superior warrior skills? asked Queen Sycorax, sceptically. Wish, looking up adoringly into her mother's golden face, longed to be able to say that this is what had happened. How wonderful would it be to see Sycorax's expression change, so that she looked back at Wish with admiration, with respect, with love. But her clever mother would never believe her, and it might make her so suspicious that she would investigate further, and then she might find the sword, and then all would be up for Tsar. Well, no, mother, admitted Wish. I heard a noise, and I saw it was a wizard, and I was going to try and fight him, but then I fell over and shouted for help. The suspicion faded from Queen Sycorax's eyes, and she now looked merely displeased. That was entirely believable. I wouldn't call that capturing the wizard, would you? snapped Queen Sycorax. You fell over and you shouted for help. Falling over is not considered to be one of the traditional warrior skills, Wish. Queen Sycorax looked at Wish's eye patch and her limpy leg as if she'd lost the use of both of these body parts out of an act of willful disorganization. Why can't you be more like your sisters? Wish bit her lip to stop herself from crying. Crying was another of those things that Queen Sycorax considered to be a weakness that warriors should not indulge in. You could choose to follow the example of your sister Drama, for instance, Sycorax continued. She has made a quilt out of the beards of dwarves she shot down from a remarkably long distance. I deplore the violence, of course, but those sort of teenage high spirits are, after all, the warrior way. When I was your age, I had already hunted down and killed my first giant. All on my own. But you have willfully and inexplicably decided to go in an entirely different direction. I'm not sure why you think it's a good idea to look so odd, so lopsided, so... The weight of Sycorax's disappointment was so depressing that Wish could feel herself drooping like her fingers were made of lead. Be merciful, thought Sycorax to herself, as Wish wilted miserably in front of her. I suppose the child can't help looking like a weird little twig that somebody accidentally trod on. I suppose she can't help lolloping about the place like an unbalanced bunny rabbit. A queen should be gracious as well as severely and incorruptibly just. A queen must be forgiving as well as unbendingly and unswervingly firm. Sycorax controlled herself with a strong effort. I suppose, said Queen Sycorax, gritting her teeth, you did your best, however inferior that best might be. How is your headache, thinking of physical and mental weakness? My headache, said Wish blankly, before remembering hurriedly that she had told her mother she was going to bed early with a headache so she could sneak out after the spoon. Oh, uh, the headache's much better, mother, thank you, said Wish. 
And how are you finding learning how to be a warrior? asked her mother. It's quite difficult, mother. Queen Sycorax sighed with exasperation. Madam Dreadlock says that your spelling is going particularly badly. Reading and writing is a sign of how superior and civilized us warriors are, you know, Wish. Yes, but the thing with the spelling is the letters won't stay still, explained Wish. They keep wandering about in my head, and I forget what order they were in in the first place. There are some people, Wish suggested bravely, who think that spelling might not be as important as the things you are trying to spell. Well, those people are mad, said Queen Sycorax. You'll just have to try a bit harder, won't you? Starting with your appearance. Wish was looking even more than usually bedraggled. Cloak on inside out and back to front. Ripped clothes, twigs all over the place, hair whipped up into frenzied knots from when squeeze juice had made a nest out of it earlier. Even a substandard warrior like you should always be well turned out, Wish, said Queen Sycorax, sweeping away. Every hair in place, every weapon sharpened, every fingernail shining, remember that. And just as Queen Sycorax was sailing off in a rustle of long, gracious white skirts, a certain knot that attached a little iron key to the belt she wore around her waist undid itself, like a small snake uncoiling, and the key dropped to the floor. It was a very tiny key. So as it dropped onto the stone flagstones, it made a very tiny noise that the Queen did not hear. She disappeared around the corner, not knowing she had lost it. Ting! Wish, looking after her mother dejectedly, heard the noise. She picked up the key. She opened her mouth to say, Mother, you've dropped your key, and then she shut it again. The key was small and black and cold, the hair stood up on the back of Wish's neck as she realised it was the key not only to every room in the warrior fort, but to her mother's dungeons. How strange that Queen Sycorax should lose it at that precise particular moment. Did it drop, or did it jump? If you were a fanciful person, you might have said that it was almost as if the key were looking for Wish and wanted her to use it. But we are not fanciful people, and that would be ridiculous. Fifteen. Breaking into Queen Sycorax's Dungeon Wish and Bodkin and Bumbleboozle tried to sneak down into Sycorax's dungeons in the daytime, but it was impossible. There were too many people around. We'll have to wait until everyone goes to bed, said Wish. But how are we going to get past the sentry guarding the entrance to my mother's dungeons? I had a great sleeping spell. Let me put him to sleep, squeaked Bumbleboozle. Your spells won't work here, I'm afraid, Bumbleboozle, said Wish. Bodkin looked guilty. I still think this is a terrible idea, he said. But just in case you wanted to go through with it, I put a small sleeping draught in the sentry's serving of wild boar stew when I was serving him dinner. Once magic people aren't the only ones who know something about herb work. Oh, Bodkin, thank you, said Wish in delight. Don't thank me said Bodkin gloomily. My father would be very disappointed in me. I just felt sorry for that poor little squeeze juice, but I should be able to overcome mere personal weakness and do the right thing. I don't know what's come over me. So late that night, Wish and Bodkin crept down to the great door which was the entrance to Queen Sycorax's dungeons. The sentry who was supposed to be guarding it had indeed fallen fast asleep, so they tiptoed past him, unlocked the door with Sycorax's key, and slipped in, soft as shadows, closing the door behind them. As the door shut, Bodkin had a suffocating feeling of panic. Sycorax's dungeons tended to have that effect on people. You stay here, Bumbleboozle, said Wish, so you can come and warn us if my mother or anyone else comes down after us. OK, squeaked Bumbleboozle. The smaller hairy fairies were always extremely pleased to be given a role, and she was delighted not to have to go any further. For in the centre of the room they were standing in was the true entrance to the dungeons, a great pit with a movable platform hanging above it. Bodkin stared into the pit. We are going to have to go down there, aren't we? he said, pathetically hoping somehow Wish might say no. Yup, said Wish, climbing onto the platform. Goodbye, whispered Bumbleboozle. Good luck. 
it was nice knowing you. For big people, you were kind of less smelly than most. Thank you, said Bodkin. Shakily he climbed on the platform, and Wish untied the rope, and gradually let it out, and down, down, down they went, the temperature dropping like a stone, as did Bodkin's heart as the platform lowered deeper, ever deeper, into the underground prison. Wish's heart was sinking too, for coming down here felt like not only a betrayal, but also a trespass. Sycorax would have secrets here, because a queen must have her secrets. And Sycorax did have secrets. All of Sycorax's secrets were hidden underground. Wish knew that, and she also knew that she really, really did not want to find out what those secrets were. But she had no choice. Down, down, down they went, deeper, ever deeper. When the platform finally came to a soft landing, what seemed like a horribly long time later, they landed in the secret midnight world of the prisons of Queen Sycorax, buried in a hundred yards of stone and earth, deep below the Warrior Hill Fort. Wish and Bodkin stepped off the platform into a grim little chamber, with a steady drip, drip of water coming from the ceiling, and lit by dim and guttering torchlight. There were no fewer than seven corridors leading off the chamber. Sycorax's dungeons were on the site of what in ancient times had been a mine, so they were haunted not only by the prisoners of the present, but the giant and dwarf and human miners of the past. Mine had turned to prison, and the dungeons were now a great spreading maze, like a gigantic long-legged spider's web, with corridors meandering and crossing over each other in trickily confusing fashion, just like the torturous maze of tricky Queen Sycorax's mind. Off these corridors were endless little chambers, some with prisoners in them, some with other things. But how were Bodkin and Wish to know which way to go? And what's that noise? whispered Bodkin. Sycorax's dungeons, as I mentioned earlier, were always filled with noise. An iron music of despair and sweetness all mixed together, for longing does have its own sweetness, and beautiful things can come out of pain. The once magic people imprisoned in those underground regions could no longer perform magic. They could not work their spells. The sprites could not fly. The giants were very slowly shrinking. For in one of the secret cells in the lowest, deepest chamber of all was Sycorax's stone that takes away magic, and they had all been taken there, and they had touched the stone and lost the magic that made them what they were. They were then led back to their cells, and kept there until they readjusted, and got used to life without their magic. No one had quite got used to it yet, and so the once magic people who were living there filled the dungeons with noise. Melancholy noise, angry noise, regretful noise. The sound of the stamping feet of ogres treading in sad, slow circles, the howling of werewolves, the song of sprites singing in high, eerie voices about the bright old days. It was the one thing they could do now. They had lost their wings, their spells, their hope. They had lost their sight, their light for when the magic went from sprites. Their colours faded. The inner light that burned so bright flickered and died. But they still made noise. They were brought iron spoons and iron dinner plates to eat from, and they clasped the iron in their no longer magic fists or paws, and they tapped out a melancholy beat that drummed through the prison like the ache of a long-lost love. When Wish and Bodkin entered the dungeons, they could hear the song of a sprite called the Once Sprite, who was standing on the shoulder of Crusher the Giant, locked in one of Sycorax's cells. For Wish had been right. Crusher had indeed been captured by Queen Sycorax's warriors when Tsar had left him behind in the clearing of the forest. And here Crusher the giant was now, hidden somewhere in Queen Sycorax's dungeons, his eyes closed, thinking great thoughts and hoping against hope that Tsar would come and save him. Meanwhile, on his shoulder, the one sprite was singing of one particular bright blue of a summer's day when he flew up 
and slept on the wing like a swift, allowing the air currents of the atmosphere to be his bed, so high that the last thing he saw as he fell asleep was the many islands of Albion spread out below him, the forests reaching from sea to sea. And he sang it so beautifully that all the inhabitants of that underground chamber thought that they could see it too, and joined in the song of lost magic, stamping, beating an iron beat in time with the giant's great beating heart, as if they were up there in the skies, not down buried deep, lost and forgotten, landlocked forever. Poor Squeeze Was this to be his fate too? Once you have heard the song of lost magic, you never forget it. The confusion of emotions in that song, the despair, the hope, the regret, coupled with the exquisite recreation of the magic world and the powers that the once magic people realised in the moment of losing they had lost, and the way they echoed down the corridors, repeating and mirroring and bouncing off the warren of walls, created a maze of noise and emotions and moral choices at least as disorientating and overwhelming as the physical maze itself. Have we done right? Have we done wrong? sang the songs. What have we lost? But had we no choice? And these songs ran into other songs about the beauty of the wildwoods at midnight, where only the eyes of magic could see in the dark. The formation of hair ice on the elder tree twigs as the first deep frost of winter came to the forest. And cyclamen buds, deep violet and leafless, pushing their way through the earth and the discarded autumn leaf clutter from the trees above, too quiet for dull human eyes to see their slow growing, but clear as daylight for the eyes of magic. And it wasn't even certain which were the songs of living people and what were the songs of long-dead ghosts of the magic people imprisoned in these warrens long ago, whose voices had sunk and frozen into the walls, only to be ricocheted back into life again by the slicing blow of a present sound wave, as if the spirits of the long-dead goblin and hob-elf and she-dwarf miners were still there picking the sounds out of the walls with their enchanted axes and sending the songs off on their way again so that they were alive once more in the ears of Bodkin and Wish. Ah, yes, it was a strange, haunted place, that underground prison, where magic and iron and past and present and good and evil were being held together in a much more complicated and contradictory manner than you might expect from Sycorax's confident iron hill fort standing so proudly above them. We have no map, said Bodkin, covering his ears, for the noise was so muddling it made it difficult to think, let alone make any clear choices. He had already explored down one of the corridors and found it split in another two directions at the end of it. How are we going to find where she's imprisoned are? We're never going to locate him in a maze as big as this one. A maze can be as effective as locks and keys if you're trying to hide something. Wish and Bodkin walked round the chamber in despair for a while, before the enchanted spoon noticed something down at the bottom of one of the unlit deep black corridors. A tiny sprinkle of light, blinking on and off like a remote star. The spoon rapped Wish gently on the head to get her attention, and then tip-tapped his way along the corridor to draw her attention to the little pool of light. Wish felt her way after the spoon, with Bodkin saying, "'Where are you going?' and following her reluctantly. And when she had reached the bright little particles, she could see another patch, way in the distance, beckoning her like wear-light. "'Sprite dust! Zar must have sprinkled sprite dust along the way so we could follow him. That's clever!' said Wish, admiringly. So on they went, feeling their way towards the distant sprinkles of light— deeper and deeper, losing themselves in the twisting corridors of Sycorax's dungeons. "'It must be somewhere round here,' said Bodkin, as they came to a long corridor with at least twenty-five rooms coming off it. "'We'll just have to check every room.' "'Do we have to?' said Wish. "'It's all very well for you. It's not your mother. But I feel really weird finding things out about my mother that I really do not want to know.' Reluctantly, Wish took out the key and unlocked the nearest door, which swung open with an ominous creak. "'You look, Bodkin,' said Wish, putting her hand over her eye. Bodkin peered round the edge of the door. "'And fainted.' 
Wish very hurriedly shut the door. What was in there? said Wish, when Bodkin came round again. You really, really don't want to know, said Bodkin. After that, Wish decided that it was kind of worse than not knowing, because then it left it up to her imagination as to what it might be in there. So she made up her mind she was going to look this time. Bodkin opened up the next door and immediately shut it again with an Ugh! of disgust. What was in there? cried Wish. Heads, said Bodkin. Oh, come on, I've had enough of this, said Wish, pushing him out of the way. It can't possibly be heads. You're just completely determined that my mother should be this bad person. And she shoved Bodkin out of the way and went into the room. It was heads. Ooh, said Wish. Wish shut the door again very, very quickly. I'm sure there's a reasonable explanation for that, she said. My mother is very interested in anatomy. Really? said Bodkin sceptically. Other rooms contained less gruesome things. A whole collection of spelling books, for example. A library with everything carefully lined up in rows and labelled, for Sycorax was a very neat person. A potion room. Many, many collections of banned magic objects. But even after a long time searching, they still hadn't found Tsar. Meanwhile, down in cell number 445, as hour after hour passed, with no sign of Wish and Bodkin and the sword coming to rescue him, Tsar's spirits were sinking, and he was very close to despair. Of course, Sycorax's dungeons were designed with spirit sinking in mind. That's part of the point of a dungeon, after all. You don't design them to be cheerful, airy spaces with a nice view and comfy seating. Every now and then, during the day, Sycorax would visit and ask whether he had changed his mind about telling her where the sword was, and the sprites and Tsar got the opportunity to shout and hiss rude remarks about her nose, and that cheered them up a little. But then she went away again, and the dank and miserable dark prison air would sink into their bones, and the song of lost magic would depress them even further. "'She's not coming, that wish,' hissed Tiffinstorm, whose light was fading fast. "'Stupid warrior of a girl! Why would you trust her?' "'She took the sword. She warned me about the love never lies potion,' said Tsar moodily, for he was worrying about the same thing himself. "'They're too stupid to follow the sprite dust. They're too cowardly to come here anyway. They hate you. They won't be able to unlock the doors.' The miserable sprites kept up a steady flow of discouraging comments for they were desperately unhappy. "'You kidnapped them! You stole their sword! You tricked them!' said Ariel. "'Why would they risk their lives for you, the enemy, the turnips and tin cans?' "'Ariel has got a point,' said Caliburn gloomily. "'Had Tsar been stupid to put his life in the hands of two enemy warriors?' "'They liked Squeeze Juice,' said Tsar. "'I know they did.' He looked down at Squeeze Juice. Squeeze Juice was so dark now he was nearly black, and his little heart was barely beating. He was racked with seizure after seizure, where he was so overcome with such shaking and delirium that he was not himself. But now he came to his senses for a second. "'What's happening to me?' whispered Squeeze Juice, and you could see the fear in his eyes. "'Am I going to the dark side?' "'Of course not,' said Tsar. And just as Squeeze Juice fell back into a coma again, he whispered so faintly Tsar could barely hear it, "'Tsar will save me!' and put one tiny claw-like hand trustingly against Tsar's chest. Tsar would have to give Sycorax what she wanted. At least Squeeze Juice would live. But then his father's magic would be in danger. Tsar was not a despairing person but even he was beginning to run out of hope when he heard footsteps and whispering in the corridor. "'You look in this one, Bodkin. I just can't bear to,' said the voice of Wish. "'They're here!' cried Bodkin's voice as Bodkin's face appeared in the grill. There was a click, click, clicking noise and creak. The heavy door of cell number 445 swung open.
Tsar could never have imagined that he would be so astonishingly grateful and thankful to see two warriors, one tall skinny one and one little limpy one. Even the sprites were delighted, somehow finding the energy to buzz excitedly, although they barely had the strength to fly now, and were lower and lower in the air, as if they had lead in their shoes. "'You came!' said Tsar to Bodkin and Wish, so excited he even hugged them. Who would ever have thought that Tsar would hug a warrior? "'Of course we came!' said Wish, stoutly. "'I said I would, didn't I? I wouldn't leave a friend in trouble like that!' Tsar agreed that she was an excellent friend who had shown unexpected initiative for a warrior. "'How did you get in, and how are you opening the doors?' asked Tsar. "'Bodkin gave the sentry a sleeping draught," said Wish, "'and my mother dropped her key to the dungeons. How is Squeeze Juice?' She could see the little sprite shaking inside Tsar's waistcoat. "'He's not doing well, I'm afraid,' said Tsar, as Wish unchained the snowcats with Queen Sycorax's key, and the snowcats burst out excitedly. We need to get him to the stone as fast as we can. But just as they were preparing to leave, Bumbleboozle zoomed like a little speedy midge streak of lightning in through the grill of the door in a state of the greatest alarm. She was thoroughly out of breath, for she had flown all the way from where she'd been on lookout up at the entrance to the dungeons. Queen Sycorax! she shrieked. She's coming! Sixteen. A really bad moment for Queen Sycorax to turn up. Queen Sycorax is coming, said Bodkin, just about managing not to faint again. She mustn't find me here, squealed Wish, absolutely petrified. It was one thing to secretly decide that she wanted to be friends with a wizard. It was quite another to be found by her mother in the act of not just sympathising with the enemy, but actively unlocking their cell and helping them escape. Don't worry, said Tsar. Hide and I'll deal with her. I'll be polite this time, I promise. Give me the sword and lock the door behind you. Be nice to her, Tsar, warned Wish, throwing Tsar the enchanted sword. Trust me, grinned Tsar. Bodkin and Wish ran out of the room and hid round the corner in desperate haste, for from the sound of her footsteps, Queen Sycorax was approaching at quite a speed. She was coming to offer Tsar one last chance to see sense and get his sprite to the stone that takes away magic in time to save its life. Surely even a wizard boy with no conscience at all would not want his sprite to die. But Tsar was proving to be unexpectedly obstinate. She was alarmed to find that she had lost her key. Luckily she had a spare. Furious to see her sentry fast asleep, and as soon as she set foot in the dungeon, she sensed something had gone wrong. Queen Sycorax knew every noise that went on in her underground home. Every drip of water, every muffled moan from her prisoners, every tap of the guard, every flicker of candle, every line of song, ghost or sprite, was familiar to Queen Sycorax. There was something awry. She knew it. She moved up from her normal glide to a most unaccustomed actual run, so that her footsteps made quite a racket in those echoing chambers. If Bumbleboozle had not warned them, Sycorax would have caught her daughter in the act of aiding and abetting the enemy. But Bodkin and Wish had whisked round the corner in the nick of time, locking the door again behind them. So when Queen Sycorax unlocked the door of cell number 445 and swept in with a regal swish of her rich red cloak, Tsar was standing in the middle of the room as if nothing had happened, the enchanted sword behind his back. "'What is going on?' panted Queen Sycorax. Nothing, said Tsar innocently. Hmm, snapped Queen Sycorax disbelievingly, her eyes ranging suspiciously all over Tsar, for she did not trust him for one second. This is your last chance, Tsar, son of Encanzo, snapped Queen Sycorax. I will not come back again tonight, and your sprite will be dead by morning. Where is my sword? Would this be the sword that you were talking about? said Tsar thoughtfully, taking the sword out from behind his back. Queen Sycorax went absolutely rigid with shock. A low growling behind her, and three enormous snowcats with teeth like kitchen knives were slowly, menacingly creeping out of the shadows. How were they unchained from the wall? breathed Sycorax, as white as her dress. Who brought you my key? And where did you get my sword? Never you mind. But don't move, Queen Sycorax, said Tsar or I will kill you with this sword. That beastly boy. She should have brought guards with her. But the guards had thoroughly searched him, 
so she thought she was perfectly safe visiting an unarmed little boy and a few sprites, all safely locked up in her most secure cell. Sycorax's hand crept towards her waistband, where her own sword was hanging. I said don't move, said Tsar, and there was a gleam in his eye that made Queen Sycorax halt. Wizards were generally a peaceable people, but Tsar was not like most wizards the Queen had ever met. So, Tsar, son of Encanzo, spat Queen Sycorax, infuriated to find the tables had been turned on her. What are you going to do now that you've burgled my sword? I'm going to take my sprite to the stone that takes away magic, said Tsar, and then I'm going to release the giants and other magic prisoners that you have wickedly locked up here, and we can all escape from this fort of dullness and iron turnip heads and go back to wizard camp where we belong. You will be arrested as soon as you leave these dungeons, said Queen Sycorax. Giants are rather visible, and this fort is swarming with guards. But you're a tricky, wicked queen with a lot of secrets, said Tsar, so I bet you have a secret exit to these dungeons, and a secret password, too. Perhaps I do, said Queen Sycorax dryly, but it is highly unlikely I would tell you about either in the circumstances. How about if I strike you a bargain, just like you offered me one, said Tsar craftily. If you tell me the way to the Chamber of Magic Removal, and the way to the secret exit, and also the secret password, I will leave you this sword. Queen Sycorax was delighted, although she didn't show it. She really, really wanted that sword, especially now that witches had returned to the forest. The boy thought he was so clever, but he obviously didn't realise the importance of that particular enchanted sword to offer it up so easily. I accept your bargain, said Queen Sycorax smoothly. The way to the Chamber of Magic Removal is— Oh, no, interrupted Tsar. No, no, no! Please stop right there, Queen Sycorax. He reached into his waistcoat and withdrew a small bottle. Apparently, queens can tell lies, in pursuit of a higher good, of course. So I'm afraid you're going to have to tell me the answer while holding the Love Never Lies potion, so I know you're telling me the truth. Queen Sycorax gave him a look of the purest dislike. Tsar handed her the Love Never Lies potion. The way to the Chamber of Magic Removal is to turn right and go down the corridor, and it's the seventh door in the Great Cavern. And from there you can reach the secret exit by turning left at every second turning, and the secret password is Control, said Queen Sycorax. Tsar made her say it twice to check the love potion wasn't changing colour, but it remained red, so she must be telling him the truth. He took the Love Never Lies potion from her. And now I'll leave you the sword, said Tsar, holding up the Love Never Lies potion so that Queen Sycorax could see it clearly. And as soon as he said those words, the liquid inside turned blacker than soot. Whoops, said Tsar happily. Dear, oh dear, how confusing! It appears that I was lying, grinned Tsar. It's so difficult to keep up, isn't it? Tricked. The horrible little wizard boy had tricked Sycorax into giving him the secret password, and he was going to take the sword anyway. It is always annoying for a very tricky person like Queen Sycorax to finally meet someone even trickier than herself. So Queen Sycorax lost her temper. It was most unlike her, but it had been a trying day. "'You rude, lying, disobedient trickster of a boy!' shouted Queen Sycorax. "'Now, now!' tutted Tsar. "'Be polite, Queen Sycorax. Insults will get you nowhere. Please, could you very kindly lend me your keys and your cloak as well? I think it will be helpful for me to disguise myself as you so that your guards let us leave without a fuss. Thank you so much!' With gritted teeth, Queen Sycorax handed him her keys to all the cells, and her very distinctive bright red cloak, lined snugly with royal black and white fur. You have to admit, continued Tsar, putting Queen Sycorax's magnificent cloak round his shoulders, a boy of destiny like me does need a really cool weapon that is magic mixed with iron. I'm not surprised you're so keen on this sword. It's something quite out of the ordinary. Sycorax gave a smile made out of icicles. I'm afraid I'm going to have to lock you in your own cell, 
said Tsar apologetically. It's not exactly suitable for royalty, but you are a very wicked queen to have taken away the magic of my people and kept us prisoners and threatened to kill my sprite. You need to be taught a lesson, and that is what prison is for. Can I do her hair, Tsar? begged Bumble Boozle. Please can I do her hair? She's been so mean to poor Squeeze Juice. Oh, all right, said Tsar, but do it gently. Bumble Boozle flew into the Queen's hair, and in two snaps of a ladybird's wing, she had whipped it up into a creatively complicated rat's nest of tangles. Sycorax was standing absolutely still and white and bone deadly with anger. Bumble Boozle buzzed backwards to survey her handiwork with satisfaction. Above Sycorax's pointed with freezing rage face, so dignified, so regal, so tidy, so furious, her beautiful pure waterfall of controlled golden tresses was now shooting upward in a vertical mess of scrambled electricity, like a furball having a fit. Oh, that's good, very good, hissed Tiffinstorm in malicious delight, and the sprites nearly fell out of the air they were laughing so hard. Those elf locks will take weeks to brush out. And while you are brushing them, it will help you remember, cautions are, to leave us once magic people alone in the future. And I warn you, spat Queen Sycorax, every word a cold white arrow, never to set foot in my territory ever again. Or by the gods of the trees and water, I swear I shall make you regret it. You'll have to catch me first, grins are. Then he said, Goodbye, Queen Sycorax, giving her a very low bow, and he and the snowcats and the sprites swept towards the door, Tsar with a very satisfactory royal swish of Sycorax's own cloak. Just as Tsar was about to leave the chamber, he had a thought, and he turned. Uh, by the way... I didn't really mean it about being soft, said Tsar. You are just as tough as a warrior queen ought to be. He ran out the door, and Bodkin, waiting hidden by the doorway, locked the door of the chamber behind him, leaving Sycorax all alone in cell number 445, thoughtfully adjusting her armour. She had a lot to think about. You were very mean to my mother, scolded Wish, once they were out of earshot. I was very polite, protested Tsar. I said nice things about how tough she was. You said she was a very wicked queen, and Bumble Boozle really messed up her hair, said Wish in awed horror. She's going to be absolutely hopping mad, isn't she, Bodkin? Absolutely hopping, said Bodkin gloomily. I was very merciful, said Tsar. If she wasn't your mother, I'd have killed her. Now, what did she say about the way to the Chamber of Magic Removal? Right down this corridor, and then it's the seventh door in the Great Cavern, said Bodkin promptly. They were riding on the backs of the snowcats, down through corridors that led them deeper, ever deeper underground, so low that the air was shiveringly cold, and a trembling wish lay down farther and farther into Forest Heart's thick fur coat. Tsar could feel Squeeze Juice had gone rigid inside the package above his heart. If they didn't get him to this stone quickly, they would lose him entirely. The corridor eventually opened up into a great cavern lit by a flickering torchlight. Tiffinstorm gave a horrified hiss and ducked behind Tsar. It's over there, she hissed. There were seven doors leading off the cavern, and the seventh door had a faded sign above it saying, Chamber of Magic Removal. The doorway was crooked and not as large as they might have expected. If a giant wanted its magic removed, it would have to lie down in the cavern and stretch its arm through the door. A strange magnetic force seemed to want to pull Tsar towards that crooked door, like an ice-cold wind tugging him. And then he realised it was the sword hanging beside him, twisting round and pointing at the door as if it were an iron finger. Every single instinct in Tsar's bones was telling him, Run away, go no further, stop here. Night Eye and Forest Heart and King Cat paced in anxious circles, growling and spitting and howling. Don't go in there, don't go in there, don't go in there, don't go in there, hissed the sprites. But we have to go in, said Wish, getting down off Forest Heart's back. For the sake of the sprite, said Tsar, springing off King Cat. Wish put the key in the keyhole, and the door to Sycorax's chamber of magic removal swung open. 
Will they be in time to save squeeze juice? 17. Queen Sycorax's Chamber of Magic Removal The Chamber of Magic Removal had a very high ceiling, and it was perfectly round. The only thing in it was a stone. The stone was a dark grey. It was just an ordinary but unbelievably large stone, rough around the edges like solidified lava. Is that the stone that takes away magic? asked Tsar in disbelief, for there didn't seem anything particularly scary about it. But the sprites and the animals were more sensitive to the strange atmosphere in the room, and they hissed like hornets in their anxiety, and the snowcats restlessly padded around the circular room, their hair all on end. Tsar reached into his breast pocket and took out squeeze juice, rigid as a dark green jewel, his breath like tiny green icicles rattling stiffly in his paralysed body. His light was dying, dying, and barely there, growing fainter and fainter, like his breathing. Now you have to put him on the stone, said Wish. You should not do this, sir, hissed Ariel, holding up his skinny arms and spitting out a warning. You have to listen to the stories of the fairies, stories from our ancient past. The fairy tales have wisdom in them. Mustard Thought finished Ariel's sentence. And all the fairy tales say, do not touch the stone. My father's father's father told me in a story never to touch this stone, said Tiffinstorm, and the other sprites echoed, and mine, and mine, and mine. And the walls of the chamber echoed back the words that might have been the words of these sprites, or they could have been the ghost words of sprites who had been here once and faced the same choices in the past. And mine, and mine, and mine! The sprites are right, said Caliburn nervously. You do have to listen to the stories, for stories always mean something. The question that worries me is, what exactly do they mean? Now they were there in front of the stone, confronted with the reality of actually touching it, Tsar found he was terribly torn about what to do next. The voice of the one sprite was singing, bright and pure as a nightingale, somewhere in the darkness above them, of his regret at the loss of his magic, of how his wings that used to brush the very stars on a windy winter's night were now paralysed, and the yearning ache of that song reminded them all exactly how big a decision this was. Tsar always knew what to do, but for once in his life, he wasn't sure. "'What shall I do?' said Tsar, in an agony of indecision. "'Maybe Squeeze Juice would actually prefer to go to the dark side rather than give up his magic entirely. Perhaps he'd think it would be better to die if it would mean he cannot fly. This is our only chance to save Squeeze Juice's life,' said Wish." What if you put him on the stone for just a second or two, to take away the witch blood magic, but take him off very quickly again to leave him with enough magic to fly with? Might that work? Tsar asked Caliburn. Well, I can't guarantee it, said Caliburn. I've never come across witch blood before. But we have to be hopeful, said Wish. We can't just let him die. We have to hope that this will work, and we can make something good happen even in this dark place. Help me, said Tsar to Wish. I can't do it on my own. The five sprites and the hairy fairies formed a glowing halo above Tsar and Wish's head, alarmed and suspicious. Ariel spitting out words of protection like and and the spiky glowing letters quivered with fear and anxiety as they hovered in the air before melting away. Tsar and Wish took deep breaths and knelt by the stone, gently holding up Squeeze Juice, tipping him so that only the witch stain on his chest touched the surface of the rock. Tsar turned his face away, and then nothing happened. The poor little hairy fairy jerked a little and was still. Do you think it's too late? whispered Tsar for Squeeze Juice's light had gone out entirely, and for one second he was like a stiff little piece of ivy lying there against the stone. And then, just when Tsar had thought he had lost him, a very faint twinkling of light flickered from Squeeze Juice's chest that grew brighter. 
and brighter. The green slowly faded from the little sprite's legs, from his arms, and finally from his chest, so that with a sudden whoosh he took in air, and his eyes opened, and feebly he beat his wings. He's alive, breathed Wish in passionate relief, as Squeeze Juice buzzed gently into life. Quick, take him off the stone, said Tsar. Wish and Tsar peeled Squeeze Juice off, gently but firmly, and the little hairy fairy sat in Tsar's palm, blinking, dazed, as if awaking from a coma. He's alive, cried Tsar, punching the air as the little sprite breathed very, very quietly, and whispered, I's alive, I's alive, I's alive. He's alive, smiled Tsar with passionate relief. Do you think he can still fly? It's a little early to tell, Tsar, said Caliburn. He's going to need some time to recover. Fairies are not like humans. The wild woods are so dangerous they would have died out years ago if they did not recover quickly from illness. Bravely, Squeeze Juice raised his head, unfurled his shaking wings, and launched himself unsteadily into the air. He can still fly, cried Tsar. I've made amends. It's all going to be fine. You see, Caliburn, for all your gloomy, what is done cannot be undone stuff, it is just like I said. Nothing is impossible. And that was perfect timing. I am so clever. Oh, the brilliance of me. It was such a great idea of mine to leave him enough magic so that he could fly. Quick, sir, said Bodkin. Put your own hand on the stone now to get rid of the witch stain, and then we can leave this horrible place. Tsar sighed. Come on, Tsar, urged Caliburn. You know this is the second part of our mission, and you must have learned something from this night. All of these bad things have happened because you tried to get bad magic from a witch. I know, I know, said Tsar sadly. But you have no idea how hard it is growing up in a world of magic when you have no magic of your own. It is difficult, but you have seen what the witch blood did to squeeze juice. That is bad magic you have in your hand, and bad magic will go wrong. Okay, okay, sighed Tsar. I'll do it. Miracle of miracles, it seemed that Tsar really had learned something over the previous two days. Tsar knelt down and put his hand with the witch stain on it on the stone. It was a bizarre feeling, but it didn't take long. There was an electric quivering sensation in his palm, and it stuck to the stone as if magnetically attracted to it. For the next minute he could feel something being pulled out of him, and then the force went away, and when he lifted his hand off there was no green stain any more. Tsar could not help sighing as he looked at it. For a moment he had been special, even if it was special in the wrong way. Now he was just ordinary, plain old Tsar again, way too old for his magic not to have come in. Caliburn landed on his shoulder and said sympathetically, You did the right thing, Tsar. I'm proud of you. That was the wise, grown-up thing to do. I know it was difficult, but you have to wait patiently for your own magic to come in, and not just leap in and try to fix things immediately. Yes, I know that, but it's so hard to do that, said Tsar sadly. At least Squeeze Juice is cured, he said, to cheer himself up. Ah, yes, whispered Squeeze Juice, peering sleepily over the edge of Tsar's pocket. But why is we still all here in this creepy dungeon? Good point, said Tsar. Let's get out of here. Wish was kneeling right beside the stone in Tsar's way and trying not to panic. Wish, I said, come on. Wish did not answer him immediately. She swallowed. I can't get my hands off the stone. 18. Oh dear, the story turns in an unexpected direction. There was a nasty silence. What do you mean you can't get your hands off the stone? said Tsar. I mean they're stuck. My hands are stuck to the stone. How is that possible? exclaimed Bodkin in horror. What had happened was this. Wish had been kneeling down, helping Tsar hold squeeze juice against the stone, and as she got to her feet, she stumbled, clumsily as she often did. She put both hands out with flat palms against the stone to steady herself, and she could not get them off again. 
puzzled. She tried to pull away, but the harder she pulled, the more stuck they were. Now she was kneeling down once more, both hands on the stone, her forehead pressed against the cold grey surface. Her hands were stuck to the stone like glue. She tried to move her little finger, but it would not budge. A not unpleasant, warm feeling was in her hands now, and she was beginning to feel a little sick. She was getting the oddest sensation. It was as if some compelling force from within the stone was dragging her inside out, emptying her like it was draining a bottle of wine. What's happening? demanded Bodkin. Why can't she get her hands off the stone? Has something gone wrong? What does this mean? This is strange. Ever so strange, said Caliburn, extremely puzzled. Tsar and Bodkin tried to help Wish pull her hands away, but they were stuck fast. All that pulling and scraping at Wish's fingers did was make her fingers bleed, and she cried out for them to stop. The sprites could not use spelling, of course, in Sycorax's iron dungeons, so they just buzzed around, wailing, You have to listen to the stories, listen to the fairy tales, don't touch the stone. Which wasn't very helpful, frankly, since Wish already had touched the stone, so it was rather late to warn her not to. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, what's going on? wondered Bodkin uneasily. There's something weird happening, I know there is. I wish we'd never come here. Are you all right, Wish? It's not painful, is it? No, said Wish. It's not painful. I feel a bit sick, but it doesn't hurt. Wish was feeling nauseous and confused and scared. It was very claustrophobic to be stuck in a horrible cavern in a dungeon a hundred yards underground with your hands stuck to an enormous grey stone. Wish's imagination started playing tricks on her. What if she was stuck there forever? This was the problem with magic objects and why you had to be very careful about touching them. You never quite knew what the rules were. What if that was the model of the fairy tales, that if you put your hands on the stone and you were the wrong kind of person, like a warrior rather than a magic person, you could never get them off again? Seven minutes passed. Eight minutes passed. What is happening? Wish kept repeating. Nine minutes. Ten minutes. What is going on? said Caliburn, very bewildered. It was so hot in the room that sweat was rolling down Tsar's face in great wet tears, and his shirt was soaking wet. Stranger still, the heat seemed to be affecting the enchanted spoon. He drooped on the princess's shoulder, trying to comfort her, but almost bent double, poor Spoon, as if, in sympathy with her predicament, the life was being sucked out of him as well. The snowcats and the sprites sensed danger and formed a defensive circle around Tsar, the sprites holding up their arms, trying and failing to spell and curse with such intensity that the air bristled with frustrated magic. Wish was limp now, and frantic with trying not to panic. I'm not going to be stuck here forever, am I, Caliburn? No, no, said Caliburn, trying hard to be reassuring. No, no, not forever. Forever is a long word. I'm sure it's just a little hiccup, some small misunderstanding, and any moment now you'll be able to get your hands off. Wish's forehead was very near to the stone. Was it her imagination? Or did the rock in front of her seem to be getting lighter? Lighter and lighter, and somehow more transparent, as if the surface of the stone was just a membrane, and she could see right into the stone itself. Oh, by mistletoe and oak and all things sweet and poisonous! As Wish looked, fascinated, mesmerised, she thought she saw an eye open somewhere in the heart of the stone. And a horrible little creaking voice whispered, Hello, I've been waiting for you. Tsar stared open-mouthed. The stone seems to be talking now. It's not the stone, gasped Wish. There's something in there. There was a moment of blinding, dazzling colour, and as Wish's eye adjusted, she was looking straight into the eye of an enormous witch, all curled up inside the stone, legs folded up underneath itself, like a large, dark grasshopper. Nineteen.
Magic can never be destroyed. It can only be hidden. In Kanzo, the enchanter had a saying that Sycorax would have done well to remember. Magic can never be destroyed. It can only ever be hidden. How very true that saying was. For this was the secret of the stone that takes away magic. It was taking away magic for a reason. What is that? whispered Wish in absolute horror. I said the horrible, terrifying, creaking voice. Am the king witch. Oh, I of Newton, toe of beastly frittering frog, cursed Caliburn in horror. Destiny has led us up the garden path. It's the wrong kind of star cross. It's the universe in one of its trickiest moods. It's fate having a very bad day indeed. It was indeed the king witch, and it looked like fate had been playing a mischievous game with them. You see, wizards used to have a tradition of never writing anything down. The problem with that is, when the truth gets passed from mouth to ear over the course of a number of centuries, it can get deformed and fragmented along the way. It seemed like the sprites were right to be saying, "Do not touch the stone." It appeared like the fairy tales may have had a point, as Caliburn said. The trouble with stories is, you have to know what they mean. For now, at last, the real secret of the stone was discovered. Here was the truth of it. Many centuries ago, the king witch had been defeated in the last witch war and cast inside this stone. For hundreds of years, he had been soaking up the magic from outside, waiting, and waiting. Queen Sycorax thought she was bringing the once magic people to the stone of her own free will. How could she dream that she was responding to the will of the witch inside the stone? That inside the very heart of the iron fort. Quiet inside the grey rock, there was another heart, another will that was pulling, scheming, wishing, and wanting with such dreadful invisible force, like a long-legged spinner in the centre of a grey great web. It's a witch! 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 Shrieked the sprites and the hairy fairies, climbing up the air in their fear, sending out little clouds of black terror smoke. Give me your magic," whispered the king witch. "Give me your magic. Give me your magic." There must be some mistake," pleaded Wish, forcing herself to look at the horror inside the stone. "I'm afraid I don't have any magic to give you. I'm not a wizard. I'm just a very ordinary warrior princess. Please let me go." Oh, but you do have magic," replied the voice of the king witch. "Trust me, I know magic when I feel it, and the magic that you have isn't ordinary at all. It's a very special kind of magic, a magic that I have been waiting for for a long, long time. The kind of magic that works on iron. Oh, my goodness! Get me off this stone! Yelled Wish at the top of her voice. Pandemonium in the chamber of magic removal. Bodkin and Zar hauled at Wish's fingers, but her hands would not budge. It can't be true, can it? Wept Wish. I'm a warrior. Warriors can't be magic. It's impossible. But there's no such thing as impossible, only improbable. And the moment that the king witch had said those words, every single person in the room knew it must be true. It explained everything. It explained why Wish had been feeling a little different and peculiar lately. For the last couple of months, plenty of odd things had been happening to her: needles wriggling to life in her hands, rugs inexplicably moving beneath her feet or curling up at the edges when she stepped on them, objects she touched slipping through her hands like water or tingling with electricity when she put her fingers on them, things that she thought she had put in one place turning up unexpectedly in another. Her hair lifting up when she met particular people or entered certain rooms and softly wriggling itself into a bird's nest of tangles, 
clothes ripping, shoes coming loose, keys going missing. She thought it was just her being forgetful and clumsy and absent-minded, even more useless than she generally was. But Wish was thirteen years old, and that was the time when a person's magic first came in. The spoon, whispered Bodkin to himself. A warrior who was magic. Inconceivable. But could it possibly be that the iron spoon had come alive because Wish's weird magic that works on iron was enchanting it? The character of the spoon drooping on Wish's shoulder, now Bodkin came to think of it, was very Wish-like, kind and loyal, a little reckless, a little odd. How could Wish enchant something without even knowing that she was doing it? Because magic is hard to control, particularly when you're not even aware you have it. And that was typical too. Of course, if Wish was going to be magic, it would be very Wish-like of her to have a magic that was so different from other people's. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, flapped Caliburn. I knew we weren't asking the right questions. The questions we should have been asking are, why are the witches waking now? Why here? Why us? And the answer is, they are waking because Wish's magic has just come in. Caliburn was right. There are no coincidences. For centuries those witches had lain asleep, but they had indeed chosen this particular moment to wake from hibernation because they sensed that Wish had come into her magic and it was something that they needed. Give me the magic, chanted the king witch inside the stone in that same dreadful, creaking, croaking voice. Give me the magic that works on iron. Why does he want it? wept Wish, already knowing it was a question to which she didn't want to hear the answer. Caliburn had worked out why. He's trying to get enough magic to break out of the stone, screamed Caliburn. We have to get her off it. Get me off this stone right now, yelled Wish again. Tiffinstorm, try and spell her off the stone, ordered Tsar. I'll have a go at pulling her again. Tiffinstorm hissed furiously, spitting with anger and irritation. Great galumphin, smelly human girl, you stone mad, master. What we need to do now is get out of here. Things are about to get nasty. Obey me, said Tsar sternly. The sprites desperately riffled through their spell bags. Invisibility, love potions, cursing spells, flying, all small-time magic, useful for things in everyday life, but not for facing a great dark evil like a witch. They tried every wand in their quivers, the drivers, the number fours, the number fives, but of course their magic could not work anyway in a prison full of iron. The king witch's horrible creaking voice got louder and louder, filling the room with horror. Give me your magic! Give me your magic! Give me your magic! chanted the witch, and the louder it chanted, the more panicky Wish became. How do I use this magic to get away? shouted Wish. Give me your magic! Give me your magic! Give me your magic! You have to want something really, really bad. Wish for it. Spell it, Tsar replied. And then point it out with your hands. I can't, panted Wish, who was feeling so sick she wanted to give up and die right there. My hands are stuck to the stone. Why can't I get them off? It was so easy to take squeeze juice away. The witch will have let you take squeeze juice away, said Caliburn, hovering in terror over the stone, whereas it won't want to let you go at all. With her hands stuck to the stone, she couldn't perform magic independently of the witch, even if she had known how to perform magic in the first place. Any separate thought was being sucked out of her through those hands. She could feel the numbing effect of the witch's thoughts entwining with her own, as if she were being eaten by a large animal and was coming round to its point of view in the digestion process. After all, the warriors have sworn to destroy magic, so it is perfectly reasonable for witches to fight back, said her thoughts, and she did not know whether they were her own or the witches. Give me your magic! Give me your magic! Give me your magic! Wish could see right into the King Witch's body, where his two black hearts were beating, and every little artery was lit up like a tiny green network of roads or the veins on a leaf. But there were other roads too. 
roads of magic crisscrossing the king witch's bright green arteries, tiny little paths winding through a white forest. Both the king witch's palms were pressing right up against the stone on the inside, exactly opposite to where Wish's hands were stuck on the outside, and she could feel the magic flowing out of her fingers and into the hands of the king witch in steady, rhythmic pulses in time to the beating of her heart. I wish to get away. I wish, I wish, I wish, wished wish. Chaos in the chamber of magic removal as the hypnotic chanting of the witch grew deafeningly stronger, and the sprites let off their spells randomly, and the snowcats howled and roared. Fight it, cried Caliburn. Try with everything you have to break away. Be disobedient. Think of Tsar defying his father. Get angry, wish, and fight back. Curse the witch. Don't give up your magic because you think that's what a warrior ought to do. Wish thought of Tsar earlier in the camp yelling at his father, and as she did so she could see the flow of magic going from her to the witch slowing. It's too late, said Bodkin. The stone is moving. The stone had begun to rock, gently at first, and then wilder, faster, wilder, faster. Oh, witch's whiskers and murmuring mistletoe and yellow toenails are the barmiest bog ogres in bogdom, thought Bodkin. The witch might have finally soaked up enough magic to break out of the stone. Leave, leave, leave! shrieked the sprites and the hairy fairies burning bright as meteors. But they couldn't leave Wish there on her own. Not Bodkin, not Tsar, not Caliburn, not the Snowcats, not even the sprites. Sprites have a bad name for themselves. People say they are treacherous, flighty creatures who do not know the meaning of love or loyalty. But all I can say is, these sprites, despite their terror at the rocking stone, at the witch about to emerge, at the fear of death itself, stayed by their master's side. They were hissing and spitting like bonfires, but nonetheless they stayed. Without thinking, Tsar drew the enchanted sword. The light shone on the blade. Once there were witches, but I killed them. He held the sword up over his head, gave a great big yell, and plunged it right into the stone with all of his strength. Of course, that ought to be impossible a sword made of iron to enter a stone. But that magic sword sank into the stone right up to the hilt, as if Tsar was plunging it into the earth. Every single strand of Wish's hair sprang up and shone like fire. A smell of burning hair added to the smoke of the room. The door of the chamber exploded out of its hinges and slammed into the opposite wall. Lightning shot off the surface of the stone and Wish was catapulted off it. She shot backwards through the air and landed with a horrible thud at the back of the room. Little lines shot all over the surface of the stone, just like the lines that appear on an egg before a chick is born. The stone is cracking, screamed Tiffin Storm. The stone is cracking. The stone cracked from side to side. A great jagged split an inch wide zigzagged across the stone with the sword stuck in the centre of it. And out of that split, something slithered. 20. The story gets even twistier. At first, the something looked like a little slick of black oil leaking out of the stone, like the yolk leaking out of a broken shell. It couldn't be the king witch, could it? For how could that thing they had seen inside there creep out of a split only an inch wide? Surely the witch must be dead, when a great big witch-killing sword has been driven right into the stone enclosing it. That must be the dead witch's blood leaking out of the broken stone. But in front of their eyes, the pool of liquid grew larger and larger, and then the black water solidified, turned in front of their eyes into something flesh and blood that moved, a real and living body, a feathery, soggy scarecrow of a something, feathers soaking wet. Sometimes people like to reassure themselves that witches can't possibly ever have been as bad as the fairy stories said they were. One look at the king witch told you that they were every bit as bad, and maybe even somewhat worse. Just looking at a witch had been known to scare a person to death. They can, of course, assume many forms, some of them quite pleasant, but mostly they find it helpful to look as scary as possible. 
The thing had a nose like a knife, so razor sharp and pointy at the end that it looked like you could cut onions with it. There were just two black holes instead of eyes either side, like deep wells with something flinty and slimy as mercury glinting queasily at the bottom of them. The mouth dripping that revolting black saliva from the fangs. The jaws could unhinge to swallow a deer in one gulp. A body like a human mixed with a panther, and those black feathery wings. All in all, the king witch was not a pretty sight. Power reeked from that slithering thing, and slowly, slowly he unfurled its wet black wings to their full extent, and they dripped on the dungeon floor, black smoking drips, as he lifted his beak and looked straight at Tsar and Bodkin. And then he vanished. Where is it? Where is it? said Tsar, whirling around. The animals howled in horror. The sprites opened up their fang-filled mouths and shrieked in fear, for there are few things more scary than an enemy you cannot see. Wish, over on the other side of the room, picked herself up, shaking. Nobody panic, said Caliburn, panicking like crazy. Where is it? Can anyone see it? The three of them whirled round and round, trying to see the invisible witch. But there was nothing there. It's going to attack Wish, said Tsar. He knew this. He wasn't sure why. Sure enough, the air above Wish seemed to thicken and darken. Bravely, the enchanted spoon standing on Wish's head turned to face that darkness. But an enchanted spoon is the sort of thing you might want on your side if you are making dessert, not if you are facing one of the most terrifying life forms that have ever walked this planet. Tsar tried to drag the sword out of the stone, but it was stuck fast, as if it had been rooted there all along. However hard he pulled, it would not budge. So with another blood-curdling yell, completely unarmed, Tsar, the boy who cared for nobody but himself, launched himself at the diving witch. As the witch screeched downward, diving at wish, it was turning itself visible as it plunged. And turning yourself visible is not as easy or painless as lighting a candle— it looked, indeed, as if the atmosphere itself were being ripped apart like a curtain, as first the head appeared, half melting at the edges with black sparks and smoke, and then, with a terrible smell of burning feathers, the witch itself, screaming like a falcon. Wish ducked automatically. The witch had been aiming straight for her head, intending to tear it off. Dear little creatures, these witches, aren't they? But Tsar and the snowcats leaped the mightiest leaps they had ever leaped, and they caught the diving witch by his tail. So instead, the witch's talons scraped across Wish's face, ripping off her eye patch as the witch soared up into the air, and Wish yelled and put her hands over her head as she fell to the floor. With a furious scream, the witch shook off Tsar and the snowcats, swirling round viciously, and turned to attack the insignificant and irritating human boy who had shoved the sword in the stone and frustrated its pursuit of wish. The witch smiled, and oh, by mistletoe and all things sweet and juicy and poisonous, a witch's grin is a terrible thing. He unhinged his jaws so that he could swallow Tsar in one gulp. The hot witch's breath reeked so revoltingly of rotten eggs and death that Tsar nearly passed out from the stink of it. At least I'm going to die gloriously, thought Tsar through his terror, not some kind of non-entity. I'll be the first person to be killed by a witch in hundreds and hundreds of years. How like Tsar to be thinking of fame and glory even at the point of death. The witch swooped. This time he would not miss. 21. Wishing Bodkin shouted, No! Over in the other corner of the room, Bodkin saw Wish uncurl her hands from over her face. She lifted her head and she too shouted, No! The witch had torn off her eye patch and it had fallen to the floor. Wish's eye that was normally hidden underneath the eye patch was closed and there was a deep scratch over it. It was ever so slightly larger than the other eye, and all around the edge was a deep purple bruise, as if the poor human skin found the burning force of it difficult to bear. As Wish shouted, she opened her eyelid, just a tiny, tiny crack, and the colour of the eye underneath was very odd indeed. 
It was a colour that no one had ever seen before, a hitherto unimagined colour. I can't describe it, apart from comparing it to other things. It was a colour that managed to be both warm and cold at the same time, a colour that reminded you of volcanoes, of thunderstorms, of electricity, of power. Wish could feel the power within her, and it was truly terrifying, a rage and a riot, a thunderstorm in her head, so violent it made her head ache, as if goblins were hammering it from the inside. The individual hairs on her head twitched upward vertically in the air. A confused, sickening wind ricocheted round the room, sending the sprites and the feathers and the dust bowling through the air, and the floor bent and shivered like it was a nauseous sea. In the depths of that extraordinary eye, strange clouds formed, like the beginning and the churning and the building of ideas, and there was a tiny snapping noise, and... The magic screamed out of Wish's eye, so forcefully you could see the impossible colour of it in the shape of a bent and twisted star hitting the witch at exactly the same moment that the witch pointed his taloned finger to shoot one piercing blast of white-hot magic back at Wish. And then... The witch exploded into a mass of charcoal and black feathers. Bodkin and Tsar and the snowcats were blown off their feet. The dust and feathers of the witch fell through the air like dark rain. 22. Making amends and paying the price. The walls and the floor ceased their wild shaking and came to a shuddering halt with such violent abruptness that a few large stones fell out of the doorway. Oh, my goodness! I don't believe it! I did it! gasped Tsar in astonishment, raising himself onto one elbow, coughing and spluttering and staggering to his feet in the dust clouds, trying to catch the dropping feathers in his joy. I killed the witch! Wake up, assistant bodyguard! Wake up! Tsar gently prodded the prone body of Bodkin with his foot, for Bodkin had fainted once again with the shock of it. I've killed the witch! I did it! The witch is dead! The witch is dead! sang the sprites, joyfully turning somersaults in the air. Groggily, Bodkin came to, rubbing his head. What happened? It exploded! marvelled Tsar excitedly, for Tsar was a boy who loved an explosion. It actually exploded! It was magnificent! The loudest explosion I have ever heard! I can't believe you missed it! Tsar whooped joyfully and held out his hand to help Bodkin to his feet. It exploded, said Bodkin in a dazed way, reaching out a hand to catch one of the feathers still dropping through the wreck of the room. Look, said Tsar, pointing at the feathers lying all around them. That's all that's left of the witch. Wish's magic exploded it. But it was my brilliant sword thrust that would have made it weak enough for the explosion to work. He raised his fist in the air. I am the boy of destiny. Feel my power. Oh, my goodness, we did it, shouted Bodkin, as he realised the enormity of what they had achieved. We've killed the King Witch, wizards and warriors working together. Tsar and Bodkin hugged each other as the snow cats capered joyfully around them on the churned-up floor, howling with happiness. Yes, I have to admit, Wish, you were a bit of a help with that weird thing you did with your eye. What was that? Tsar turned to congratulate Wish. But Wish was not there. It was only then that they realised how silent it was. The walls were not shaking, the churned-up floor was perfectly still beneath their feet, and it wasn't only feathers that were falling quietly through the chamber and landing on the floor beneath them. There were also flakes like snowflakes, and each individual flake was a very unusual colour. Silence, apart from the gentle falling of black feathers, snow of an unusual colour, and dust. But where is Wish? said Bodkin in a bewildered way, looking round the room at the open doorway with the door blasted out of it. Did you see where she went? Look, the door has come out of its hinges, said Tsar, so maybe she ran out to fetch help or something. And then he noticed the spoon lying motionless in the centre of the floor. Tsar knelt and picked up the spoon. It was hard and cold now that all enchantment had gone from it. A perfectly ordinary iron dinner spoon. Carefully, Tsar laid it back down on the floor again. Silence in the chamber of magic removal. 
Caliburn flew to Tsar's shoulder with long, slow, reluctant wingbeats and perched there in misery. I am so sorry, Tsar, said Caliburn, but in the confusion I think you did not notice a second explosion nearly at the same time as the first. Wish was taken by surprise. She was shocked into letting down her guard. The King Witch let off a final burst of magic, and it hit her directly. She exploded as well as the King Witch, said Tsar, unable to believe it, because he hadn't seen it with his own eyes. Impossible. Inconceivable. Come back, Wish, thought Tsar fiercely. Come back. I wish, I wish, I wish you would come back. But he couldn't breathe life back into those fragments, however much he longed to. Breathe! Be alive again! Move of your own accord! But the strange-coloured dust that was once wish lay cold and still, and not any of Tsar's wishing could make it move again. Even the very greatest conjurer in the world could not do that. Actions have consequences. You must pay the price of making amends, and some things happen that cannot unhappen. Tsar cried. He and Bodkin knelt down in the room, and they cried together, their heads bowed, while the black feathers and the weird coloured dust lay quiet and unmoving in a circle all around them. Even the sprites wept, and fairies do not cry. It was one of the things about them. They never, ever cry. But their tears dropped down onto the feathers and the snow. And then... And then, and then, through streaming eyes, Tsar thought he saw the edge of the spoon twitch. He blinked. Maybe it was an illusion. But no, there it was again, a definite wriggle of the outline of the spoon. What's happening? whispered Bodkin with round, wondering eyes. What's going on? whispered the sprites, gripping tight to their pin-sharp needles of wands. Their hair shot out electrically sharp. The room bristled once again with magic. The strangely coloured little flakes of wish lifted themselves up from the floor. A great cloud of little fragments that sang like bird song as they flooded around in the air, shuffling and rearranging themselves as if they had some internal memory of exactly where in the infinitely complicated jigsaw puzzle that makes up a human being their tiny individual piece was supposed to be. They never bumped into each other, those millions and millions of tiny, dusty, ashy pieces flying around in a whirling flurry of animation until they settled gradually onto the floor, forming the nose, eyes, ears, mouth, legs of Wish. Like they were creating a sculpture out of thin air, building life itself in front of Tsar and Bodkin's very eyes. For a second, the perfect sculpture was still. Dead, perfect but inert, the robotic outline of what once had been Wish. But above Tsar and Bodkin's heads, the last fragments of Wish were forming themselves into the shape of a human heart, suspended in the air. Look, breathed Tiffin Storm, pointing above them, and Tsar caught his breath. That's impossible, thought Tsar. I can't be seeing that. A flying heart. The small brown heart descended from above, rather fast in a hurry, and plunged softly through the chest of Wish lying on the floor. And Wish sat straight up like a wooden automaton and took a huge gulp of air, gasped it like she was drinking in life itself, and went from death to life in a shaking, spluttering, ugly with spittle and flame moment. Wish sat upright, gasping for breath. What? What happened? She's alive! 23. When the adventure is over, the problems begin.
She's alive! She's alive! She's alive! Around the room they danced now with even greater jubilation than before. The enchanted spoon doing mad pirouetting circles. Oh, my feathers and beak and tail! Breathed Caliburn. Thank goodness for that! For one horrible moment I thought it was all going to go dreadfully wrong, and fate and the universe had given us the worst bad hair day of all. But she's alive! Wish staggered to her feet in the clouds of dust. I'm fine," said Wish shakily. "I'm fine." With her hair up in all directions, in an enormous electric ruff, she looked like a piratical sea urchin. "Quick, put your eye patch back on," said Bodkin, bending down, picking up the eye patch from the dusty floor and hurriedly handing it to her, for the uncovered magic eye was making the walls shake again. As soon as Wish put the eye patch back on, the floor stopped heaving, the walls straightened. "What?" Happened there? Asked Wish, finding it difficult to keep her balance. It was incredible! Shouted Zar. Unbelievable! Impossible! Inconceivable! What we have just witnessed, said Caliburn in impressive tones, is one of the most extraordinary sights in the entire universe. That of a great enchanter regenerating themselves. What on earth are you talking about? Blinked Wish. You're alive! Shouted Bodkin. You died, but you're a great enchanter, so you have more than one life. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard," said Wish. "I wasn't dead. I just fell over for a second there." "You were in pieces," said Zar joyfully. "Tiny little pieces all over the room, and then you came back together. It was the most amazing thing I've ever seen." "Nonsense," said Wish, a little more uncertainly. For what with one thing and another, she was feeling a little untogether, as you would be if you had just been taken apart and put back together again rather rapidly. That's impossible. What are you saying? You're saying that I can die and come back to life? Said Wish. Yes, but there's a catch. Said Caliburn. Even great enchanters are made of flesh and blood, and that wears out after a while. So you have to be careful of your lives, Wish, for you do not know how many you will have. Okay," said Wish, finding all this a little difficult to take in. "And what about my eye? It must be a magic eye," said Caliburn. "Extremely rare, very powerful. I've only ever seen that twice before in all my lifetimes, and never that colour. That must be the colour of magic that works on iron." "Hang on a second," said Zar crossly. "The person who has magic that works on iron is the boy of destiny. Wish can't be the boy of destiny. She's a girl for starters." Nobody says the person of destiny has to be a boy, Zar," said Caliburn. "This isn't the Dark Ages, you know. Well, it was actually, but nobody ever thinks they are living in the Dark Ages. But I don't understand," said Wish. "I've taken my eye patch off loads of times, and trust me, nothing like that has ever happened before. Yes, well, you've only just turned thirteen, so the magic will only have just come in, won't it?" said Caliburn. So not only am I magic," said Wish, very, very upset, "but it's a really weird kind of magic, and it's all my fault that these witches are waking." "Well, not your fault exactly," said Caliburn. "However, if the witches could get hold of the magic that works on iron, then they might have a hope of rising once again. They know from centuries of bloody wars that without that power they cannot defeat the warriors. That is what they have been waiting for all these years." Shoot! This was bad, really bad. It's not a pleasant thought to think that the most terrifying creatures on earth want to target you in particular. Wish was feeling very conflicted about all this. On the one hand, it was, of course, a disaster for a warrior to suddenly discover she was magic. But on the other, in the past, she had always been wish. A word which, when spoken, was accompanied by a sigh of disappointment. Sycorax's very ordinary seventh daughter, a little bit clumsy and a little bit blind, who was trying and failing to be a warrior like her sisters, but now she had discovered she was wish—a quite different sort of word, a word that was another name for magic itself. And this new wish was an individual of some considerable specialness who might look ordinary on the outside. But on the inside had a glorious, if rather dangerous, secret. 
We can think about all this stuff later. In the meantime, it's all worked out, said Zara joyously. We've saved Squeeze Juice. Wish is alive. We killed the King Witch. I've broken that horrible stone and made amends. Everything ends happily. I knew it would all turn out right in the end. He turned triumphantly to Caliburn. You see, that wasn't so hard, was it? Oh, Zara, said Caliburn, shaking his head. You're going to be the death of me. These adventures of yours are very, very bad for my heart. Bodkin stared at them all in awe. In the last five minutes he had rocketed so violently from terror to despair to rapturous joy that he felt as if a great grey ogre had been rattling him in a bucket. You mean, he whispered in awe, you have experiences like this on a regular basis. All the time, sighed Caliburn. This was a particularly bad one, admittedly. Bodkin looked around the devastated room. Sycorax's precious chamber of magic removal ruined. The floor, a mess of rubble. The stone exploded. The door blown off its hinges. The scrape of witch's talons on the door frame. An ancient peril, the witches, dead for hundreds of years, woken up and come out into the world once more. What do you mean, worked out? said Bodkin. I don't call this worked out. It's a mess, a total mess. The witches are out there, said Bodkin, and it's all our fault. I should never have let the princess out of the fort. I should have told the grown-ups. Wish gently patted him on the shoulder. Now, now, Bodkin, you're being too hard on yourself. It's not all our fault. The witches were out there anyway. They were always there. We just couldn't see them. We have to look on the hopeful side, and look how much we learn from this adventure. Wish continued. Warriors and wizard fought a king witch side by side and defeated it. That has to be a good sign for the future. They left the sword in the stone, for it would not budge, even when Wish pulled it. Fate didn't seem to think that either of them was ready to wield that sword. I don't understand, said Tsar, bewildered. We need that sword more than ever, now that witches have returned to the forest. But the sword is a bit wayward, isn't it? said Caliburn. And we don't really understand its secrets yet, so maybe this is the right place for it at the moment. Caliburn might be right, for goodness knows where you could safely conceal and imprison an enchanted sword that seemed to have a mind of its own, and wanted to kill witches, and could pick locks, and slice through floors and ceilings. And if even Queen Sycorax, who was a prison expert, couldn't work out a solution of how to contain it, well... The stone was probably as safe a place for it as any, for the moment. They left a note for Sycorax by the sword and stone. Wish wrote it, so the spelling was a little erratic. Dear Queen Sycorax, I have returned your sword. Do not touch the blade, if you are ever able to take it out. It may be stained with witch blood. Sorry. Best wishes, Tsar, son of Incanzo, Grand Wizard of Forever. It wasn't hard to find the once magic people that Sycorax had imprisoned. You just had to follow the noise, and as soon as they entered their dungeon the singing ceased, and the once magics stared at them, unable to believe they were there. The giant crusher raised his shaggy head. Zah! he roared. You've come to save me. I knew you would. Of course I have, said Zar conveniently forgetting that if Wish hadn't pointed it out, he wouldn't even have noticed Crusher was missing. Because I am a leader, and that is what a leader does. One look at that giant's kindly, innocent face crinkling up in delight as Tsar hugged his ankle made everything worthwhile for Wish. The imprisonment of the once magic people was wrong. She could tell it was wrong. Her mother was mistaken. Not wicked, like Tsar said she was, of course not, but mistaken nonetheless. Let's get out of here, roared Tsar, punching the air. But to Tsar's surprise, the once magic people were not so keen to escape as he expected. They stood there, even the loudest of the hobs, rather silent and depressed, as if the air had leaked from a balloon and the poor sprites, who had lost their ability to fly, were so mortified they ran away, scuttling like mice across the prison floor. They're ashamed, Tsar, explained Caliburn. For what is a giant without his size? What is a sprite without her wings? They were like warriors returning from battle, 
terribly wounded these poor people, and they no longer knew how they would fit into the world of the magic. But Tsar coaxed them out. He jumped up on a rock in the centre of the dungeon. Don't be embarrassed, everybody, cried Tsar. I am Tsar, boy of destiny, and at present it seems, due to some weird divine oversight that I don't understand, even I have no magic yet. I have come to rescue you, and I will take you back to my father in Kanzo, the greatest enchanter who has ever lived, and I am sure he will be able to restore your magic. I don't think you should be promising them that, Tsar, said Caliburn. I'm not sure that's possible. But the promise offered hope to these people. The thought of magic being returned to them brought a shine even to the dullest and most crestfallen boggit or will-o'-the-wisp's eye. Crusher the giant scooped up the little sprites who could no longer fly and kindly offered them a lift in his pockets. Or they perched like little nits in his hair, and the gradually growing larger party galloped and sprang and ran through the corridors back to the chamber of magic removal because that was where they could pick up the path to the secret exit. At the chamber of magic removal, the little party stopped. This is where we part, said Bodkin. Come with us, Wish, said Tsar. Come back to our camp. You can be magic there. Tsar and Wish had met in a crossing of paths and stars in the forest only twenty-four hours earlier. Here, deep in the underground prison, was another crossing of the ways, and Wish had to decide which way to go. One way, the sprite dust trail of light led back through the dungeon maze and up to Sycorax's hill fort. The other way, a tall, dark corridor led towards the secret exit and out into the forest, and that was where Tsar and the magic creatures were going. It was extremely tempting to take that path, for it seemed like the path of excitement and wildness and magic and snowcats. But... I can't leave home, said Wish. I'm only thirteen. This is my home. And my mother isn't as bad as you think she is. Your mother is a very dangerous person, said Tsar. Even though Bodkin wanted Wish to come back up to the fort with him, in all honesty he had to agree with Tsar. Remember those heads in that chamber? Those spelling books piled high in the cells? Sycorax is trying to be a sorceress, Wish. "'Murmuring mistletoe, do you think that's true?' gasped Wish. "'But how can she, when she's the one who always goes on about how bad magic is "'and how we should fight against it?' "'Yes, Sycorax had plenty of secrets, "'and Wish had learned rather more about her mother than she wanted to know. "'But she's trying to do the right thing, I know she is. "'And my mother deserves a second chance,' said Wish, stubbornly. "'We all deserve a second chance, don't we?' "'Wish is right.' She should stay here, said Caliburn, thinking not so much of giving Sycorax a second chance, but of the many evil people, wizards and worse, who might like to get their hands on magic that works on iron. Wish's magic is so powerful it will be better off for the moment in the protection of Warrior Fort. In fact, now I come to think of it, the warriors have to keep Tsar's spelling book, just in case. Oh, that's so kind of you, Caliburn, said Wish, but I won't be needing it. She gave a little shiver. I'm not going to be doing any more magic for the moment, not till I can persuade everyone in the warrior tribe that magic isn't as bad as they think it is. No, whispered Bodkin urgently, even though he was absolutely longing to look again at the pictures, at the stories, the recipes, the spells, the whole wonderful world of magic in that book. No, Wish shouldn't have magic things any more. Look at all the trouble that beastly spoon and the enchanted sword has got us into. Wish is a warrior princess, and she needs to give all this magic stuff up. Caliburn gave him an affectionate look. Ah, magic can be concealed, magic can be hidden, but giving magic up, that is very hard indeed. Look what just happened here in this fort. However, the kind of magic Wish has, admitted Caliburn, is so dangerous and so special that it is probably better for you to conceal it. Nobody must ever find out, or Wish will be in terrible danger. There is a lot to be said for the nice, quiet, ordinary life of a warrior princess. She is very lucky to have you, Bodkin, as her guardian angel. Bodkin blushed. I don't know what you're talking about. What is an angel? Is it something like a sprite? A little, said Caliburn. 
Remember, I cannot stress this more strongly. No one must ever find out about this. That's why you need this book. There are many, many useful chapters in there about concealing and hiding your magic from others. And if, by some unlucky chance, dangerous people start going after you, people with wicked hearts and deep spells and strong magic of their own, why then, this book may save your life. Wish took the book from the bird. It was in a terrible state, burned and stained with pages dropping out like confetti. You can write in it, too, said Caliburn. Write your own story, and that always helps if you're trying to keep a secret. Take a feather from my back, there's one that's about to fall out, and keep it with you all the time. Wish drew the falling out feather from Caliburn's back and placed it carefully inside the spelling book, and put the book in a pocket in her cloak. Goodbye, Squeeze Juice, said Wish, as the sprite hovered crossly in front of her. I hope you get well soon, and you fly just as well as you ever did. I don't know why you don't want to come back to Wizard Camp with us, but I don't care, grumped Squeeze Juice, crossly tweaking her hair and pinching her nose and giving her little bites like stinging nettles. You have a face like a warthog, and you are stinkier than a cow pat. Oh, you're cursing me. That's wonderful, Squeeze Juice. You must be feeling better, said Wish, delightedly. Squeeze Juice looked dolefully into her eyes. But why are you staying? Come with us. Don't make me sad. I'm so sorry, Squeeze Juice. Never mind, hissed Ariel, her eyes spitting with malice. We'll miss you, but we'll get over it, won't we, Mr. Thought? They can stay here in their lumping great fort of dullness forever. Ariel waved her thorny arms and spat out a few words that sounded like Kiskinter Color Bertie But and they did not sound friendly. Goodbye, Zar, said Wish. Goodbye, said Zar, whistling carelessly, his hands in his pockets, for he did not want anyone to think he was upset. And then they parted ways. Zar and his magic creatures ran and flew down the corridor, the sprites trailing beautiful little snakes of light that spelled words like Goodbye, and don't come back, and beware, and good riddance. Wish and Bodkin watched them until they vanished into the darkness, singing songs that were eventually too far away to hear. And then, sadly, Wish and Bodkin went in the other direction, up to where the guard was still sleeping at the dungeon entrance, and then back through the fort they tiptoed, carefully avoiding the night watchman. Meanwhile, Tsar and his once-magic people took every second left-hand turning till they got to Queen Sycorax's secret exit, an enormous door which must have been constructed by the quick, clever hands of hob-elves, for it was not only huge but slanting inwards from the slope of the hillside outside. It was a wonder, really, that it could be a secret, for the door was large enough for a giant to get in and out if they merely bent their head a little. Once they got there... It was far easier to break out of the fort than it had been to break in. Tsar did an impression of Queen Sycorax, shouting, Open up and be quick about it. The password is control. And... A guard standing on the other side opened the door, which was wood on one side and tuft like grass on the other, and they all trooped out. Tsar was wearing that very distinctive red royal cloak, so the guard assumed that what looked like Queen Sycorax on the outside was Queen Sycorax on the inside as well. The guard did not seem surprised to see his queen going out of the fort in the company of a giant and a whole load of once magic people. He merely sent a hand signal up to the sentries up at the battlements to let them know not to shoot. "'Nobody run!' whispered Tsar, for he could feel the snowcats quivering by his side. We mustn't look frightened. If we look scared and start running away, then they'll suspect something is wrong. All the sentry saw was someone wearing Sycorax's red cloak in the middle of the party, as the soft tread of the snowcats made paw prints in the snow, and Tsar and his magic creatures strolled quietly away from the fort and into the forest, the sprites blinking out like snuffed candles as soon as they hit the sky. Tsar only relaxed once he and the snowcats had reached the safety of the cover of the trees. He looked back at the fort. The door had been shut, 
and no one would guess there was a door there unless they knew it already. And the little ant-like figures of the sentries on the battlements did not look even remotely alarmed or agitated. It was almost as if Queen Sycorax made a habit of surreptitiously coming in and out of that secret entrance with all sorts of strange magic people and things, without the citizens of the fort knowing anything about it. Despite the fact that magic was very strictly banned by order of herself, Ah, she was an interesting woman, that Queen Sycorax, but tricky, very tricky. 24. What They Didn't See It wasn't only Tsar and the magic creatures who escaped into the midnight of the forest. As soon as Tsar and Wish and Bodkin had left the chamber of magic removal, there was silence for a second. And then a strange wind crept up inside the room, although it is impossible for a wind to blow inside. The black feathers and the dusty fragments of the king witch lying all around began to blow about restlessly. For, you see, every light has its dark. Day only exists with night. Wish died and came back to life, did she not? for it turned out she was a great enchanter, and great enchanters have more than one life. But there was more than one great enchanter in the room. If Wish could come alive again, so, too, could the King Witch. Slowly, 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 the millions and millions of King Witch fragments rose up into the air, making a strange, sweet, humming noise, and the tiny individual bits whizzed around at tremendous speed, like a swarm of bees shuffling and reshuffling themselves, just like they had with Wish, as if they had some internal memory of where they were supposed to be. And a strange singing filled the room, sweet and evil all at the same time. How many times this witch is life? How many times must it be killed? How many lives must yet be left? Risk it all, risk it all, risk it all. Not even a great enchanter knows exactly how many lives they have, so it is always chancy to risk one in case that was the last one you had. But it appeared that the king witch had one more life left to him, at least. Up, up and up. The feathers and fragments rose, and as they rose, they joined back together again in the dark and dangerous form of the King Witch. One of his wings was fractured and hanging limply, but he was very much alive. Semitemos oyueva ot esol a eltab ni redro ot niuetro croaked the King Witch, which means sometimes you have to lose a battle in order to win the war. The Witch gave an unintelligible shriek, and then he made himself invisible again, melting into the air like smoke. He flew back through the broken doorway. He was weak, so weak after the fight and the being trapped in a stone for centuries and the wounding from the Witch-killing sword. He needed to get away, to rest, before he could attack again. So he lurked like an invisible bat, flying above everyone's heads, as Tsar and his magic creatures ran along the corridors. When they escaped through Sycorax's secret door, the invisible witch escaped too, and out into the world the king witch flew, slowly turning visible as he reached the trees. 25. Mother and Daughter Bodkin and Wish parted ways at the door of Wish's house in the middle of the fort. Wish lived in a house all on her own, for princesses were so grand they had houses all to themselves, which was a little lonely, but showed their status. Bodkin was feeling surprisingly gloomy, for now it was all over. He was a hero no more, just an ordinary assistant bodyguard. It had been one stolen day, one glorious twenty-four hours, where he could ride and fight beside a princess— just as if he were her equal and a proper warrior himself. Now, Bodkin said to Wish, trying to sound more cheerful than he felt, we can all get back to normal, princess. 
You give me the spoon and I'll take it back to the kitchen where it can return to life being an ordinary dinner spoon. It's time to give up magic things, just like you promised me. Yes, said Wish, thoughtfully. But then I have still got the spelling book, haven't I? Maybe I'll give up the spoon tomorrow. All right, then, agreed Bodkin. You promise you will tomorrow. I promise, said Wish. Good night, Wish, said Bodkin. Good night, Spoon. Good night, said Wish, shyly shaking Bodkin's hand. Um, Princess, said Bodkin, for something had been bothering him. That fainting thing that happened a little bit tonight, you don't think that's going to be a problem, do you, with my future in bodyguarding? Is there any other profession you would be interested in? asked Wish tactfully. Well, yes, as it happens, I've always wanted to be a fool, and I'm quite good at the whole storytelling thing, and... But that's not the point, said Bodkin. The point is, all my family have been bodyguards, so I have to be one. And am I going to be any good at it with a slight fainting issue? I'm sure you'll grow out of that, said Wish. Tomorrow, maybe. But in the meantime, look what brilliant bodyguarding you just did. You are a hero and a very good friend. I am not a hero. I am an assistant bodyguard, said Bodkin, very relieved. And that is what an assistant bodyguard is for, to assist. But he didn't deny that he was the princess's friend. And then they both went to bed. The princess to her royal bed of goose-down feathers, the assistant bodyguard to his bed of straw underneath the kitchen table. They both slept soundly, for it had been a tiring night, what with one thing and another. But everything cannot be the same as it always was, of course. Once an assistant bodyguard has been on an adventure like that one, he is changed forever. Like the enchanted spoon, he had been burned at the edges by witch's fire and scorched by the breath of sprites. He had opened his eyes in the wizard's camp. He had listened to the speech of ravens, and they had made him see things from their point of view. I may have said this before, but this can be the problem with adventures, which is why Bodkin's father was so very, very against them. Meanwhile... Sycorax had a long, long night all alone in that darkness, and she had plenty of time for thinking. Who knows, she may have even learned a lesson or two. That is, after all, what a dungeon is for. And when, eventually, the guard woke up and unlocked the prison cell where she was trapped, Queen Sycorax ran out the door and straight to the chamber of magic removal, for she had heard the commotion of the night before, and she had imagined all sorts of terrible possibilities about what might be happening. She saw the stone, the sword, she read the note, and that chilly queen turned colder still. Queen Sycorax was no fool. The note said it was from Tsar, but the handwriting on the note, the spelling, made the queen immediately think of Wish. She ran, not even gliding this time, to the platform, up to the surface, through the streets of the hill fort, passing the staring eyes of her citizens, her beautiful golden hair, an absolute bird's nest shock of electric horror that would take her a week to brush out. And she was lucky to be able to brush it out at all. Sometimes sprites can mess up your hair with such intricate magic that the only solution is to cut it off entirely. She ran straight to the house where Wish lived. Queen Sycorax did not often go there, for queens are very busy, and they do not always have time to visit their children like normal people. Bursting into Wish's room, Sycorax found her daughter fast asleep, snoring on the bed, and the queen let out a sigh of relief. Relief quickly turned to anger, as so often it will. She gave her daughter a gentle shake to wake her up. Wish opened a sleepy eye and was instantly electrically awake when she saw her mother standing over her like an enraged iceberg. Oh, dear. Good morning, mother, gulped Wish wearily. The wizard boy has gone, said Queen Sycorax in a white, cold fury, taking in the scratches on Wish's face, the wildness of Wish's hair, which, like Queen Sycorax's own hair, was still whipped up into a frenzy of tangles by the sprites using it as a nest. Escaping with all the other magic creatures, chaos, disorder, anarchy, the stone that takes away magic is broken. 
And I've lost the sword as well, stormed Sycorax. It's trapped in the stone at a time when it is needed most. When witches have returned to the forest, it's an all-round disaster. Someone must have stolen my key. Someone must have helped that wretched wizard boy escape. Someone must have taken him the sword. The someone who has done this is a traitor to their mother, their family, their entire tribe of warriors. Wish avoided her mother's angry gaze and looked thoughtfully into the distance. I just had this very strange dream, said Wish. I dreamed there was a witch inside the stone that takes away magic that called itself the King Witch. Sycorax stared in astonishment. Her anger evaporated and turned to uneasy alarm. A king witch inside the stone, gasped the queen. What nonsense are you talking? Impossible. Surely that's impossible. But if witches were not extinct, that meant the legends about the king witch might be correct as well. In all the old fairy tales, the king witch was the leader of witches, the mastermind who controlled them all. In my dream, the King Witch had been inside the stone for a very long time indeed. Who knows, maybe someone long ago imprisoned him in there to make the world a safer place, said Wish. The fairy stories about the stone always say not to touch it, don't they? But the meaning of why we are not supposed to touch it has been lost. Centuries and centuries that King Witch must have been willing people to come to the stone so he could take away their magic and break out of the stone. And he will have been working his will on you too, mother, on me, on Tsar, on all of us. In my dream, the king witch broke out of the stone. No, whispered Sycorax with fierce, bright eyes. But she was thinking hard. Wish could sense her mother weakening. So she carried on, speaking thoughtfully and innocently, looking dreamily into the distance. Another odd thing in the dream continued Wish, was that in the dungeons below us there was this room full of heads. But they weren't just any old heads. They were heads that I recognised, of people that came to court and argued on your behalf, Mother, or said nice things about you when you were away. I'm not sure we would want the citizens of Warrior Fort to know about those heads, Mother, said Wish. Dreams are odd things, said Sycorax, staring at her daughter very, very closely indeed. Mother and daughter looked at each other, their faces identical masks. Behind both those masks they were thinking, What do you know? For the first time they looked surprisingly alike. Hair in ridiculous upward waterfalls, faces carefully arranged to give nothing away, weary eyes. It's complicated, said Queen Sycorax at last. Yes, it is said Wish. She put out her hand and closed it over Queen Sycorax's icy one. It must be difficult being a queen, said Wish. Queen Sycorax returned the pressure. Yes, it is, said Queen Sycorax. What happened to the witch inside the stone? Where is it now? asked Queen Sycorax. We killed it with the sword, said Wish. In the dream, of course. Hmm said Queen Sycorax. You were lucky to survive. She touched her daughter's face with the scratches on it. Queen Sycorax looked down at Wish, and for one split second her mask dropped, and there was no disappointment in her eyes, but a weary respect, suspicion, and fear. Queen Sycorax would never underestimate her daughter again. Her frosty cliff of a face melted into a glint of a smile, like the sun appearing through clouds over a glacier. Well done, Wish, said Queen Sycorax. That must have been a very frightening dream. A nightmare, in fact, and it sounds like you have dealt with it in a very warrior-like fashion. Wish was so relieved she beamed right back at her. My mother smiled at me. Queen Sycorax's smile disappeared, and she was her brisk, composed self once more. She adjusted Wish's eye patch, which had gone a little askew. I may have made a mistake about that stone, 
admitted Queen Sycorax. Even queens make mistakes sometimes. So in these very special circumstances, I am prepared to overlook whatever happened this past night. Queen Sycorax's voice turned diamond hard. But in the future, you do need to do as I tell you. I want you to have no contact with anything magic whatsoever. No wizards, no magic creatures, not even the smallest itch sprite. Do you understand me, Wish? Yes, mother, said Wish. And if you see that wretched, tricksome czar, son of Incanzo, said the queen, you must tell me at once. You hear me? Yes, mother, said Wish. But underneath the bedclothes, I am afraid to say, I happen to know that Wish was crossing her fingers. From now on, Wish, you must work hard at being a normal warrior princess. You can start by keeping this eye patch on at all times, nice and straight, remember? said Queen Sycorax sternly as she got to her feet. We are warriors. She held up her finger. And a warrior should always be well turned out, said Queen Sycorax. Every hair in place, every weapon sharpened, every fingernail shining. Remember that. And then... She swept out of Wish's front door, where a crowd had gathered, watching in staggered silence as Sycorax, her long white gown raked ragged, her hair a fright, swept through the courtyard with all the dignity and gravitas as if she was at her own coronation. Guards scurried up to her to offer their cloaks, and in one superb gesture she waved them away, every inch a queen. Someone started applauding. Nervously, they weren't quite sure why, and the other warriors joined in, even though they did not know what they were clapping for. What had happened? Who had dared attack her? What on earth, for the green god's sake, was going on with that hair? And then she turned at the entrance to her own quarters. The crowd grew silent. They leaned in to hear what she would say, expecting her to tell them the story of exactly what had happened down there in her dungeons. I never said Queen Sycorax in her quiet, mild voice. Want anyone to mention this ever again? And they didn't. 26. Father and Son Meanwhile, Incanzo the Enchanter was pacing the Great Hall, distraught with fear, for although he had sent out search party after search party looking for Tsar, the boy had not yet been found. The day before, when Incanzo the Enchanter and his wizards burst into Tsar's room, they found it empty, and a great hole in the middle of it. And as Incanzo knelt down by the side of the hole, and saw the dead witch lying at the bottom, and his son vanished, Well, what have I done? the Enchanter asked himself, imagining for one terrible moment that the witch might have killed his son, before realising to his infinite relief that, no, quite incredibly, it was the other way around. Luther peered over his father's shoulder and turned a little white. "'What is that, father?' "'That,' said Incanzo grimly, "'was a witch. "'By mistletoe and leaf mould and the ginger sideburns of the great grim ogre. "'Witches weren't extinct after all. "'And the proof was right there, in the middle of Tsar's bedroom.' It took a while for the wizards, crowding into the wrecked ruins of this room, to take all this in. You see, said Ranter triumphantly, for even when something really dreadful has happened, there is always a satisfaction in being right all along. I told you that the boy would do something truly appalling in time, and he has. Witches are not extinct, and after hundreds of years of peace, Tsar has brought a witch right here into wizard camp. It was somehow typical that it would be Tsar who found one. "'How could Tsar have killed this witch?' asked the enchanter, with a sort of reluctant admiration. "'Witches are virtually impossible to kill.' "'Well,' admitted Luther slowly, "'he did cheat in that spelling competition by bringing in this whopping great big iron sword thingy that he said he had stolen from the warriors.' "'Was it a sword of power?' gasped the enchanter. "'It looked pretty ancient,' said Luther. And I think he did not mention something about it being a witch-killing sword. But you know what Tsar's like. He lies his head off all the time. Why didn't you tell me about that? Raged the enchanter, turning on Luther as the lightning of his fury crackled around the devastation of Tsar's room. So now, 
Twenty-four hours later, the enchanter was pacing up, down, up, down, hoping against all hope that Tsar might yet be found. Luther was not particularly enjoying how distressed everybody seemed to be at the loss of Tsar. Even Ranter was sighing and saying things like, He was a good boy, really. Lively, of course, mischievous. But he meant well. This is all Tsar's fault, said Luther sulkily. He brought the witch here, it serves him right. But the enchanter was blaming himself. What did the boy say to me just before I banished him to his room, thought Incanzo. You do not care about me. You only want a son who is magic. Incanzo wanted to be able to tell his son that was not true. But it was too late. His son was not there. Incanzo had been up all night in the form of a peregrine falcon and had flown low over the treetops, mile after weary mile, searching for his son. But Tsar was an expert at covering his tracks, so even the bright red eyes of the falcon, peering deep down into the leafy blackness, could spot no sign of the boy, however hard they looked. Incanzo had consulted his star maps, so scorchingly long that his eye-beams burned holes in them. But Tsar was hidden in a fort of iron, so peer how the enchanter may, there was no sign of the boy there either. It was as if he had vanished off the face of the earth. And then the enchanter began to think the unthinkable. Nobody knew much about witches. What if, just before it died, the witch had dispatched the boy and made Tsar's corpse disappear in some manner unknown to Incanzo? The enchanter had sent Tsar to his room to teach him a lesson, but as so often seems to happen, the lesson being taught was to the enchanter himself. I wish I had not shouted at the boy. I wish I had listened to him, not threatened to expel him. I wish he may not have died without knowing that I love him, thought in Canzo the great enchanter. But even a very great enchanter cannot turn back time. There was a shout at the doorway. The pacing enchanter turned eagerly. It was him. It was Tsar. There he was, climbing off night eye his snow cat, looking a little guilty, a little unsure of his reception, but still as cheeky and irrepressible and full of himself as ever, maybe even more so. All powerful enchanters are, at heart, still parents like the rest of us. In Canzo, the great enchanter ran to his son on trembling legs, and with pathetic eagerness and relief, he scooped Tsar up in his arms. Tsar, you're alive, and you've come home, cried in Canzo, the great enchanter. I have, said Tsar, grinning with surprise from ear to ear, for he had been expecting expulsion at the worst, and at the best a few awkward questions, which was what normally happened when he made it back from an adventure. Uh, sorry about the dead witch, father, and my room. And I've lost my spelling book again. But look! Tsar beckoned to the giants, the wizards, the dwarves and sprites that he had rescued from Sycorax's dungeons to come forward. The crowd gathered in wizard camp, gasped as they recognised family members, friends and colleagues that they thought they would never see again. They rushed to embrace their lost relatives with cries of joy. I wanted to make amends, said Tsar proudly. I tried to take magic from a witch, and I stole a sword that brought the witch to us, so I returned the sword to Sycorax's dungeons, and while I was there, I realised she was keeping our people prisoners. So I rescued them. Well, for astonishingly mad but brave acts like that one, they would all be prepared to forgive Tsar, even if he had led troops of witches into the camp, as long as he killed them all, of course. Inkanza was very rarely pleased with his son. But here was his son doing something right for a change. The most important right thing of all being, he had returned home alive. For the first time, in Canzo the king enchanter shook his son by the hand, as if he were an equal. Tsar thought he had never been so happy in his life. To see his father looking at him, Tsar, with such pride, such love, such admiration to see everyone else in the camp cheering and applauding him. The enchanter turned to the crowd. Perhaps there needs to be room in the wizard world for those who have no magic, cried the enchanter. For look, these brave wizards, giants and sprites are returning to us with their magic removed. 
We need to find a place for these people, do we not, in our society? And the crowd cried back, We do, we do. I would like to propose three cheers for my son Tsar, said the enchanter, who braved the terrors of Sycorax's dungeons to bring these old friends back to us, at great danger to himself and his sprites and animals. Tsar, 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 cheered the wizards. Why is Tsar so annoying, raged Luther, clenching his fist. My son has returned to me, and he returns a better person. Tsar has learned a lesson, smiled the enchanter, that it is far, far wiser to wait for your magic to come in than to try and obtain it from a dark source. He turned to his son, and Tsar has taught me a lesson too. It is far, far better to have a son who has no magic than to have no son at all. Welcome home, Tsar. The enchanter hugged his son. And then the enchanter turned once more to the cheering crowd. So, I declare this a day of thanks and celebrations. Let's see, what shall we call it? said the enchanter. And if he hadn't been such a very great enchanter, that might have been a twinkle in the grim grey of his eye. We shall call it the celebration of Tsar not coming into his magic. Let the festivities begin! Now, wizards never need much excuse to have a party. The hall went mad, with fiddles magically playing themselves, the zigzagging glow of sprites zooming everywhere, and wizards and snowcats and giants and dwarves and animals of all shapes and sizes dancing and singing and howling to the dark winter sky. Are we free now, master? Ariel asked, flying up to the enchanter wanting to get him while he was in a rare good mood. Don't forget that you promised us, Caliburn and me, our freedom when the boy grows up and no longer needs us. We are spirits too brave for a boy like Tsar. I haven't forgotten, snapped the enchanter, his benevolence disappearing. But let's face it, Tsar will need you for a little while longer. I will not release you and Caliburn until the boy grows up into a wise and thoughtful adult. That may never happen, said the raven. In which case you will never be free, said the enchanter, grimly. And by the way, Caliburn... Uh, yes, enchanter, said Caliburn, starting guiltily. At some point I will want a full report of exactly what went on over the last twenty-four hours. Now is the time for celebration. But later you must tell me the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Caliburn! and off the enchanter swept, with a rather unnerving thunderclap sweep of his cloak to join in the merrymaking. "'I'd rather you didn't tell him the whole truth,' grinned Tsar. "'Yes,' said Caliburn. "'I think I might leave out the bit about the sword being iron and magic mixed together, and the sprite being poisoned, and the witch in the stone, and Wish being the girl of destiny.' In fact, now I come to think of it, there's not a great deal of the story I can tell, is there? Definitely don't tell him this, then, said Tsar, a mischievous glint in his eye as he opened up his hand. There, right in the centre of the palm, was the very faint pale green mark of a washed-out witch stain. Caliburn gave a squawk of absolute horror. The witch stain! What happened? I thought you'd got rid of it! So did I! grinned Tsar, closing his fist around it again. But I must have come off the stone too quickly. And you know the best thing about it. No, Tsar could not repress his excitement. I think it's beginning to work. But, 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 Tsar, gabbled poor Caliburn. It's bad magic from a dark source. We've just gone through all this, and I thought you'd learned your lesson and returned a better person, just like your father said. What has the whole moral of this entire adventure all been about? But Tsar had already hurried off, worried he was going to miss some of the Tsar not coming into his magic celebrations, while the sprites joined enthusiastically into the festivities and were zooming around getting into their usual mischief, such as Tiffin Storm had a wonderful time aiming spells at people's food, so that when they picked it up it was something yummy, like a nice slice of apple pie, but by the time it reached their mouths it had turned into something disgusting, like a giant slug. Squeeze Juice set off a stink spell, though typically he got it wrong, and instead of smelling of bad eggs, it smelled rather deliciously of lemons. And Tsar showed off to all the prettiest girls without a care in the world. 
Meanwhile, poor old Caliburn was sitting on a tree branch, worrying and trying to comfort himself. Maybe because the king witch is dead, the bird said to himself, the witches will go back to sleep again. Maybe, even if they wake again in our lifetime, they will not find the girl, because she will not be so silly as to venture out of the iron fort again, because maybe she is one of those rare humans who learn from their mistakes. Maybe. Then, as is the way of warriors, having made himself feel better about one worry, he immediately started to worry about something else. Tsar wished for magic, and he got it, and it is bad magic indeed. And if his father ever finds out about it, then Tsar will be in bigger trouble than ever, worried Caliburn. And although they are happy with him now, it will not take them long to remember his past disobediences. Give a were-dog a bad name and all that. The old raven cocked his head to the other side, as if to consider the alternatives. But then maybe Tsar will learn to control that magic of his before his father finds out. There is good in Tsar, and this adventure has brought that out, too. The good in Tsar will control the bad in the blood. Maybe. Maybe. Caliburn! yelled Tsar from below. Stop sitting up there being all gloomy and worrying. Tsar looked around him to check no one was looking. And then he pointed his hand with the witch stain on it up at the tree branch. Tsar must have tried to perform magic a thousand times before, and it had never worked. But this time was different. This time he felt this extraordinary tingling feeling, a kind of pins and needles in his entire right arm. It was as if some weird muscle that he had never felt before was stretching out and unfurling. And to Tsar's delight, he could feel the magic curving out of his fingertips. It exploded the tree branch that Caliburn was sitting on, and with a disgruntled shriek, the old bird fell out of the sky in a flurry of feathers and flapped protestingly in front of Tsar's grinning face. It worked, cried Tsar, looking at his hand in total delight. Everything has been worth it. I did get magic in the end after all. Caliburn sighed a very, very deep sigh. The moral of the adventure had gone all wrong somehow. And Tsar, learning to be good, was going to take a little time. But in the meantime, Worry tomorrow, old bird, smiled Tsar. Tonight we dance! And the wizard boy took the raven by the wings, and the old bird forgot to worry, and he became like a chick again, as Tsar whirled him round and round, dancing with him under the cold of the midnight stars. Epilogue. So, that was the story of Tsar and Wish, and how their stars crossed on a midnight deep long, long ago in the ancient past. Before the British Isles knew they were the British Isles yet, and the magic lived in the dark forests. And, a little like Caliburn, I am still trying to figure out the moral of it. You have to listen to the stories, for stories always mean something. But what worries me is, what exactly do they mean? It's the story of how Tsar got himself some magic, and how Wish found out she was special, and how the King Witch escaped from the stone. So everyone got their wishes, but not quite in the way they expected. Because, and I think I have mentioned this once or thrice before, you have to be careful what you wish for, guys. It may come true. Right at the beginning of this story, I said it was being told by one of the characters. Did you guess which one? I could be any of them, couldn't I? Tsar, or Wish, or Bodkin, the assistant bodyguard with the dream of being a hero? Sycorax, or Incanzo, or one of the sprites? Or that dusty old bird, Caliburn, the raven who has lived many lifetimes? I could be any of these characters, good or bad, or a mixture of both. I'm not going to tell you the answer to who I am yet. You will have to keep on guessing. For we have not reached the end of the story, not by a long way. The King Witch is out of the stone, like a genie out of the bottle. He will be looking for Wish, for she has the magic that works on iron. And Tsar has bad magic, and we do not yet know how that will turn out. 
Under Wish's pillow, the spelling book is sleeping. But it could wake any moment. Let us hope that Caliburn is right, and it will help her fight back against wicked people with strong magic and evil hearts, who might want to get hold of the magic she possesses. For where there is one witch, there will be others. Keep hoping. Keep guessing. Keep dreaming. Signed, The Unknown Narrator. <laughs> Once there was magic, wandering free, in roads of sky and paths of sea, and in that timeless long-gone hour, words of nonsense still had power. Doors still flew and birds still talked, witches grinned and giants walked. We had magic wands and magic wings, and we lost our hearts to impossible things. Unbelievable thoughts, unsensible ends, for wizards and warriors might be friends. In a world where impossible things are true, I don't know why we forgot the spell, when we lost the way, how the forest fell, but now we are old, we can vanish too. And I see once more the invisible track that will lead us home and take us back. So find your wands and spread your wings. I'll sing our love of impossible things. And when you take my vanished hand, we'll both go back to that magic land where we lost our hearts several lifetimes ago when we were wizards once. The Spelling Book A complete guide to the entire magical world Hello, welcome to The Spelling Book Your personally selected question is How do you escape from a magic tree in a wizard's fort and make your way through the bad woods when you have no transport, no map and no means of knowing where you are? Please note, if the spelling book malfunctions, you will unfortunately have to turn all 6,304,560 pages yourself. Sorry about that. Jumble frilly-eared dreamer giant. Short-legged giants like this one have very long arms, so they are excellent climbers. There are many different species of giants. Frost giants, colossal clumpers, dreamers, monumenters... Despite their name, giants actually come in various sizes. Most giants are herbivores, and about the size of the treetops, so they can hide from raptogriff flocks flying above the wildwoods. See page 2,041. Longstepper High Walker Giant Longstepper High Walker Giants make huge hollowways, a sprite word for paths, as they wander through the wildwoods, thinking great thoughts about life on Earth. And the mysteries of the universe. Gruntalogar Roger Breath. The stinky armpit Gruntalogar Roger Breath puts cow poo under his armpits as a charming perfume to attract female Gruntalogars. Yucky, but true. Warning do not attempt to reason with this man. He isn't very reasonable. Spelling. Your handy magic guide to how it works. Most sprites are too small for their magic to have any effect on larger creatures than themselves all on its own. Their magic must therefore be concentrated in small spells, like little balls or bombs that the sprite keeps in a spell bag around its waist. The sprite also has a quiver of wands, and when a spell needs to be launched, the sprite chooses the correct wand for the spell and whacks it toward the victim. Different Types of Spells Flying spell, water spell, fire spell, love spell, growing spell, 
spell of forgetting, invisibility spell, thunder spell. Lost words. As the long stepper high walker giants crisscross the forests of Albion, their heads smoking, they are also collecting lost and endangered words. The giant's view is, if you lose the words to describe things, how can you think about them? Here are some sprite words for things that are in danger of becoming lost. Fismer. Rustling noise in grasses. Dragon cold. Weather so freezing it makes the breath smoke so that people look like dragons. Hair ice. Frost growing like fungus on dead wood. Willow the wisp. Trails of light following after sprites as they fly through woods in the darkness. Holloway. Paths made through wild woods by wandering giants. Cow belly. Word for mud at the bottom of the river. Elf locks. The tangled hair of sleepers. Ghost trails. The light trails made by sprites at night time. See also Will o' the Wisp. Snaily sludge. The revolting bogey trail left by a roger breath. Flitters. To move house, go walk about. Sprite curses. In the world of magic, words have power, so cursing is a very powerful weapon. The druids, or druids, have made quite an art of it. May you get a cold that makes your nose drip like a snotty stream of bogey sludge for five whole weeks, and may your armpits itch like they are being bitten by wear rats. May you be swallowed by a cow that is eaten by a whale that is on its way down to the dreariest depths of the sandiest wastes of the endless and bottomless ocean. Please note, sprites have an artistic approach to spelling. They think it doesn't matter what order the letters are in, as long as you understand what they have written. Witches. Witches are extinct, so here at the spelling book we cannot show you a picture of a witch because nobody alive has ever seen one. What to do if witches were by some awful chance not to be extinct? One, we have no idea. Two, don't try running, they'll catch you. Three, you could use iron, but magic people are allergic to iron. Four, see point one above. Oh, and don't look at them. Just looking at a witch can scare a person to death. Spelling staffs. A beginner wizard, like Tsar, can only use a staff made out of birch. Oak is a good all-round choice, while willow is used for healing. Ash is used for spells of transformation and enchantment, but it can be hard to control. Blackthorn is a dangerous wood, used for spell fights and dark magic. Only the very greatest wizards can use a staff made out of you. The Magic Eye Very, very rarely, a wizard is born with a magic eye. This is a very powerful magic that can be difficult to control. It is often associated with enchanters who have more than one life. Love Never Lies Potion If you drink Love Never Lies Potion, you will fall in love with the next person you see. It is also a truth drug. The liquid turns from red to blue when the person holding it is telling a lie. The spelling book thanks you for listening and would gently remind you that things generally turn out all right in the end.